This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joplin Winner. Don Quixote, Volume 1, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Translated by John Ormsby. Part 12, Chapters 30 through 32. Chapter 30. Which treats of address displayed by the fair Dorothea with other matters pleasant and amusing. The curate had hardly ceased speaking, when Sancho said, In faith, then, Señor Licentiate, he who did that deed was my master, and it was not for want of my telling him beforehand, and warning him to mind what he was about, and that it was a sin to set them at liberty, as they were all on the march there, because they were special scoundrels. Blockheads! said Don Quixote at this. It is no business or concern of knights-errant to inquire whether any persons in affliction, in chains, or oppressed that they may meet on the high road go that way and suffer as they do because of their faults or because of their misfortunes. It only concerns them to aid them as persons in need of help, having regard to their sufferings and not to the rascalities. I encountered a chaplet or string of miserable and unfortunate people, and did for them what my sense of duty demands of me, and as for the rest be that as it may, and whoever takes objection to it, saving the sacred dignity of the Señor Licentiate and his honored persons, I say he knows little about chivalry, and lies like a horse and villain, and this I will give him to know to the fullest extent with my sword. And so saying, he settled himself in his stirrups, and pressed down his morion, for the barber's basin which, according to him, was Mambrino's helmet, he carried hanging at the saddle-bow until he could repair the damage done to it by the galley slaves. Darthea, who was shrewd and sprightly, and by this time thoroughly understood Don Quixote's crazy turn, and that all except Sancho Panza were making game of him, not to be behind the rest said to him, and observing his irritation. Sir knight, remember the boon you have promised me, and that in accordance with it you must not engage in any other adventure, be it ever so pressing. Calm yourself, for if the licentiate had known that the galley slaves had been set free by that unconquered arm, he would have stopped his mouth th thrice over, or even bitten his tongue three times before he would have said a word that tended toward disrespect of your worship. That I swear heartily, said the curate, and I would have even plucked off a mustache. I will hold my peace, senora, said Don Quixote, and I will curb the natural anger that had arisen in my breast, and will proceed in peace and quietness until I have fulfilled my promise. But in return for this consideration I entreat you to tell me, if you have no objection to do so, what is the nature of your trouble, and how many, who, and what are the persons of whom I am to require due satisfaction, and on whom I am to take vengeance on your behalf. That I will do with all my heart, replied Dorothea, if it will not be wearisome to you to hear of miseries and misfortunes. It will not be wearisome, Signora, said Don Quixote, to which Dorothea replied, well, if that be so, give me your attention. As soon as she said this, Cardenio and the barber drew close to her side, eager to hear what sort of story the quick-witted Dorothea would invent for herself. And Sancho did the same, for he was as much taken in by her as his master. And she, having settled herself comfortably in the saddle, and with the help of coughing and other preliminaries, taking time, began with great sprightliness of manner in this fashion. First of all, I would have you know, sirs, that my name is and here she stopped for a moment, for she forgot the name the curate had given her. But he came to her relief, seeing what her difficulty was, and said, It is no wonder, Signora, that your highness should be confused and embarrassed in telling the tale of your misfortunes, for such afflictions often have the effect of depriving the sufferers of memory, so that they do not even remember their own names, as is the case now with your ladyship, who has forgotten that she is called the Princess Miss Comicana, lawful heiress to the great kingdom, of Miss Comicon, and with this cue, your highness may now recall to your sorrowful recollection all you may wish to tell us. That is the truth, said the damsel, but I think from this on I shall no, have no need of any other prompting, and I shall bring my true story safe into port, and here it is. The king, my father, who was called Tinacrio, the sapient, was very learned in what they call magic arts, and became aware by his craft that my mother, who was called Queen Jaramila, was to die before he did, and that soon after he was to depart this life, and I was to be left an orphan without father or mother. But all this, he declared, did not so much grieve or distress him as his certain knowledge, that a prodigious giant, the lord of a great island close to our kingdom, Pandafilando of the Scow by name, 
for it is averred that, though his eyes are properly placed and straight, he always looked askew as if he squinted, and this he did out of malignity, not to strike fear and terror into those he looks at, that he knew, I say, that this giant, on becoming aware of my orphan condition, would overrun my kingdom with a mighty force, and strip me of all, not leaving me even a small village to shelter me. But that I could avoid all this ruin and misfortune, if I were willing to marry him, However, as far as he could see, he never expected that I would consent to a marriage so unequal, and he said no more than the truth in this, for it has never entered my mind to marry that giant, or any other let him be so ever great or enormous. My father said, too, that when he was dead, and I saw Padapalando about to invade my kingdom, I was not to wait and attempt to defend myself, for that would be destructive to me but that I should leave the kingdom entirely open to him if I wished to avoid the death and total destruction of my good and loyal vassals, for there would be no possibility of defending myself against the giant's devilish power, and that I should at once, with some of my followers, set out for Spain, where I should obtain relief in my distress on finding a certain knight-errant, whose fame by that time would extend over to the whole kingdom, and who would be called, if I remember rightly, Don Azote, or Don Gigote, Don Quixote, he must have said, Signora, observed Sancho at this, otherwise called the Knight of Rueful Countenance. That is it, said Dorothea. He said, moreover, that he would be tall of stature and lank featured, and that on his right side, under the left shoulder, or thereabouts, he would have a gray mole and hairs like bristles. On hearing this, Don Quixote said to his squire, Here, Sancho, my son, bear a hand and help me to strip, for I want to see if I am the knight that sage king foretold. "'What does your worship want to strip for?' said Dorothea. "'To see if I have that mole your father spoke of,' answered Don Quixote. "'Oh, there is no occasion to strip,' said Sancho, "'for I know your worship has just such a mole on the middle of your backbone, "'which is the mark of a strong man.' "'That is enough,' said Dorothea, "'for with friends we must not look too closely into trifles, "'and whether it be on the shoulder or on the backbone matters little. "'It is enough if there is a mole, be it where it may, "'for it is all the same flesh.' No doubt my good father hit the truth in every particular, and I have made a lucky hit in commending myself to Don Quixote, for he is the one my father spoke of, as the features of his countenance correspond with those assigned to this knight by that wide fame he has acquired, not only in Spain, but in all of La Mancha, for I had scarcely landed at Asano when I heard such accounts of his achievements, that at once my heart told me he was the very one I had come in search of. But how did you land at Asuna, Senora? asked Don Quixote when it is not a seaport. But before Dorothea could reply, the curate anticipated her saying, The princess meant to say that after she had landed at Malaga, the first place where she heard of your worship was Asuna. That is what I meant to say, said Dorothea. And that would be only natural, said the curate. Will your majesty please proceed? There is no more to add, said Dorothea, save that in funding Don Quixote, I have had such good fortune that I already reckon and regard myself queen and mistress of my entire dominions, since of his courtesy and magnanimity he has granted me the boon of accompanying me whithersoever I may conduct him, which will be only to bring him face to face with Pandafilando of the Scowl, that he may slay him and restore to me what has been unjustly usurped by him. For all this must come to pass satisfactorily, since my good father Tinacrio the Sapient foretold it, who likewise left it declared in writing in Chaldee or Greek characters, for I cannot read them, that if this predicted knight, after having cut the giant's throat, should be disposed to marry me, I was to offer myself at once without demur as his lawful wife, and yield him possession of my kingdom together with my person. What thinkest thou now, friend Sancho? said Don Quixote at this. Hearest thou that? Did I not tell thee so? See how we have already got a kingdom to govern and a queen to marry? On my oath it is so, said Sancho, and foul fortune to him who won't marry after slitting Señor Panda Halito's windpipe. And then, how ill-favored the queen is! I wish the fleas in my bed were that sort. And so saying, he cut a couple of capers in the air with every sign of extreme satisfaction, and then ran to seize the bridle of Dorothea's mule, and checking it, fell on his knees before her, begging her to give him her hand to kiss in token of his acknowledgment of her as his queen and mistress, which of the bystanders could have helped laughing to see the madness of the master and the simplicity of the servant. Dorothea, therefore, gave her hand, and promised to make him a great lord in her kingdom, 
when heaven should be so good as to permit her to recover and enjoy it, for which Sancho returned thanks in words that set them all laughing again. Then this, sirs, continued Dorothea, is my story. It only remains to tell you that of all the attendants I took with me from my kingdom, I have none left except this well-bearded squire, for all were drowned in a great tempest we encountered when in sight of port. And he and I came to land on a couple of planks as if by a miracle, and indeed the whole course of my life is a miracle and a mystery, as you may have observed. And if I have been ever minute in any respect, or not as precise as I ought to, let it be accounted for by what the Lysiant said at the beginning of my tale, that constant and excessive troubles deprive the sufferers of their memory. They shall not deprive me of mine, exalted and worthy princess, said Don Quixote, however great and unexampled those which I shall endure in your service may be, and here I confirm anew the boon I have promised you, and I swear to go with you to the end of the world until I find myself in the presence of your fierce enemy, whose haughty head I trust by the aid of my arm to cut off with edge of this. I will not say good sword, thanks to Guinness de Passamante, who carried away mine, this he said between his teeth, and then continued, and when it has been cut off, and you have been put in a peaceful possession of your realm, it shall be left to your own decision to dispose of your person as may be most pleasing to you. For so long as my memory is occupied, my will enslaved, and my understanding enthralled by her, I say no more. It is impossible for me for a moment to contemplate marriage, even with a phoenix. The last words of his master about not wanting to marry were so disagreeable to Sancho that, raising his voice, he exclaimed with great irritation, by my oath, Señor Don Quixote, you are not in your right senses, for how can your worship possibly object to marrying such an exalted princess as this? Do you think fortune will offer you behind every stone such a piece of luck as is offered you now? Is my lady Dulcinea fairer, perchance? Not she, nor half as fair, and I will even go so far as to say she does not come up to the shoe of this one here. A poor chance I have of getting that county I am waiting for, if your worship goes looking for dainties in the bottom of the sea. In the devil's name, marry, marry, and take this kingdom that comes to hand without any trouble, and when you are a king, make me a marquis or a governor of a province, and for the rest let the devil take it all. Don Quixote, when he heard such blasphemies uttered against his lady Dulcinea, could not endure it, and lifting his pike, without saying anything to Sancho or uttering a word, he gave him two such thwacks that he brought him to the ground, and had it not been that Dorothea cried out to him to spare him, he would have no doubt taken his life on the spot. Do you think, he said to him after a pause, you scurvy clown, that you are to be always interfering with me, and that you are to be always offending and always pardoning? Don't fancy it, impious scoundrel, for that beyond a doubt thou art, since thou hast set thy tongue going against the peerless Dulcinea. Know you not, lout, vagabond, beggar, that there were it not for the might that she infuses into my arm, I shall not have strength enough to kill a flea. Say, scoffer with a viper's tongue, what think you has won this kingdom, and cut off this giant's head, and made you a marquis? For all this I count as already accomplished and decided. But the might of Dulcinea employing my arm as the instrument of her achievements. She fights in me, and conquers in me, and I live and breathe in her, and owe my life and being to her. O oh, whore son scoundrel, how ungrateful you are! You see yourself raised from the dust of the earth to be a titled lord, and they, then the return you make for so great a benefit is to speak evil of her who has conferred it upon you? Sancho was not so stunned, but that he heard all his master said, and rising with such degree of nimbleness he ran to place himself behind Dorothea's palfrey, and from that position he said to his master, Tell me, Signor, if your worship is resolved not to marry this great princess, it is plain the kingdom will not be yours, and not being so, how can you bestow favors upon me? That is what I complain of. Let your worship at any rate marry this queen now that we have got her here as if showered down from heaven, and afterwards you may go back to my lady Dulcinea, for there must have been kings in the world who kept mistresses. As to beauty, I have nothing to do with it, and if the truth is to be told, I like them both, though I have never seen the Lady Dulcinea. How? Never seen her? Blasphemous traitor! exclaimed Don Quixote. Hast thou not just now brought me a message from her? I mean, said Sancho, that I did not see her so much at my leisure that I could take particular notice of her beauty, or of her charms, piecemeal, but taken in the lump, I like her. Now I forgive thee 
said Don Quixote, and do thou forgive me the injury I have done thee, for our first impulses are not in our control. That I see, replied Sancho, and with me the wish to speak is always the first impulse, and I cannot help saying, once at any rate, what I have on my tip of my tongue. For all that, Sancho, said Don Quixote, take heed of what thou sayest, for the pitcher goes so often to the well, I need so no more to thee. Well, well, said Sancho, God is in heaven, and sees all tricks, and will judge who does most harm, I in not speaking right, or your worship in not doing it. That is enough, said Dorothea. Run, Sancho, and kiss your lord's hand, and beg his pardon, and henceforward be more circumspect with your praise and abuse, and say nothing in disparagement of that lady, Taboso, of whom I know nothing, save that I am her servant, and put your trust in God, for you will not fail to obtain some dignity as, as so as to live like a prince. Sancho advanced, hanging his head, and begged his master's hand, which Don Quixote with dignity presented to him, giving him his blessing as soon as he had kissed it. He then bade him go on ahead a little, as he had questions to ask him and matters of great importance to discuss with him. Sancho obeyed, and when the two had gone some distance in advance, Don Quixote said to him, Since thy return I have had no opportunity or time to ask thee many particulars touching thy mission and the answer thou hast brought back and now that chance has granted us the time and opportunity. Deny me not the happiness that canst give me by such good news. Let your worship ask what you will, answered Sancho, for I shall find a way out of all as I have found a way, but in I implore you, senor, not to be so vengeful in future. Why dost thou say that, Sancho? said Don Quixote. I say it, he returned, because those blows just now were more because of the quarrel the devil stirred up between us both the other night than for what I said against my lady Dulcinea, whom I love and reverence as I would a relic, though there is nothing of that about her, merely as something belonging to your worship. So say no more on that subject for thy life, Sancho, said Don Quixote, for it is displeasing to me. I have already pardoned thee for that, and thou knowest the common saying, for a fresh sin, a fresh penance. While this was going on, they saw, coming along the road they were following, a man mounted on an ass, who was, when he came close, seemed to be a gypsy. But Sancho Panza, whose eyes and heart were there wherever he saw asses, no sooner beheld the man than he knew him to be Guinness de Pasamonte, and by the thread of the gypsy he got at the ball his ass, for it was, in fact, Dapple that carried Pasamonte who, to escape recognition and to sell the ass, had disguised himself as a gypsy, being able to speak the gypsy language, and many more as well as if they were his own. Sancho saw him and recognized him, and the instant he did so, he shouted to him, Guinness Silo, you thief! Give up my treasure, release my life, embarrass thyself not with my repose. Quit my ass and leave my delight, be off, rip, get thee gone, thief, and give up what is not thine. There was no necessity for so many words or abjurations, for at the first one Guinness jumped down and at a, at a like racing speed made off and got clear of them all. Sancho hastened to his Dapple, and embracing him, he said, How hast thou fared, my blessing, Dapple of my eyes, my comrade? All the while kissing him and caressing him as if he were a human being. The ass held his peace and let himself be kissed and caressed by Sancho without answering a single word. They all came up and congratulated him on having found Dapple, Don Quixote especially, who told him that notwithstanding this he would not cancel the order for the three ascolts, for which Sancho thanked him. While the two had been going along conversing in this fashion, the curate observed to Dorothea that she had shown great cleverness as well in the story itself as in the conciseness and the resemblance it bore to those of the books of chivalry. She said that she had many am times amused herself reading them, but that she did not know the situation of the provinces or seaports, and so she had said at haphazard that she had landed at Asuna. So I saw, said the curate, and for that reason I made haste to say what I did, by which it was all set right. But is it not a strange thing to see how readily this unhappy gentleman believes all these figments and lies, simply because they are in the style and man manner of the absurdities of his books? So it is, said Cardenio and so uncommon and unexampled, that were one to attempt to invent and concoct it in fiction, I doubt if there be any wit keen enough to imagine it. 
But another strange thing about it, said the curate, is that apart from the silly things which this worthy gentleman says in connection with his craze, when other subjects are dealt with, he can discuss them in a perfectly rational manner, showing that his mind is quite clear and composed, so that, provided his chivalry is not touched upon, no one would take him to be anything but a man of thoroughly sound understanding. While they were holding this conversation, Don Quixote continued his with Sancho, saying, Friend Ponzo, let us forgive and forget as to our quarrels, and tell me now, dismissing anger and irritation, where, how, and when didst thou find Dulcinea? What was she doing? What didst thou say to her? What did she answer? How did she look when she was reading my letter? Who copied it out for thee? And everything in the matter that seems to thee worth knowing, asking and learning, neither adding nor falsifying to give me pleasure, nor yet curtailing, lest you should deprive me of it. Senor, replied Sancho, if the truth is to be told, nobody copied it out, the letter for me, for I carried no letter at all. It is as thou sayest, said Don Quixote, for the notebook in which I wrote it I found in my own possession two days after thy departure, which gave me a great vexation, as I knew not what thou wouldst do on finding thyself without any letter, and I made sure that wouldst thou return from the place where thou didst first miss it. So I should have done, said Sancho, if I had not got it by heart when your worship read it to me, so that I repeated it to a sacristan who copied it out for me from hearing it, so exactly that he said it in all the days of his life. Though he had read many a letter of excommunication, he had never seen or read so pretty a letter as that. And hast thou got it still in thy memory, Sancho? said Don Quixote. No, senor, replied Sancho, for as soon as I had repeated it, seeing there was no further use of it, I set about forgetting it, and if I recollect any of it, it is about scrubbing, I mean to say, sovereign lady, and and the end, yours till death, the knight of the roeful continence. And between these two I put it in more than three hundred, my souls and my life's and my eyes. Chapter 31 of the delectable discussion between Don Quixote and Sancho Panza, his squire, together with other incidents. All that is not unsatisfactory to me, said Don Quixote, go on, thou didst reach her, and what was that queen of beauty doing? Surely thou didst find her stringing pearls, or embroidering some device in gold thread for this or her enslaved knight. I did not, said Sancho, but I found her winnowing two bushels of wheat in the yard of her house. Then depend upon it, said Don Quixote, the grains of that wheat were pearls when touched by her hands, and didst thou look, friend, was it white, wheat, or brown? It was neither but red, said Sancho. Then I promise thee, said Don Quixote, that winnowed by her hands, beyond a doubt the bread it made was of the whitest. But go on, when thou grave gavest her my letter, did she kiss it, did she place it on her head, did she perform any ceremony befitting it, or what did she do? When I went to give it to her, replied Sancho, she was hard at it, swaying from side to side with a lot of wheat she had in the sieve, and she said to me, Lay the letter, friend, on the top of that sack, for I cannot read it until I have done sifting all of this. Ah, discreet lady, said Don Quixote, that was in order to read it at her leisure and enjoy it. Proceed, Sancho. While she was engaged in her occupation, what converse did she hold with thee? What did she ask about me? And what answer didst thou give? Make haste, tell me all, and let not an atom be left behind in the ink-bottle. She asked me nothing, said Sancho, but I told her how your worship was left doing penance in her service, naked from the waist up, in among these mountains like a savage, sleeping on the ground, not eating bread of a tablecloth, nor combing your beard, weeping and cursing your fortune. In saying I cursed my fortune, thou said wrong, said Don Quixote. For rather do I bless it, and shall bless it all the days of my life for having made me worthy of aspiring to love so lofty a lady as Dulcinea del Toboso. And so lofty she is, said Sancho, that she overtops me by more than a hand's breadth. What? Sancho, said Don Quixote, didst thou measure with her? Oh, I measured in this way, said Sancho, going to help her to put a sack of wheat on the back of an ass. We came so close together that I could see she stood more than a good palm over me. Well, said Don Quixote, and doth she not of a truth accompany and adorn this greatness with a thousand million charms of mine? But one thing thou wilt not deny, Sancho, when thou camest close to her, didst thou not perceive a sabian odor, an aromatic fragrance, uh, I know not what, delicious that I cannot find a name for, 
I mean, a redolence, an exultation, as if thou wert in the shop of some dainty glover. All I can say, said Sancho, that I did perceive a little odor, something goaty. It must have been that she was all in a sweat with hard work. Ah, it could not be that, said Don Quixote. But thou must have been suffering from cold in the head, or must have smelt thyself, for I know well what would be the scent of that rose among thorns, that lily of the field, that dissolved amber. Maybe so, replied Sancho. There often comes from myself that same odor, which then seemed to me to come from her grace, the Lady Dulcinea. But that's no wonder, for one devil is like another. Well, then, continued Don Quixote, now she has done sifting the corn and sent it to the mill. What did she do when she read the letter? As for the letter, said Sancho, she did not read it, for she said she could neither read nor write. Instead of that, she tore it up into small pieces, saying that she did not want to let anyone read it, lest her secret should be become known in the village, and that what I told her by word of mouth about the love your worship bore her, and the extraordinary penance you were doing for her sake, was enough, and to make an end of it she told me to tell your worship that she kissed your hands, and that she had a greater desire to see you than to write to you, and that therefore she entreated and commanded you, on sight of this present, to come out of these thickets, and have done with carrying and absurdities, and to set out at once for El Tabaso, unless something else of greater importance should happen, for she had a great desire to see your worship. She laughed greatly when I told you told her how your worship was called the Knight of the Rueful Countenance. I asked her if the Bascayan the other day had been there, and she told me he had, and that he was an honest fellow. I asked her, too, about the galley slaves, but she said she had not seen any as yet. Ah, so far as goes well, said Don Quixote, but tell me what jewel was it that she gave thee on taking thy leave in return for the tidings of me? For it is a usual and ancient custom with knights and ladies errant to give the squires damsels or dwarfs who bring tidings of their ladies to the knight, or of their knights to the ladies, some rich jewel as a guardian for good news, an acknowledgment of the message. Oh, that is very likely, said Sancho, and a good custom it was, to my mind, but that must have been in days gone by, for now it would seem to be the custom only to give a piece of bread and cheese, because that was what my lady Dulcinea gave me over the top of the yard wall when I took her leave, and more by a token it was sheep's milk cheese. She is generous in the extreme, said Don Quixote, and if she did not give thee a jewel of gold, no doubt it must have been because she had not one to hand thee to give thee. But sleeves are good after Easter. I shall see her, and all shall be made right. But I knowest thou what amazes me, Sancho. It seems to me thou must have gone and come through the air, for thou hast taken but little more than three days to go to El Tabaso and return though it is more than thirty leagues from here to there, from which I am inclined to think that the sage magician who is my friend and watches over my interests, for of necessity there is and must be one, or else I should not be a right knight-errant, that this same, I say, must have helped thee to travel without thy knowledge, for some of these sages will catch up a knight-errant sleeping in his bed, and without his knowledge how or in what way it happened, he wakes up the next day more than a thousand leagues away from the place where he went to sleep. And if it were not for this, knights-errant would not be able to give aid to one another in peril, as they do at every turn. For a knight, maybe, is fighting in the mountains of Armenia with some dragon, or fierce serpent, or another knight, and gets the worst of the battle, and is at that point of death, but when he least looks for it, there appears over against him on a cloud, or chariot of fire, another knight, a friend of his, who just before had been in England, and who takes his part, and delivers him from death, and at night he finds himself in his own quarters, supping very much to his satisfaction. And yet from one place to the other will have been two or three thousand leagues, and all this is done by the craft and skill of the sage enchanters who take care of these valiant knights. So that, friend Sancho, I find no difficulty in believing that thou mayest have gone from this place to Al Tabaso, and returned in such a short time, since, as I have said, some friendly sage must have carried thee through the air without thee perceiving it. That must have been it, said Sancho, for indeed Rocinante went like a gypsy's ass with quicksilvers in his ears. Quicksilver? said Don Quixote. Aye, and what is more, a legion of devils, folks that can travel and make others travel without being weary, exactly as the whim seizes them. But 
putting this aside, what thinkest thou I ought to do about my lady's command to go and see her? For though I feel that I am bound to obey her mandate, I feel, too, that I am debarred by the boon I have accorded to the princess that accompanies us, and the law of chivalry compels me to have regard for my word in preference to my inclination. On the one hand, the desire to see my lady pursues and harasses me. On the other, my solemn promise and the glory I shall win in the enterprise urge and call me. But what I shall think do is to travel with all speed, reach quickly the place where this giant is, and on my arrival I shall cut off his head and establish the princess peacefully in her realm, and forthwith I shall return to behold the light that lightens my senses, to whom I shall make such excuses that she will be led to approve of my delay, for she will see that it entirely tends to increase her glory and fame. For all that I have won, am winning, or shall win by arms in this life, comes to me of the favor she extends to me, and because I am hers. Ah, what a sad state your worship's brains are in, said Sancho. Tell me, senor, do you mean to travel all that way for nothing, and to let slip and lose so rich and great a match as this, where they give us portion of a kingdom that in sober truth I have heard say is more than twenty thousand leagues round about, and abounds with all things necessary to support human life, and is bigger than Portugal and Castile put together? Peace, for the love of God, blush for what you have said, and take my advice, and forgive me, and marry at once in the first village where there is a curate. If not, here is our licentiate, who will do the business beautifully. Remember, I am old enough to give advice, and this I am giving comes pat to the purpose. For a sparrow in the hand is better than a vulture on the wing, and he who has the good to his hand and chooses the bad, that the good he complains of may not come to him. Look here, Sancho said Don Quixote. If thou art advising me to marry in order that immediately on slaying the giant I may become king, and be able to confer favors on thee, and give thee what I have promised, let me tell thee I shall be able very easily to satisfy thy desires without marrying. For before going into battle I will make it a stipulation that if I come out of it victorious, even I do not marry, they shall give me a portion, portion of the kingdom." that I may bestow it upon whomever I chose. And when they give it to me upon worm, wouldst thou hast me bestow it but upon thee. That is plain speaking, said Sancho, but let your worship take care to choose it on the seacoast, so that if I don't like the life I may be able to ship off my black vessels and deal with them as I have said. Don't mind going to see my lady Dulcinea now, but go and kill this giant and let us finish off this business. For by God it strikes me it will be one of great honor and great profit. I hold thou art in the right of it, Sancho, said Don Quixote, and I will take thy advice as to accompanying the princess before going to see Dulcinea. But I counsel thee not to say anything to any one or to those who are with us about what we have considered and discussed. For as Dulcinea is so decorous that she does not wish her thoughts to be known, it is not right that I or any one for me shall disclose them. Well then, if that be so, said Sancho. How is it that your worship makes all those you overcome by your arm go to present themselves before my lady Dulcinea, this being the same thing as signing your name to it, that you love her and are her lover? And as those who go must perforce kneel before her and say that they come from your worship to submit themselves to her, how can the thoughts of both of you be hid? Oh, how silly and simple thou art, said Don Quixote. Seest thou not, Sancho, that this tends to her greater exaltation? For thou must know that according to our way of thinking in chivalry, it is a high honor to a lady to have many knights errant in her service, whose thoughts never go beyond serving her for her own sake, and who look for no other reward for their great and true devotion than that she shall be willing to accept them as her knights. It is with that kind of love, said Sancho, I have heard preachers say we ought to love our Lord for himself alone, without being moved by the hope of glory or the fear of punishment, though for my part I would rather love and serve him for what he could do. The devil take thee for a clown, said Don Quixote, and what shrewd thing thou sayest at times, one would think thou hast studied. In faith, then, I cannot even read. Master Nicholas here called out to them to wait a while as they wanted to halt and drink at a little spring there was there. Don Quixote drew up, not a little to the satisfaction of Sancho, for he was by this time weary of telling so many lies, 
and in dread of his master catching him tripping, for though he knew that Dulcinea was a peasant girl of El Tobaso, he had never seen her in all his life. Cardenao had now put on the clothes which Dorothea was wearing when they found her, and though they were not very good, they were far better than those he put off. They dismounted together by the side of the spring, and with what the curate had provided himself with at the inn they appeased, though not very well, the keen appetite they all of them brought with them. While they were so employed, there happened to come by a youth passing on his way, who, stopping to examine the party at the spring, the next moment ran to Don Quixote, and, clasping him round the legs, began to weep freely, saying, Oh, senor, do you know me? Look at me well. I am that lad Andres that your worship released from the oak tree where I was tied. Don Quixote recognized him, and, taking his hand, he turned to those present and said, That your worships may see how important it is to have knights errant to redress the wrongs and injuries done by tyrannical and wicked men in this world. I may tell you that some days ago, passing through a wood, I heard cries and piteous complaints as of a person in pain and distress. I immediately hastened, Impelled by my bounded duty to the quarter whence the complaint of accents seemed to me to proceed, and I found tied to an oak this lad who now stands before you, which in my heart I rejoice at, for his testimony will not permit me to depart from the truth in any particular. He was, I say, tied to an oak naked from the waist up, and a clown, whom I afterwards found to be his master, was scarifying him by lashes with the reins of his mare. As soon as I saw him, I asked the reason of his cruel flagellation. The boar replied that he was flagging him because he was a servant, and because of carelessness that proceeded rather than from dishonesty than stupidity, on which this boy said, Senor, he flogs me only because I ask for my wages. The master made I know not what speeches and explanations, which I thought I listened to them, I did not accept. I, in short, I compelled the clown to unbind him and to swear he would take him with him and pay him reel by reel, and performed him in his bargain. Is not all this true, Andres, my son? Didst thou not mark with what authority I commanded him, and with what humility he promised to do all I enjoyed, specified, and required of him? Answer without hesitation. Tell these gentlemen what took place, that they may see that as a great an advantage as I say to have knight-errants abroad. All that your worship has said is quite true, answered the lad. But the end of the business turned out just the opposite of what your worship supposes. How? The opposite? said Don Quixote. Did not the clown pay thee then? Not only did he not pay me, replied the lad, but as soon as your worship had passed out of the woods, we were alone, he tied me up again to that same oak, and gave me a fresh flogging that left me like a flayed St. Bartholomew and every stroke he gave me he followed up with some jest or jibe about having made a fool of your worship, and, but for the pain I was suffering, I should have laughed at the things he said. In short, he left me in such a condition that I have been until now in a hospital getting cured of the injuries which that rascally clown inflicted on me then, for all which your worship is to blame, for if you had gone your own way and not come where there was no call for you, nor meddled in other people's affairs, my master would have been content with giving me one or two dozen lashes, and would have then loosened me and paid me what he owed me. But when your worship abused him so out of measure and gave him so many hard words, his anger was kindled, and he could not revenge himself on you. As soon as he saw you had left him, the storm burst upon me in such a way that I feel as if I should never be a man again. The mischief, said Don Quixote, lay in my going away, for I should not have gone until I had seen thee paid, because I ought to have known well by long experience that there is no clown who will keep his word if he finds it will not suit him to keep it. But thou rememberest, Andres, that I swore if I did not pay thee I would go and seek him and find him, though he were to hide himself in the whale's belly. That is true, said Andres, but it was of no use. Thou shalt see now whether it is of use or not, said Don Quixote. And so saying, he got up hastily and bade Sancho bridle Rocinante, who was browsing while they were eating. Dorothea asked him what he meant to do and he replied he meant to go in search of this clown and chastise him for such inquitious conduct, and see Andreas paid to the last maravedi, despite and in the teeth of all the clowns in the world. To which she replied that he must remember that in accordance with his promise he could not engage in any enterprise until he had concluded hers, and that as he knew this better than anyone he should restrain his ardor until his return from her kingdom. 
That is true, said Don Quixote, and Andreas must have patience until my return, as you say, Senora. but I once more swear and promise not to stop until I have seen him avenged and paid. I have no faith in those oaths, said Andres. I would rather have now something to help me to get to Seville than all the revenges in the world. If you have here anything to eat that I can take with me, give it to me, and God be with you, worship, and all knights errant, and may their errands turn out as well for themselves as they have for me. Sancho took out from his store a piece of bread and another of cheese, and giving them to the lad, he said, Here, take this, brother Andres, for we have all a share in your misfortune. Why, what share have you got? This share of bread and cheese I am giving you, answered Sancho, and God knows whether I shall feel the want of it myself or not, for I would have you know, friends, that we squires to knights errants have to bear a great deal of hunger and hard fortune, even other things more easily felt than told. Andre seized his bread and cheese, and seeing that nobody gave him anything more, bent his head and took hold of the road, as the saying is. However, before leaving he said, For the love of God, Sir Knight-errant, if you ever meet me again, though you may see them cutting me to pieces, give me no aid or succor, but leave me to my misfortune, which will not be so great, but that a greater will come to me by being helped by your worship, on whom and all the knights-errants that have ever been born God send his curse. Don Quixote was getting up to chastise him, but he took to his heels at such a pace that no one attempted to follow him, and mightily cheap-fallen was Don Quixote, or at Andre's story, and the others had to take great care to restrain their laughter so as not to put him entirely out of countenance. Chapter 32, which treats of what befell Don Quixote's party at the inn. Their dainty repast being finished, they saddled at once, and without any adventure worth mentioning, they reached next day the inn. The object of Sancho Panza's fear and dread, but though he would have rather not entered it, there was no help for it. The landlady, the landlord, their daughter, and Maritornes, when they saw Don Quixote and Sancho coming, went out to welcome them with signs of hearty satisfaction, which Don Quixote received with dignity and gravity, and bade them make up a better bed for him than the last time. To which the landlady replied that if he paid better than he did the last time, she would give him one fit for a prince. Don Quixote said he would, so they made up a tolerable one for him in the same garret as before, and he lay down at once, being sorely shaken and in want of sleep. No sooner was the door shut upon him than the landlady made at the barber, and seizing him by the beard, said, By my faith, you are not going to make a beard of my tail any longer. You must give me back tail, for it is a shame the way the thing of my husband's goes tossing about on the floor. I mean the comb that I used to stick in my good tail." but for all she tugged at it, the barber would not give it up until the lisante told him to let her have it, as there was now no further occasion for that stratagem, because he might declare himself and appear in his own character, and tell Don Quixote that he had fled to his inn when those thieves, the galley slaves, robbed him. And should he ask for the prince's square, they should tell him that she had sent him on before her to give notice to the people of her kingdom that she was coming and bringing him here to the deliver of them all. On this, the barber cheerfully restored the tale to the landlady, and at the same time they returned all the accessories they had borrowed to effect Don Quixote's deliverance. All the people of the inn were struck with astonishment at the beauty of Darthea, and even at the comely figure of the shepherd Gardanio. The curate made them great ready for such fare as there was in the inn, and the landlord, in hope of better payment, served them up a tolerably good dinner. All this time Don Quixote was asleep, and they thought it best not to waken him, as sleeping would now do him more good than eating. While at dinner the company consisting of the landlord, his wife, their daughter Martornes, and all the travellers, they discussed the strange craze of Don Quixote and the manner in which he had been found. And the landlady told them what had taken place between him and the courier, and then, looking round to see if Sancho was there, and when she saw he was not, she gave them the whole story of his blanketing which they received with no little amusement. But on the curate observing that it was the books of chivalry which Don Quixote had read that had turned his brain, the landlord said, I cannot understand how that can be, for in truth to my mind there is no better reading in the world, and I have here two or three of them, with other writings that are the very life, not only of myself, but of plenty more. For when it is harvest time, the reapers flock here on holidays, and there is always one among them who can read, and who takes up one of these books, and we gather round him, thirty or more of us, and stay listening to him with a delight that makes our gray hairs grow young again. At least I can say for myself, that when I hear of what furious and terrible blows the knights deliver, 
I am seized with the longing to do the same, and I would like to be hearing about them night and day. And I just as much, said the landlady, because I never have a quiet moment in my house except when you are listening to someone reading, for then you are so taken up that for the time being you forget to scold. That is true, said Maritornes, and in faith I relish hearing those things greatly too, for they are very pretty, especially when they describe some lady or another in the arms of her knight under the orange trees, and the duena who is keeping watch for them, half dead with envy and fright. All this, I say, is as good as honey. And you? What do you think, young lady? said the curate, turning to the landlord's daughter. I don't know, indeed, senor, said she. I listen too, and to tell the truth, though, I do not understand it. I like hearing it, but it's not the blows that my father likes that I like, but the laments the knights utter when they are separated from their ladies, and indeed they sometimes make me weep with the pity I feel for them. Then you would console them if it was for you they wept, young lady, said Dorothea. I don't know what I should do, said the girl. I only know that there are some of those ladies so cruel that they call their knights tigers and lions and thousands of other foul names, and Jesus, and... I don't know what sort of folk they can be, so unfeeling and heartless that rather than bestow a glance upon a worthy man they leave him to die or go mad. I don't know what is the good of such prudery. If it's for honor's sake, why not marry them? That's all they want. Hush, child, said the landlady. It seems to me thou knowest a great deal about these things, and it's not fit for a girl to know or talk so much. As the gentleman asked me, I could not help answering him, said the girl. Well, then, said the curate, bring me these books, Signor Landlord, for I should like to see them. With all my heart, said he, and going into his own room, he brought out an old valise secured with a little chain, an opening which the curate found in three large books, and some manuscripts written in a very good hand. The first that he opened he found to be Don Serangilio of Thrace, and the second Don Felix Marquez of Hircania, and the other, the history of the great Captain Gonzola Hernandez de Cordova, with the life of Diego Garcia de Parades. When the curate read the first two titles, he looked over at the barber and said, We want my friend's housekeeper and niece here now. Nay, said the barber, I can do just as well to carry them to the yard or to the hearth. There's a good fire there. What? Your worship will burn my books, said the landlord. Only these two, said the curate. Don Serangilio and Felix Martes. Are my books, then, heretics or phlegomites? Then you want to burn them, said the landlord. Schismatics, you mean, friend, said the barber, not phlegmatics. Oh, that's it, said the landlord. But if you want to burn any, let it be, though, that about the great captain and that Diego de Garcia, for I'd rather have a child of mine burnt than either of these. Brother, said the curate, these two books are made up of lies and are full of folly and nonsense. But this of the great captain is a true history and contains the deeds of Gonzola Hernandez of Cordova, who by his many and great achievements earned the title all over the world of the great captain, a famous and illustrious name, and deserved by him alone. And this Diego Garcia de Parandes was a distinguished knight of the city of Trujillo in Estremadura, a most gallant soldier and of such bodily strength that with one finger he stopped a mill-wheel in full motion, and posted with a two-handed sword at the foot of a bridge, he kept the whole of an immense army from passing over it, and achieved such other exploits that if, instead of his relating them himself with the modesty of a knight, and of one writing his own history, some free and unbiased writer had recorded them, they would have thrown into the shade all the deeds of the Hectors, Achilleses, and Rolands. Tell that to my father, said the landlord. That's a thing to be astonished at, stopping a mill-wheel. By God, your worship should read what I have read of Felix Martes of Hercania, how with one single backstroke he cleft five giants asunder through the middle as if they had been made of bean-pods, like the little friars the children make. And another time he attacked a very great and powerful army, in which there were more than a million six hundred thousand soldiers, all armed from head to foot, and he routed them all as if they had been a flock of sheep. And then, what do you say to the good Cyrangilio of Thrace, that was so stout and bold, as may be seen in the book, where it is related that, as he was sailing along a river, there came up one on the midst of the water against him, a fiery serpent, 
and he, as soon as he saw it, flung himself upon it, and got astride of its scaly shoulders, and squeezed its throat with both hands with such force that the serpent, finding he was throttling it, had nothing for it but to let itself sink to the bottom of the river, carrying with it the knight who would not let go his hold. And when they got down there, he found himself among palaces and gardens so pretty that it was a wonder to see. And then the serpent changed itself into an old ancient man, who told him such things as we have never heard. Hold your peace, senor, for if you were to hear this, you would go mad with delight. A couple of figs for your great captain and your Diego Garcia. Hearing this, Dorothea said in a whisper to Cardenao, Our landlord is almost fit to play a second part to Don Quixote. I think so, said Cardenao, for as he shows, he accepts it as a certainty that everything those books relate took place exactly as it is written down, and the barefooted friars themselves would not persuade him to the contrary. But consider, brother, said the curate once more, there never was any Felix Martes of Harcania in the world, nor any Serangilio of Thrace, or any of the other knights of the same sort that the books of chivalry talk of. The whole thing is the fabrication and invention of idle wits devised by them for the purpose you describe of beguiling the time as your reapers do when they read. For I swear to you in all Syrian seriousness, there never were any such knights in the world, and no such exploits or nonsense ever happened anywhere. Try that bone on another dog, said the landlord, as if I did not know how many make five and where my shoe pinches me. Don't think to feed me with pap, for by God I am no fool. It is a good joke for your worship to try and persuade me that everything these good books say is nonsense and lies, and they printed by the license of the lords of the royal council as if they were people who would allow such a lot of lies to be printed altogether, and so many battles and enchantments that they take away one's sentences. I have told you, friend, said the curate, that this is done to divert our idle thoughts, and as in well-ordered states games of chess, five, and billiards are allowed for the diversion of those who do not care, or are not obliged, or are unable to work, so books of this kind are allowed to be printed on the su supposition that what indeed is the truth, there can be nobody so ignorant as to take any of them for true stories, and if it were permitted me now, and the present company desired it, I could say something about the qualities books of chivalry should possess to be good ones. That would be to the advantage, and even to the taste of some. But I hope the time will come when I can communicate my ideas to some who would be able to mend matters. And in the meantime, Signor Landlord, believe me what I have said, and take your books, and make up your mind about their truth or falsehood. And much good may they do you, and God grant you make not blame fall of the same foot your guest Don Quixote's halts on. No fear of that, returned the landlord. I shall not be so mad as to make a knight errant of myself, for I see well enough that these things are not now as they used to be in those days, when they say those famous knights roamed about the world. Sancho had made his appearance in the middle of this conversation, and he was very much troubled and cast down by what he heard said about knights errants being no longer in vogue and all books of chivalry being folly and lies, and he resolved in his heart to wait and see what came of this journey of his master's. And if it did not turn out as happily as his master expected, he determined to leave him and go back to his wife and children and his ordinary labor. The landlord was carrying away the valise and the books, but the curate said to him, Wait, I want to see what those papers are that are written in such good hand. The landlord, taking them out, handed them to him to read, and he perceived they were a work of about eight sheets of manuscript, with, in large letters at the beginning, the title of Novel of the Ill-Advised Curiosity. The curate read three or four lines to himself, and said, I must say, the title of this novel does not seem to me a bad one, and I feel an inclination to read it all. To which the landlord replied, Then your reverence will do well to read it for I can tell you that some guests who have read it have been much pleased, and have begged at me very earnestly, but I would not give it, meaning to return it to the person who forgot the valis books and papers here, for maybe he will return here some time or another, and though I know I shall miss the books, faith, I mean to return them, for though I am an innkeeper, still I am a Christian. You are a very right friend, said the curate, but for all that, if the novel pleases me, you must let me copy it. With all my heart, replied the host. While they were talking, Cardenao had taken up the novel and begun to read it, and forming the same opinion of it as the curate, he begged him to read it so they might all hear it. I would read it, said the curate, if the time would not be better spent in sleeping. 
It will be rest enough for me, said Dorothea, to while away the time by listening to some tale, for my spirits are not yet tranquil enough to let me sleep when it would be seasonable. Well, then, in that case, said the curate, I will read it. If it were only out of curiosity, perhaps in my may contain something pleasant. Master Nichols added his entreaties to the same effect, and Sancho, too, seeing which, and considering that he would give pleasure to all, and receive it himself, the curate said, Well, then, attend to me, everyone, for the novel begins thus. End of Part Twelve This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kelly Bashar of Mattapoisett, Massachusetts. Don Quixote, Volume 1, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Translated by John Ormsby. Chapter 33 in which is related the novel of the ill-advised curiosity. In Florence, a rich and famous city of Italy, in the province called Tuscany, there lived two gentlemen of wealth and quality, Anselmo and Lothario, such great friends that by way of distinction they were called by all that knew them, the two friends. They were unmarried, young, of the same age and of the same tastes, which was enough to account for the reciprocal friendship between them, Anselmo, it is true, was sometimes more inclined to seek pleasure in love than Lothario, for whom the pleasures of the chase had more attraction, but on occasion Anselmo would forego his own tastes to yield to those of Lothario, and Lothario would surrender his to fall in with those of Anselmo, and in this way their inclinations kept pace, one with the other with a concord so perfect that the best regulated clock could not surpass it. Anselmo was deep in love with a high-born and beautiful maiden of the same city, the daughter of Perrin so estimable, and so estimable herself, that he resolved, with the approval of his friend Lothario, without whom he did nothing, to ask her of them in marriage, and did so, Lothario being the bearer of the demand, and conducting the negotiation so much to the satisfaction of his friend, that in a short time he was in possession of the object of his desires, and Camilla, so happy in having won Anselmo for her husband, that she gave unceasingly thanks to heaven and to Lothario, by whose means such good fortune had fallen her. The first few days, those of a wedding being usually days of merry-making, Lothario frequented his friend Anselmo's house, as he had been wont, striving to do honour to him and to the occasion, and to gratify him in every way he could. But when the wedding days were over, and the succession of visits and congratulations had slackened, he began purposefully to leave off going to the house of Anselmo, for it seemed to him, as it naturally would to all men of sense, that friends' houses ought not to be visited after a marriage with the same frequency as in their master's bachelor days, because, though true and genuine friendship cannot and should not be in any way suspicious, still a married man's honour is a thing of such delicacy that it is held liable to injury from brothers, much more from friends. And Selmo remarked the sensation of Lothario's visits and complained of it to him, saying that if he had known that marriage was to keep him from enjoying his society as he used he would have never married, if by the thorough harmony that subsisted between them while he was a bachelor they had earned such a sweet name as that of the two friends, he should not allow a title so rare and so delightful to be lost through a needless anxiety to act circumspectly. And so he entreated him, if such a phrase was allowable between them, to be once more master of his house, and to, and to come in and go out as formerly, assuring him that his wife Camilla had no other desire or inclination than that which he would wish her to have and that knowing how sincerely they loved one another, she was grieved to see such coldness in him. To all this and much more that Anselmo said to Lothario to persuade him to come to his house as he had been in the habit of doing, Lothario replied with so much prudent sense and judgment that Anselmo was satisfied of his friend's good intentions, and it was agreed that on two days in the week and on holidays Lothario should come to dine with him. But though this arrangement was made between them, Lothario resolved to observe it no further than he considered to be in accordance with the honour of his friend, whose good name was more to him than his own. He said, and justly, that a married man upon whom heaven had bestowed a beautiful wife should consider as carefully what friends he brought to his house as what female friends his wife associated with, for what cannot be done or arranged in the marketplace, in church, at public festivals, or at stations, opportunities that husbands cannot always deny their wives, may be easily managed in the house of the female friend or relative in whom most confidence is reposed. 
Lothario said, too, that every married man should have some friend who would point out to him any negligence he might be guilty of in his conduct, for it will sometimes happen that owing to the deep affection the husband bears his wife, either he does not caution her, or, not to vex her, refrains from telling her to do or not to do certain things, doing or avoiding which may be a matter of honour or reproach to him, and errors of this kind he could easily correct if warned by a friend. But where is such a friend to be found as Lothario would have, so judicious, so loyal, and so true? Of a truth I know not, Lothario alone was such a one. For with the utmost care and vigilance he watched over the honour of his friend, and strove to diminish, cut down and reduce the number of days for going to his house according to their agreement, lest the visits of a young man, wealthy, high-born, and with the attractions he was conscious of possessing, at the house of a woman so beautiful as Camilla, should be regarded with suspicion by the inquisitive and malicious eyes of the idle public. For though his integrity and reputation might bridle slanderous tongues, still he was unwilling to hazard either his own good name or that of his friend, and for this reason most of the adays agreed upon he devoted to some other business which he pretended was unavoidable, so that a great portion of the day was taken up with complaints on one side and excuses on the other. It happened, however, that on one occasion, when the two were strolling together outside the city, Anselmo addressed the following words to Lothario. "'Thou mayest suppose, Lothario, my friend, that I am unable to give sufficient thanks for the favours God has rendered me in making me the son of such parents as mine were, and bestowing upon me with no niggard hand what are called the gifts of nature as well as those of fortune, and above all for what he has done in giving me thee for a friend and Camilla for a wife, two treasures that I value, if not as highly as I ought, at least as highly as I am able, and yet with all these good things, which are commonly all that men need to enable them to live happily, I am the most discontented and dissatisfied man in the whole world, for I know not how long since I have been harassed and oppressed by a desire so strange and so unusual that I wonder at myself and blame and chide myself when I am alone, and strive to stifle it and hide it from my own thoughts, and with no better success than if I were endeavouring deliberately to publish it to all the world, and as if in short it must come out. I would confide it to thy safekeeping, feeling sure that by this means, and by thy readiness as a true friend to afford me relief, I shall soon find myself freed from the distress it causes me, and that thy care will give me happiness in the same degree as my own folly has caused me misery. The words of Anselmo struck Lothario with astonishment, unable as he was to conjecture the purport of such a lengthy preamble, and though he strove to imagine what desire it could be that so troubled his friend, his conjectures were all far from the truth, and to relieve the anxiety with this perplexity was causing him, he told him he was doing a flagrant injustice to their friendship, in seeking circuitous methods of confiding to him his most hidden thoughts, for he well knew he might reckon upon his counsel in diverting them, or his help in carrying them into effect. "'That is the truth,' replied Anselmo. "'And replying upon that I will tell thee, friend Lothario, that the desire which harasses me is that of knowing whether my wife Camilla is as good and as perfect as I think her to be, and I cannot satisfy myself of the truth of this point except by testing her in such a way that the trial may prove the purity of her virtue, as the fire proves that of gold, because I am persuaded, my friend, that a woman is virtuous only in proportion as she is or is not tempted, and that if she alone is strong who does not yield to the promises, gifts, tears, and importunities of earnest lovers, for what thanks does a woman deserve for being good if no one urges her to be bad? And what wonder is it that she is reserved and circumspect to whom no opportunity is given of doing wrong, and who knows that she has a husband that will take her life the first time he detects her in impropriety? I do not, therefore, hold her who is virtuous through fear or want of opportunity, in the same estimation as her who comes out of temptation and trial with a crown of victory. And so, for these reasons, and many others, I could give thee to justify and support the opinion I hold. I am desirous that my wife Camilla should pass this crisis, and be refined and tested by the fire of finding herself wooed, and by one worthy to set his affections upon her. And if she comes out, as I know she will, victorious from the struggle, I shall look upon my good fortune as unequalled. I shall be able to say that the cup of my desire is full, and that the virtuous woman of whom the sage says, Who shall find her, has fallen to my lot. And if the result be to the contrary of what I expect, in the satisfaction of knowing that I have been right in my opinion, I shall bear without complaint 
the pain which my so dearly bought experience will naturally cause me and as nothing of all thou wilt urge in opposition to my wish will avail to keep me from carrying it into effect it is my desire friend lothario that thou shouldst consent to become the instrument for effecting this purpose that i am bent upon for i will afford the opportunities to that end and nothing shall be wanting that i may think necessary for the pursuit of a virtuous honourable modest and high-minded woman and among other reasons i am induced to entrust this arduous task to thee by the consideration that if camilla be conquered by thee the conquest will not be pushed to extremes but only far enough to account that accomplished which from a sense of honour will be left undone thus i shall not be wronged in anything more than intention and my wrong will remain buried in the integrity of thy silence which i know well will be lasting as that of death in what concerns me if therefore thou wouldst have me enjoy what can be called life thou wilt at once engage in this love struggle not lukewarmly nor slothfully but with the energy and zeal that my desire demands and with the loyalty our friendship assures me of such were the words anselmo addressed to lothario who listened to them with such attention that except to say what has already been mentioned he did not open his lips until the other had finished then perceiving that he had no more to say after regarding him for a while as one would regard something never before seen that excited wonder and amazement he said to him i cannot persuade myself anselmo my friend that what thou hast said to me is not in jest if i thought that thou were speaking seriously i would not have allowed thee to go so far so as to put a stop to thy long harangue by not listening to thee i verily suspect that either thou dost not know me or i do not know thee but no, I know well thou art Anselmo, and thou knowest that I am Lothario. The misfortune is, it seems to me, that thou art not the Anselmo thou wert, and must have thought that I am not the Lothario I should be, for the things thou hast said to me are not those of that Anselmo who was my friend, nor are those that thou demandest of me what should be asked of the Lothario thou knowest. True friends will prove their friends and make use of them, as it as a poet has said uscadaris whereby he meant that they will not make use of their friendship in things that are contrary to god's will if this then was a heathen's feeling about friendship how much more should it be a christian's who knows that the divine may not be forfeited for the sake of any human friendship and if a friend should go so far as to put aside his duty to heaven to fulfil his duty to his friend it should not be in matters that are trifling or of little moment but in such as affect the friend's life and honour. Now tell me, Anselmo, in which of these two art thou impelled that I should hazard myself to gratify thee, and do a thing so detestable as that thou seekest of me? Neither forsooth, on the contrary, what thou dost ask of me, so far as I understand, to strive and labour to rob thee of honour and life, and rob myself of them at the same time? For if I take away thy honour, it is plain I take away thy life as a man without honour is worse than dead and being the instrument as thou wilt have it so of so much wrong to thee shall not i too be left without honour and consequently without life listen to me anselmo my friend and be not impatient to answer me until i have said what occurs to me touching the object of thy desire for there will be time enough for thee to reply and for me to hear be it so said anselmo say what thou wilt lothario then went on to say it seems to me anselmo that thine is just now the temper of mind which is always that of the moors who can never be brought to see the error of their creed by quotations from the holy scriptures or by reasons which depend upon the examination of the understanding or are founded upon the articles of faith but must be examples that are palpable easy intelligible capable of proof not admitting of doubt with mathematical demonstrations that cannot be denied like if equals be taken from equals the remainders are equal and if they do not understand this in words and indeed they do not it has to be shown to them with the hands and put before their eyes and even with all this no one succeeds in convincing them of the truth of our holy religion the same mode of proceeding i shall have to adopt with thee for the desire which has sprung up in thee is so absurd and remote from everything that is a semblance of reason that i feel it would be a waste of time to employ it in reasoning with thy simplicity for at present I will call it by no other name, and I am tempted to leave thee in folly as a punishment for thy pernicious desire, but the friendship I bear thee, which will not allow me to desert thee in such manifest danger of destruction, 
keeps me from dealing so harshly by thee, and that thou mayst clearly see this, say, Anselmo, hast thou not told me that I must force my suit upon a modest woman, decoy one that is virtuous, make overtures to one that is pure-minded, pay court to one that is prudent? Yes, thou hast told me so, then, if thou knowest thou hast a wife, virtu modest, virtuous, pure-minded, and prudent, what is it that thou seekest? And if thou believes that she will come forth victorious from all my attacks, as doubtless she would, what higher titles than those she possesses now dost thou think thou canst upon her then? Or in what will she be better than she is now? Either thou, either thou dost not hold her to be what thou sayest, or thou knowest not what thou dost demand. If thou dost not hold her to be what thou sayest, why dost thou seek to prove her instead of treating her as guilty in the way that may seem best to thee? But if she be as virtuous as thou dost believest, and it is an uncall it is an uncalled for proceeding to make trial of truth itself, for after trial it will be in the same estimation as before. Thus, then, it is conclusive that to attempt things from which harm rather than advantage may come it, to us is the part of unreasoning and reckless minds, especially when they are things which are not forced or compelled to attempt, and which show from afar that it is plainly madness to attempt them. Difficulties are attempted either for the sake of God or for the sake of the world, or for both. Those undertaken for God's sakes are those which the saints undertake when they attempt to live the lives of angels in human bodies. Those undertaken for the sake of the world are those of men who traverse such a vast empire of water, such a variety of climate, so many strange countries, to acquire what are called the blessings of fortune, and those undertaken for the sake of God and the world together are those of brave soldiers who no sooner do they see in the enemy's wall a breach as wide as a cannonball can make than, casting aside all fear, without hesitation or heeding, the manifest peril that threatens them, borne onward by the desire of defending their faith, their country, and their king, they fling themselves dauntlessly into the midst of a thousand opposing deaths that await them. Such are the things that men are wont to attempt, and there is honor, glory, gain in attempting them, however full of difficulty and peril they may be. But that which thou sayest it is thy wish to attempt and carry out will not win thee the glory of God, nor the blessings of fortune, nor fame among men. For even if the issue be as thou wouldst have it, thou wilt be no happier, richer, or more honored than thou art this moment. And if it be otherwise, thou wilt be reduced to misery greater than can be imagined. For then it will avail thee nothing to reflect that no one is aware of thy misfortune that has befallen thee. It will suffice to torture and crush thee that thou knowest it thyself, and in confirmation of the truth of what I say, let me repeat to thee a stanza made by the famous poet Luigi Tansillo at the end of the first part of his Tears of St. Peter, which says thus, The anguish and the shame but grew greater in Peter's heart as morning slowly came. No eye was there to see him, well he knew, yet he himself was to himself a shame, exposed to all men's gaze or screened from view. A noble heart will feel the pang the same. A prey to shame the sinning soul will be, though none but heaven and earth its shame can see. And thus by keeping it secret thou wilt not escape thy sorrow, but rather thou wilt shed tears unceasingly, if not tears of the eyes, tears of blood from the heart, like those shed by that simple doctor our poet tells us of, that eyed the test of the cup, which the wise Ronaldo, better advised, refused to do, for though this may be a poetic fiction, it contains a moral lesson worthy of attention and study and imitation. Moreover, by what I am about to say to thee, thou wilt be led to see the great error thou wouldst commit. Tell me, Anselmo, if heaven or good fortune had made thee master and lawful owner of a diamond of the finest quality, with the excellence and purity of which all the lapidaries that had been seen it had been satisfied, saying with one voice and common consent that in purity, quality, and fineness it was all that a stone of the kind could possibly be. Thou thyself, too, being of the same belief, as knowing nothing could be to the contrary, would it be reasonable in thee to desire to take that diamond and place it between an anvil and a hammer, and by mere force of blows and strength of arm try it, if it were as hard and as fine as they said? And if thou didst, and if the stone should resist so silly a test, that would add nothing to its value or reputation, and if it were broken, as it might be, would not all be lost? Undoubtedly it would, leaving its owner to be rated as a fool in the opinion of all. Consider, then, Anselmo, my friend, that Camilla is a diamond of the finest quality, as well in thy estimation in that of, as in that of others, 
and that it is contrary to reason to expose her to the risk of being broken. For if she remains intact, she cannot rise to a higher value than she now possesses. And if she give way and be unable to resist, bethink thee now thou wilt be deprived of her, and with what good reason thou wilt complain of thyself for having been the cause of her ruin and thine own. Remember, there is no jewel in the world so precious as a chaste and virtuous woman, and that the whole honour of woman consists in reputation. And since thy wife is of that high excellence that thou knowest, wherefore shouldst thou seek to call that truth in question? Remember, my friend, that a woman is an imperfect animal, and that impediments are not to be placed in her way, to make her trip and fall, but that they should be removed, and her path left clear of all obstacles, so that without hindrance she may run her course freely to attain the desired perfection, which consists in being virtuous. Naturalists tell us that the ermine is a little animal which is a fur of purest white, and that when the hunters wish to take it, they make use of this artifice. Having ascertained the places which it frequents and passes, they sop the way to them with mud, and then, rousing it, drive it towards the spot, and as soon as the ermine comes in the mud, it halts, and allows itself to be taken captive rather than pass through the mire, and spoil and sully its whiteness, which values more than life and liberty. The virtuous and chaste woman is an ermine, and whiter and purer than snow is the virtue of modesty, and he who wishes her not to lose it, but to keep and preserve it, must adopt a course different from that employed with the ermine. He must not put her before the mire of the gifts and attentions of persevering lovers, because perhaps, and even without a perhaps, she may not have sufficient virtue and natural strength in herself to pass through and tread underfoot these impediments. They must be removed, and the, and the brightness of virtue and the beauty of a fair fame must be put before her. A virtuous woman, too, is like a mirror of clear shining crystal, liable to be tarnished and dimmed by every breath that touches it. She must be treated as relics are, adored, not touched. She must be protected and prized, as one protects and prizes a fair garden full of roses and flowers, the owner of which allows no one to trespass or pluck a blossom even for others that from afar and through the iron grating they may enjoy its fragrance and its beauty. Finally, let me repeat to thee some verses that come to my mind. I hear them in a modern comedy, and it seems to me they bear upon the point we are discussing. A prudent old man was giving advice to another, the father of a young girl, to lock her up, watch over her, and keep her in seclusion, and among other arguments he used this. A woman is a thing of glass, but her brittleness tis best not too curiously to test. Who knows what may come to pass? Breaking is an easy matter, and it's folly to expose. What you cannot mend to blows, what you can't make whole to shatter. This, then, all may hold is true, and that the reason's plain to see. For if days there be, there are golden showers too. And that I have said to thee so far, Anselmo, has had reference to what concerns thee. Now it is right that I should say something of what regards myself, and if I be prolix, pardon me. For the labyrinth into which thou hast answered, and from which thou wouldst have me extricate thee, makes it necessary. Thou dost reckon me thy friend, and thou wouldst rob me of honour, a thing wholly inconsistent with friendship. And not only dost thou aim at this, and thou wouldst have me rob thee of it also. That thou wouldst rob me of it is clear, for when Camilla sees that I pay court to her as thou requirest, she will certainly regard me as a man without honour or right feeling, since I attempt to do a thing so much opposed to what I owe to my position and thy friendship. And thou wouldst have me rob thee of it is beyond a doubt, for Camilla, seeing that I press my suit upon her, will suppose that I perceive something in her light that has encouraged me to make known to her my base desire, and she holds herself dishonoured, her dishonour touches thee as belonging to her, and hence arises what so commonly takes place, that the husband of the adulterous woman, though he may not be aware of or have given any cause for his wife's failure in duty, or being careless and negligent, have had in his power to prevent her dishonour, Nevertheless, is stigmatized by a vile and reproachful name, and in a manner regarded with eyes of contempt instead of pity by all who know of his wife's guilt, though they see that he is unfortunate not by, a no by his own fault, but by the lust of a vicious consort. But I will tell thee why, with good reason, dishonor attaches to the husband of the unchaste wife. Though he know not that she is so, nor be to blame, nor have anything done, or given any provocation to make her so, and be not weary listening to me, for it will be for thy good. When God created our first parent in the earthly paradise, the holy scripture says that he infused sleep into Adam, and while he slept took a rib from his left side, which he formed our mother Eve. And when Adam awoke and beheld her, he said, This is flesh of my flesh, and bone of my bone. And God said, 
For this shall man leave his father and his mother, and they shall be two in one flesh. And then was instituted the divine sacrament of marriage, which such ties that death alone can loose them. And such is the force and virtue of this miraculous sacrament that it makes two different persons one, and the same flesh, and even more than this, when the virtuous are married. For though they have come two souls, they have but one will. And hence it follows that as the flesh of the wife is one, and the same with that of her husband, the stains that may come upon it, or the injuries it incurs, fall upon the husband's flesh, though he, as has been said, may have given no cause for them. For as the pain of the foot or any member of the body is felt by the whole body, because all is one flesh, as the head feels the hurt to the ankle without having caused it, so the husband, being one with her, shares the dishonor of its wife. And as all worldly honor or dishonor comes of flesh and blood, and the erring wife's is of that kind, the husband must needs bear his part of it, and be held dishonorable without knowing it. See then, Anselmo, that the peril thou art encountering in seeking to deserve the peace of thy virtuous concert, see for what an empty and ill-advised curiosity thou wouldst rouse up passions that now repose in quiet in the breast of thy chaste wife. Reflect that what thou art seeking all to win is little, and what thou wilt lose is so much that I leave it undescribed, not having the words to express it. But if all I have said be not enough to turn thee from thy vile purpose, thou must seek some other instrument for thy dishonour and misfortune, for such I will not consent to be. Though I lose thy friendship, the greatest loss that I can conceive. Having said this, the wise and virtuous Lothario was silent, and Anselmo, troubled in mind and deep in thought, was unable for a while to utter a word in reply. But at length, he said, I have listened, Lothario, my friend, attentively, as thou hast seen, to what thou hast chosen to say to me, and in thy arguments, examples, and comparisons, I have seen that high intelligence thou dost possess, and the perfection of true friendship thou hast reached, and likewise I see and confess that I am not guided by the opinion, but follow my own. I am flying from the good and pursuing the evil. This being so, thou must remember that I am now laboring under that infirmity which women sometimes suffer from when the craving seizes them to eat clay, plaster, charcoal, and even things worse, disgusting to look at, much more to eat, so that it will be necessary to have recourse to some artifice to cure me, and this can easily be effected if only thou wilt make a beginning, and even though it be in a lukewarm and make-believe fashion to pay court to Camilla, who will not be so yielding that her virtue will give way at the first attack, with this mere attempt I shall rest satisfied, and thou wilt have done what our friendship binds thee to do not only in giving me life, but in persuading me not to discard my honour. And this thou art bound to do for one reason alone, that being, as I am resolved to apply this test, it is not for thee to permit me to reveal my weakness to another, and so imperil that honour thou art striving to keep me from losing. And if thine may not stand as high as it ought in the estimation of Camilla while thou art paying court to her, this is of little or no importance, because ere long, on finding in her that constancy which we expect, Thou canst tell her the plain truth as regards our stratagem, and so regain thy place in her esteem. And as thou art venturing so little, and by the venture canst afford me so much satisfaction, refuse not to undertake it, even if further difficulties present themselves to thee. For, as I have said, if thou wilt only make a beginning, I will acknowledge the issue decided. Lothario, seeing the fixed determination of Anselmo, and not knowing what further examples to offer or arguments to urge in order to dissuade him from it, and perceiving that he threatened to confide his pernicious scheme to someone else, to avoid a greater evil, resolved to gratify him and do what he asked, intending to manage the business so as to satisfy Anselmo without corrupting the mind of Camilla. So in reply he told him not to communicate his purpose to any other, for he would undertake the task himself, and would begin it as soon as he pleased. Anselmo embraced him warmly and affectionately, and thanked him for his offer, as if he had bestowed some great favor upon him, and it was agreed between them to set about it the next day, Anselmo affording opportunity and time to Lothario to converse alone with Camilla, and furnishing him with money and jewels to offer and present to her. He suggested, too, that he should treat her to music and write verses in her praise, and if he was unwilling to take the trouble of composing them, he offered to do it himself. Lothario agreed to all with an intention very different from what Anselmo had supposed, and with this understanding they returned to Anselmo's house, where they found Camilla awaiting her husband anxiously and uneasily, for he was later than usual in returning that day. Lothario repaired to his own house, and Anselmo remained in his, as well satisfied as Lothario was troubled in mind, for he could see no satisfactory way out of this ill-advised business. 
That night, however, he thought of a plan by which he might deceive Anselmo without any injury to Camilla. The next day he went to dine with his friend and was welcomed by Camilla, who received and treated him with great cordiality, knowing the affection her husband felt for him. When dinner was over and the cloth removed, Anselmo told Lothario to stay there with Camilla while he attended to some pressing business, and he would return in an hour and a half. Camilla begged him not to go, and Lothario offered to accompany him, but nothing could persuade Anselmo, who, on the contrary, pressed Lothario to remain waiting for him, as he had a matter of great importance to discuss with him. At the same time, he bade Camilla not to leave Lothario alone until he came back. In short, he contrived to put so good a face on the reason, or the folly, of his absence, that no one could have suspected it was a pretense. Anselmo took his departure, and Camilla and Lothario were left alone at the table, for the rest of the household had gone to dinner. Lothario saw himself in the lists according to his friend's wish, and facing an enemy that could by her beauty alone vanquish a squadron of armed knight, judge whether he had good reason to fear. But what he did was to lean his elbow on the arm of the chair and his cheek upon his hand, and asking Camilla's pardon for his ill manners, he said he wished to take a little sleep until Anselmo returned. Camilla said in reply that he could repose more at ease in the reception room than his chair, and begged of him to go and sleep there, but Lothario declined and there he remained asleep until the return of Anselma, who, finding Camilla in her own room and Lothario asleep, imagined that he had stayed away so long as to have afforded them time enough for conversation, and even for sleep, and was all impatience until Lothario should wake up, that he might go out with him and question him as to his success. Everything fell out as he wished. Lothario awoke, and the two at once left the house, and Anselmo asked what he was anxious to know, and Lothario in answer told him that he had not thought it advisable to declare himself entirely the first time, and therefore had only extolled the charms of Camilla, telling her that all the city spoke of nothing else but her beauty and wit, for this seemed to him an excellent way of beginning to gain her good will and render her disposed to listen to him with pleasure the next time, thus availing himself of the device the devil has recourse to when he would deceive one who is on the watch, for he being an angel of darkness transforms himself into an angel of light, and under cover of a fair seeming, discloses himself at length, and affects his purpose, if at the beginning his wiles are not discovered. All this gave great satisfaction to Anselmo, and he said he would afford the same opportunity every day, but without leaving the house, for he would find things to do at home, so that Camilla should not detect the plot. Thus, then, several days went by, and Lothario, without uttering a word to Camilla, reported to Anselmo that he had talked with her, and that he had never been able to draw from her the slightest indication of consent to anything dishonorable, nor even a sign or shadow of hope. On the contrary, he said she would inform her husband of it. So far, well, Camilla has thus resisted words. We must now see how she will resist deeds. I give you to-morrow two thousand crowns in gold for you to offer her, or even present, and as many more to buy jewels to lure her, for women are fond of being becomingly attired and going gaily dressed, and all the more so if they are beautiful, however chaste they may be. And if she resists this temptation, I will rest satisfied, and I will give you no more trouble. Hotharia replied that now he had begun, he would carry out the undertaking to the end, though he perceived he was to come out of it wearied and vanquished. The next day he received the four thousand crowns, and with them... Four thousand perplexities, for he knew not what to say by way of a new falsehood, but in the end he made up his mind to tell Camilla that Camilla stood firm against the gifts and promises as against words, and that there was no use in taking any further trouble, for the time was all spent to no purpose. But chance, detecting things in a different manner, so ordered it that Anselmo, having left Lothario and Camilla alone as on other occasions, shut himself into a chamber and posted himself to watch and listen through the keyhole to what passed between them and perceived that for more than half an hour lothario did not utter a word to camilla nor would utter a word though he were to be there for an age and he came to the conclusion that what his friend had told him about the replies of camilla was all invention and falsehood and to ascertain if it were so he came out and calling lothario aside asked him what news he had and in what humour camilla was lothario replied that he was not disposed to go on the business for she had answered him so angrily and harshly that he had not heart to say anything more to her. "'Ah, oh, Lothario, Lothario,' said Anselmo, "'how ill dost thou meet thy obligations to me, and the great confidence I repose in thee! I have been just now watching through this keyhole, and I have seen that thou hast not said a word to Camilla, whence I conclude that on the former occasion thou hast not spoken to her either. And if this be so, as no doubt it is, why dost thou deceive me, or wherefore seekest thou by craft to deprive me of the means I find of detaining my desire?' Anselmo said no more. 
but he said enough to cover it Lothario with shame and confusion, and he, feeling as if it were his honour touched by, having been detected in a lie, swore to Anselmo that he would from that moment devote himself to satisfying him without any deception, as he would see if he had the curiosity to watch, though he need not take the trouble, for the pains he would take to satisfy him would remove all suspicions from his mind. Anselmo believed him, and to afford him opportunity more free and less liable to surprise, he resolved to absent himself from his house for eight days, betaking himself to that of a friend of his who lived in a village not far from the city. And, the better to account for his departure to Camilla, he so arranged it that his friend should send him a very pressing invitation. Unhappy, short-sighted Anselmo, what art thou doing? What art thou plotting? What art thou devising? Bethink thee, thou art working against thyself, plotting thine own dishonour, devising thy own ruin. Thy wife Camilla is virtuous, thou dost possess her in peace and quietness. No one assails thy happiness. Her thoughts wander not beyond the walls of thy house. Thou art her heaven on earth, the object of her wishes, the fulfilment of her desires, the measure wherewith she mothers her will, making it conform in all things to thine and heaven's. If, then, the mind of her honour, beauty, virtue, and modesty yields thee without labour, all the wealth it contains, and thou canst wish for, why wilt thou dig the earth in search of fresh veins, of new unknown treasure, risking the collapse of Hall, since it but rests within the feeble props of her weak nature? Bethink thee that from him who seeks impossibilities that which is possible may with justice be withheld, as was better expressed by a poet who said, "'Tis mine to seek for life and death, health and disease seek I, I seek in prison freedom's breath and traitor's loyalty. So faith that ever scorns to grant or grace or boon to me, since what can never be I want denies me what might be. The next day Anselmo took his departure for the village, leaving instructions with Camilla that during his absence Lothario would come to look after his house and to dine with her, and that she was to treat him as she would himself. Camilla was distressed as a discreet and right-minded woman would be at the orders her husband left her, and bade him to remember that it was not becoming that any one should occupy his seat at the table during his absence, and if he acted thus from not feeling confidence that she would be able to manage his house, let him try her this time, and he would find by experience that she was equal to greater responsibilities. And Selma replied that it was his pleasure to have it so, and that she had only to submit and obey. Camilla said she would do so, though against her will. And Selma went, and the next day Lothario came to his house, where he was received by Camilla with a friendly and modest welcome. But she never suffered Lothario to see her alone, for she was always attended by men and woman servants, especially by a handmaid of hers, Leonella by name, to whom she was much attached, for they had been brought up together from childhood in her father's house, and whom she had kept with her after marriage with Anselmo. The first three days Lothario did not speak to her, though he might have done so when they removed the cloth and the servants retired to dine hastily, for such were Camilla's orders, nay more. Leonella had directions to dine earlier than Camilla, and never to leave it for her side. She, however, having her thoughts fixed upon other things more to her taste, and wanting that time and opportunity for her own pleasures, did not always obey her mistress's commands, but on the contrary left them alone, as if they had ordered her to do so. But the modest bearings of Camilla, the calmness of her countenance, the composure of her aspect, were enough to bridle the tongue of Lothario. But the influence which the many virtues of Camilla exerted in imposing silence on Lothario's tongue, proved mischievous for both of them, for if his tongue was silent, his thoughts were busy, and could dwell at leisure upon the perfections of Camilla's goodness and beauty one by one, charms enough to warm with love a marble statue, not to say a heart, of flesh. Lothario gazed upon her when he might have been speaking to her, and thought how worthy of being loved she was, and thus reflection began, little by little, to assail his allegiance to Anselmo, and a thousand times he thought of withdrawing from the city and going where Anselmo should never see him, nor he see Camilla. But already the delight he found in gazing on her interposed and held him fast. He put a constraint upon himself and struggled to repel and repress the pleasure he found in contemplating Camilla. When alone he blamed himself for his weakness, called himself a bad friend, nay, a bad Christian, then he argued the matter and compared himself with Anselmo, always coming to the conclusion that the folly and rashness of Anselmo had been worse than his faithlessness, and that if he could excuse his intentions as easily before God as with man, he had no reason to fear any punishment for his offence. In short, the beauty and goodness of Camilla, joined with the opportunity which the blind husband had placed in his hands, overthrew the loyalty of Lothario, and giving heed to nothing save the object towards which his inclinations led him, after Anselmo had been three days absent, during which he had been carrying on a continual struggle with his passion, he began to make love to Camilla with so much vehemence and warmth of language that she was overwhelmed with amazement, and could only rise from her place 
and retired to her room without answering him a word. But the hope which always springs up with love was not weakened in Lothario by the repelling demeanor. On the contrary, his passion for Camilla increased, and she discovering in him what she had never expected, knew not what to do, and considering it neither safe nor right to give him the chance or opportunity of speaking to her again, she resolved to send, as she did that very night, one of her servants with a letter to Anselmo, in which she addressed the following words to him. End of chapter 33 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kelly Bashare of Mattapoisett, Massachusetts. Don Quixote, Volume 1, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Translated by John Ormsby. Chapter 34 through 35. Chapter 34 in which is continued the novel of The Ill-Advised Curiosity. It is commonly said that an army looks ill without its general, and a castle without its castellan, and I say that a young married woman looks still worse without her husband, unless there are very good reasons for it. I find myself so ill at ease without you, and so incapable of enduring the separation, that unless you return quickly I shall have to go for relief to my parents' house, even if I leave yours without a protector. For the one you left me, if indeed he deserves that title, has, I think, more regard for his own pleasure than to what concerns you. As you are possessed of discernment, I need say no more to you, nor indeed is it fitting I should say more. And Selma received his letter, and from it he gathered that Lothario had be already begun his task, and that Camilla must have replied to him as he would have wished. And delighted beyond measure at such intelligence, he sent word to her not to leave his house on any account, as he would return very shortly. Camilla was astonished at Anselmo's reply, which placed her in greater perplexity than before, for she never dared to remain in her own house, nor yet to go to her parents, for in remaining her virtue was imperiled, and in going she was opposed to her husband's commands. Finally she decided upon what was worse, the worst course for her to remain, resolving not to fly from the presence of Lothario, that she might not give food for gossip to her servants, and she now began to regret having written as she had to her husband fearing he might imagine that Lothario had perceived some lightness which he had impelled him to lay aside the respect he owed her. But confident of her rectitude, she put her trust in God and her, in her own virtuous intentions, with which she hoped to resist in silence all the solicitations of Lothario, without saying anything to her husband so as not to involve him in any quarrel or trouble. And she began to consider how to excuse Lothario to Anselmo when he should ask her what it was that induced her to write that letter. With these resolutions, more honourable than judicious or effectual, she remained the next day listening to Lothario, who pressed his suit so strenuously that Camilla's firmness began to waver, and their virtue had enough to do to come to the rescue of her eyes and keep them from showing signs of a certain tender compassion which the tears and appeals of Lothario had awakened in her bosom. Lothario observed all this, and it inflamed him all the more. In short, he felt that while Anselmo's absence afforded time and opportunity, he must press the siege of the fortress and so he assailed her self-esteem with praises of her beauty, for there is nothing that more quickly reduces and levels the castle towers of fair woman's vanity than vanity itself upon the tongue of flattery. In fact, with the utmost assiduity, he undermined the rock of her purity with such engines that had Camilla been a brass, she must have fallen. He wept, he entreated, he promised, he flattered, he importuned, he pretended with so much feeling and apparent sincerity that he overthrew the virtuous resolves of Camilla, and won the triumph he least expected and most longed for. Camilla yielded, Camilla fell, but what wonder if the friendship of Lothario could not stand firm, a clear proof to us that the passion of love is to be conquered only by flying from it, and that no one should engage in a struggle with an enemy so mighty, for divine strength is needed to overcome his human power. Leonella alone knew of her mistress's weakness, for the two false friends and new lovers were unable to conceal it. Lothario did not care to tell Camilla the object Anselmo had in view, nor that he had afforded him the opportunity of attaining such a result, lest she should undervalue his love and think that it was by chance and without intending it, and not of his own accord that he had made love to her. A few days earlier Anselmo returned to his house, and did not perceive what it had lost, that which he so lightly treated and so highly prized. He went at once to see Lothario and found him at home. They embraced each other, and Anselmo asked for tidings of his life or death. The tidings... I have to give thee, Anselmo, my friend, 
said Lothario, are that thou dost possess a wife that is worthy to be the pattern and crown of all good wives. The words that I have addressed to her were borne away on the winds, my promises have been despised, my presents have been refused, such faint tears as I shed have been turned into open ridicule, and short, as Camilla is the essence of all beauty, so she is the treasure-house where purity dwells, and gentleness and modesty abide, with all the virtues that can confer praise, honour, and happiness upon a woman. Take back thy money, my friend, here it is, and I have no need to touch it, for the chastity of Camilla leads, yields not to things so base as gifts or promises. Be content, Anselmo, and refrain from making further proof, and as thou hast passed Dryshood through the sea of these doubts and suspicions that are and may be entertained of woman, seek not to plunge again into the deep ocean of new embarrassments, or with another plot make trial of the goodness and strength of the bark that heaven has granted thee for thy passage across the sea of this world. But reckon thyself now safe in port, moor thyself with the anchor of sound reflection, and rest in peace until thou art called upon to pay that debt which no nobility on earth can escape paying. Anselmo was completely satisfied by the words of Lothario, and believed them as fully as if they had been spoken by an oracle. Nevertheless, he begged of him not to relinquish the undertaking, were it but for the sake of curiosity and amusement. Though thenceforward he need not make use of the same earnest endeavours as before, all he wished him to do was to write some verses to her, praising her under the name of Chloris, for he, thought, for he himself would give her to understand that he was in love with the lady for whom he had given the name to enable him to sing her praises with the decorum due to her modesty, and if Lothario were unwilling to take the trouble of writing the verses, he would compose them himself. That will not be necessary, said Lothario, for the muses are not such enemies of mine, but that they visit me now and then in the course of the year. Do thou tell Camilla what thou hast proposed about a pretended amour of mine? As for the verses, we'll make them, and if not as good as the subject deserves, they shall be at least the best I can produce. An agreement to this effect was made between the friends, the ill-advised one and the treacherous, and Anselmo, returning to his house, asked Camilla the question she already wondered he had not asked before, what it was that caused her to write the letter she had sent him. Camilla replied that it had seemed to her that Lothario looked at her somewhat more freely than when he had been at home, but now she was undeceived and believed it to have been only her own imagination, for Lothario now avoided seeing her, or being alone with her. Anselmo told her that she might be quite easy on the score of that suspicion, for he knew that Lothario was in love with a damsel of rank in the city, whom he celebrated under the name of Chloris, and that, even if he were not, his fidelity and their great friendship left no room for fear. Had not Camilla, however, been informed beforehand by Lothario that his love for Chloris was a pretense, and that he himself had told Anselmo of it in order to be able sometimes to give utterance to the praises of Camilla herself, no doubt she would have fallen into despairing toils of jealousy, but, being forewarned, she received the startling news without uneasiness. The next day, as the three were at the table, Anselmo asked Lothario to recite something of what he had composed for his mistress Chloris, for as Camilla did not know her, he might safely say what he liked. "'Even did she know her,' returned Lothario, "'I would hide nothing, for when a lover praises this lady's beauty, and charges her with cruelty, he casts no imputation upon her fair name.' At any rate, all I can say is that yesterday I made a sonnet on the ingratitude of this chorus, which goes thus. At midnight, in the silence, when the eyes of happier mortals balmy slumbers close, the weary tale of my unnumbered woes to chorus and to heaven is wont to rise. And when the light of day, returning, dies, the portal of the east, with tints of rose, with undiminished force my sorrow flows in broken accents and in burning sighs. And when the sun ascends his star-girt throne, and on the earth pours down his midday beams, noon but renews my wailing and my tears, and with the night again goes up my moan. Yet ever in my agony it seems to me that neither heaven nor Chloris hears. The sonnet pleased Camilla, and still more Anselmo, for he praised it, and the lady was excessively cruel, who made no return for sincerity so manifest. On which Camilla said, Then all that love smitten poets say is true. As poets, they do not tell the truth, replied Lothario, but as lovers, they are not more defective in expression than they are truthful. There is no doubt of that, observed Anselmo, anxious to support and uphold Lothario's ideas with Camilla, who was as regardless of his design as she was deep in love with Lothario, and so taking delight in anything that was his, and knowing what his thoughts and writings had her for her, their object, and that she herself was the real chorus, she asked him to repeat some other sonnet or verses if he recollected any. I do, replied Lothario, but I do not think it as good as the first one, or 
more correctly speaking, was bad, but you can easily judge, for it is this. I know that I am doomed. Death is to me, as certain as that thou, ungrateful fair, dead at thy feet should see me lying ere. My heart repented of its love for thee, if buried in oblivion I should be, bereft of life, fame, favour, even there. It would be found that I thy image bear, deep graven in my breast for all to see, this like some holy relic do I prize, to save me from the fate my truth entails, truth that to thy hard heart its vigor owes. Alas for him that under lowering skies in peril o'er trackless ocean sails, where neither friendly port nor pole star shows. And some have praised the second sonnet, too, as he had praised the first, and so he went on adding link after link to the chain with which he was binding himself and making his dishonour secure. For when Lothario was doing most dishonour to him, he told him he was most honoured, and thus each step that Camilla descended towards the depths of her abasement, she mounted, in his opinion, toward the summit of virtue and fair fame. It so happened that, finding herself on one occasion alone with her maid, Camilla said to her, "'I am ashamed to think, my dear Leonella, how lightly, lightly I have valued myself that I did not compel Lothario to purchase, by at least some expenditure of time, that full possession of me that I so quickly yielded of him of my own free will. I fear that he will think ill my, my pliancy or lightness, not considering the irresistible influence he brought to bear upon me. "'Let not that trouble you, my lady,' said Leonella, "'for it does not take away the value of the thing given, or make it less precious to give it quickly, if it be really valuable and worthy of being prized. Nay." They are wont to say that he who gives quickly gives twice. They also say, said Camilla, that what costs little is valued less. That saying does not hold good in your case, replied Leonella, for love, as I have heard say, sometimes flies and sometimes walks. With this one it runs. With that it moves slowly, some it cools, others it burns, some it wounds, others it slays. It begins the course of its desires, and at the same moment completes and ends it. In the morning it will lay siege to a fortress, and by night will have taken it, for there is no power that can resist it. So what are you in dread of? What do you fear, when the same must have befallen Lothario, love hanging close, love having chosen the absence of my lord as the instrument for subduing you? And it was absolutely necessary to complete, then, what love has resolved upon, without affording the time to let Anselmo return, and by his presence compel the work to be left unfinished. For love has no better agent for carrying out his designs than opportunity." of opportunity he avails himself in all his fees, especially at the outset. All this I know well myself, more by experience than by hearsay, and some day, Signora, I will enlighten you on the subject, for I am of your flesh and blood too. Moreover, Lady Camilla, you do not you did not surrender your surrender yourself, or yield so quickly, but that you that first you saw Lothario's whole soul in his eyes, and his sighs, and his words, his promises, and his gifts, and by it and his good qualities perceived how worthy he was of your love. This, then, being the case, let not these scrupulous and prudish ideas trouble your imagination, but be assured that Lothario prizes you as you do him, and rest content and satisfied that as you are caught in the noose of love, it is one of worth and merit that has taken you, and one that has not only the four S's that they say true lovers ought to have, but a complete alphabet. Only listen to me, and you will see how I can repeat it by rote. He is to my eyes and thinking, amiable, brave, courteous, distinguished, elegant, fond, gay, honourable, illustrious, loyal, manly, noble, open, polite, quick-witted, rich, and the yeses according to the saying, and then tender, voracious, x does not suit him, for it is a rough letter, y has been given already, and z, zealous for your honour. Camilla laughed at her maid's alphabet, and perceived her to be more experienced in love's affairs than she said, which she admitted, confessing to Camilla that she had love passages with a young man of good birth of the same city. Camilla was uneasy at this, dreading lest it might prove the means of endangering her honour, and asked whether her intrigue had gone beyond words, and she, with little shame and much effrontery, said it had, for certain it is that ladies' imprudences make servants shameless, who, when they see their mistresses make a false step, think nothing of going astray themselves, or of its being known. All that Camilla could do was to entreat Lothario to say nothing about her doings to him, whom she called her lover, and to conduct her own affairs secretly, lest they should come to the knowledge of Anselmo, or of Lothario. Leonella said she would, but kept her word in such a way that she confirmed Camilla's apprehension of losing her reputation through her means. For this abandoned and bold Leonella, as soon as she perceived that her mistress's demeanour was not what it was wont to be, had the audacity to introduce her lover into the house, confident that even if her mistress saw him, 
she would not dare to expose him for the sins of mistresses and tell this mischief among them they make themselves the slave of their own servants and are obliged to hide their laxities and depravities as was the case with camilla who though she perceived not once but many times that leonella was in was with her lover in some room of the house not only did not dare to chide them but afforded her opportunities for concealing him and removed all difficulties lest he should be seen by her husband she was unable however to prevent him from being seen on one occasion as he sallied forth at daybreak by lothario who not knowing who he was at first took him for a spectre but as soon as he saw him hasten away muffling his face with the cloak and concealing himself carefully and cautiously he rejected this foolish idea and adopted another which would have been the ruin of all had not camilla found a remedy it did not occur to Lothario that this man he had seen issuing at such an untimely hour from Anselmo's house could have entered it on Leonella's account, nor did he remember there was such a person as Leonella. All he thought that was as Camilla had been light in yielding with him, so she had been with another. For this further penalty this brings this woman's for this further penalty the erring woman's sin bring with it, and that her honour is distrusted even by him whose overtures and persuasions she has yielded and he believes her to have surrendered more easily to others, and gives implicit credence to every suspicion that comes into his mind. All Lothario's good sense seems to have failed him at this juncture, all his prudent maxims escaped his memory, for without once reflecting rationally, and without more ado, his in, in his impatience and in the blindness of the jealous rage that gnawed his heart, and dying to revenge himself upon Camilla, who had done him no wrong, before Anselmo had risen, he hastened him, and said, no, Anselmo, that for several days past I have been struggling with myself, striving to withhold from thee what is no longer possible or right that I should conceal from thee. No, that Camilla's fortress has surrendered, and is ready to submit to my will. And if I have been slow to reveal this fact to thee, it was in order to see if there were some like caprice of hers, or if she sought to try me and ascertain if the love I began to make to her with thy permission was made with a serious intention. I thought, too, that— if she were what she ought to be, and what we both believed her, would have ere this given the information of my addresses. But seeing that she delays, I believe the truth of the promise she has given me. The next time thou art absent from the house, she will grant me an interview in the closet where thy jewels are kept. And it was true that Camilla used to meet him there. But I do not wish thee to rush precipitately to take vengeance, for the sin is as yet only committed in intention, and Camilla's may change perhaps between this and the appointed time and repentance spring up in its place as hitherto thou hast always followed my advice wholly or in part follow and observe this that i will give thee now so that without mistake and with mature deliberation thou mayst satisfy thyself as to what may see in the best course pretend to absent thyself for two or three days as thou hast been wont to do on other occasions and contrive to hide thyself in the closet for the tapestries and other things there afford great facilities for thy concealment, and then thou wilt see with, thy own, with thine own eyes, and I with mine, what Camilla's purpose may be. And if it be a guilty one, which may be feared rather than expected, with silence, prudence, and discretion, thou canst thyself become the instrument of punishment for the wrong done thee. And Selma was amazed, and overwhelmed, and astounded at the words of Lothario, which came upon him at a time when he least expected to hear them. For he now looked upon Camilla as having triumphed over the pretended attacks of Lothario, and was beginning to enjoy the glory of her victory. He remained silent for a considerable time, looking on the ground with fixed gaze, and at length said, Thou hast behaved, Lothario, as I expected of thy friendship. I will follow thy advice in everything. Do as thou wilt, and keep this secret as thou seest it should be kept in circumstance so unlooked for. Lothario gave him his word, but after leaving him he repented altogether of what he had said to him perceiving how foolishly he had acted as he might have revenged himself upon camilla in some less cruel and degrading way he cursed his want of sense condemned his hasty resolution and knew not what course to take to undo the mischief or find some ready escape from it at last he decided upon revealing all to camilla and as there was no want of opportunity for doing so he found her alone the same day but she as soon as she had the chance of speaking to him said lothario my friend i must tell thee i have a sorrow in my heart which fills it so it seems ready to burst, and it will be wonder if it does not, for the audacity of Leonella has now reached such a pitch that every night she conceals a gallant of hers in this house, and remains with him till morning at the expense of my reputation, inasmuch as it is open to any one to question it who may see him quitting my house at such unseasonable hours, 
but what distresses me is that I cannot punish or chide her, for her privity to our intrigue bridles my mouth and keeps me silent about hers, while I am dreading that some catastrophe will come of it. As Camilla said this, Lothario at first imagined it was some device to delude him into the idea that the man he had seen going out was Leonella's lover, not hers, but when he saw how she wept and suffered, and begged him to help her, he became convinced of the truth, and the conviction completed his confusion and remorse. However, he told Camilla not to distress herself, as he would take measures to put a stop to the insolence of Leonella. At the same time he told her what, driven by the fierce rage of jealousy, he had said to Anselmo, and how he had arranged to hide himself in the closet, that he might there see plainly how little she preserved her fidelity to him. And he entreated her to pardon for this madness, and her advice as to how to repair it, and escape safely from the intricate labyrinth in which his imprudence had involved him. Camilla was struck with alarm at hearing what Lothario had said, and with much anger and great good sense she reproved him, and rebuked his base design in the foolish and mischievous resolution he had made. But as woman has by nature a nimbler wit than man for good and for evil, though it is apt to fail when she sets herself deliberately to reason, Camilla on the spur of the moment thought of a way to remedy what was all appearance irre irremediable, and told Lothario to contrive that the next day Anselmo should conceal himself in the place he mentioned, for she hoped his from his concealment to obtain the means of their enjoying themselves for the future without any apprehension, and without revealing her purpose to him entirely, she charged him to be careful, as soon as Anselmo was concealed, to come to her when Leonella should call him, and to all she said to him to answer, as he would take, as he would have answered had he not known that Anselmo was listening. Lothario pressed her to explain her intention fully, so that he might with more certainty and precaution take care to do what he saw to be needful. I tell you, said Camilla, there is nothing to take care of except to answer me what I shall ask you. For she did not ex wish to explain to him beforehand what she meant to do, fearing lest he should be unwilling to follow out an idea which seemed to her such a good one, and should try to devise some other less practicable plan. Lothario then retired, and the next day Anselmo, under pretense of going to his friend's country house, took his departure, and then returned to conceal himself, which he was able to do easily, as Camilla and Leonella took care to give him the opportunity and so he placed himself in hiding in the statue of agitation that it may be imagined he would feel who expected to see the vitals of his honour laid bare before his feet eyes and found himself on the point of losing the supreme blessing he thought he possessed in his beloved camilla having made sure of anselmo's being in his hiding place camilla and leonella entered the closet and the instant she set foot within it camilla said with a deep sigh ah dear leonella would it not be better before i do what i am unwilling you should know, lest you should seek to prevent it, that you should take Anselmo's dagger that I have asked of you, and with it pierce this vile heart of mine. But no, there is no reason why I should suffer the punishment of another's fault. I will first know what it is that the bold licentious eyes of Lothario have seen in me, that could have encouraged him to reveal to me a design so base as that which he has disclosed, regardless of his friend and of my honour. Go to the window, Leonella, and call him, for no doubt he is in the street waiting to carry out his vile project. But mine, cruel it may be, but honourable, shall be carried out first. Ah, Signora, said the crafty Leonella, who knew her part, what is it you want to do with this dagger? Can it be that you want to take your own life or Lothario's? For whichever you mean to do, it will lead to the loss of your reputation and good name. It is better to dissemble your wrong and not give this wicked man the chance of entering the house now and finding us alone. Consider, Signora, we are a weak woman, and he is a man, and determined. And as he comes with such a base purpose, blind and urged by passion, perhaps you can put yours into execution. He may do what will be worse for you than taking your life. I'll betide my master Anselmo for giving such authority in his house to this shameless fellow. And supposing you kill him, Signor, as I suspect you mean to do, what shall we do with him when he is dead? What, my friend, replied Camilla, we shall leave him for Anselmo to bury him, for in reason it will be to him a light labour to hide his own infamy underground. Summon him, make haste, for all the time I delay in taking vengeance for my wrong seems to me an offence against the loyalty I owe my husband. And Selmo was listening to all this, and every word that Camilla uttered made him change his mind, but when he heard that it was resolved to kill Othario, his first impulse was to come out and show himself to avert such a disaster. But in his anxiety to see the issue of a resolution so bold and virtuous, he restrained himself, and sending to come forth to prevent the deed in time, at this moment Camilla, throwing herself upon a bed that was close by, swooned away, and Leonella began to weep bitterly, exclaiming, "'Woe is me that I should be fated to have dying 
here in my arms the flower of virtue upon earth the crown of true wives the pattern of chastity with more to the same effect so that any one who heard her would have taken her for the most tender-hearted and faithful handmaid in the world and her mistress for another persecuted penelope camilla was not long in recovering from her fainting fit and on coming to herself she said why do you not go leonella to call hither that friend the falsest to his friend that the, the, the sun ever shone upon or night concealed away run haste speed lest the fire of my wrath burn itself out with delay and the righteous vengeance that i hope for melt away in venices and maledictions i am just going to call him signora said leonella but first you must give me that dagger lest while i am gone you should by means of it give cause to all who love you to weep all their lives go in peace dear leonella i will not do so said camilla for rash and foolish as i may be to your mind in defending my honour i am not going to be so much as that lucretia who they say killed herself without having done anything wrong without having first killed him on whom the ground of her misfortune lay i shall die if i am to die but it must be after full vengeance upon him who has brought me here to weep over audacity that has that no fault of mine gave birth to leonella required much pressing before she would go to summon lothario but at last she went and while awaiting her return camilla continued as if speaking to herself good god would it not have been more prudent to have repulsed lothario as i have done many a time before than to allow him as i am now doing to think me unchaste and vile even for the short time i must wait until i undeceive him no doubt it would have been better but i should not be avenged nor the honour of my husband vindicated should he find so clear and easy an escape from the strait into which his depravity has led him let the traitor pay with his life for the temerity of his wanton wishes and let the world know if haply it shall ever come to know that camilla not only preserved her allegiance to her husband but avenged him of the man who dared to wrong him still i think it might be better to disclose this to anselmo but then i have called his attention to it in the letter i wrote him in the country and if he did nothing to prevent the mischief i there pointed out to him i suppose it was from pure goodness of heart and trustfulness he would not and could not believe that any thought against his honour could harbour in the breasts of so staunch a friend nor indeed did i myself believe it for many days nor should i have ever believed it if his insolence had not gone so far as to make manifest by open presence lavish promises and ceaseless tears but why do i argue this does a bold determination stand in need of arguments surely not and traitors avaunt vengeance to my aid let the false one come approach advance die yield up his life and then befall what may pure i came to him who heaven bestowed upon me pure i shall leave him and at the worst bathed in my own chaste blood and in the foul blood of the falsest friend that friendship ever saw in the world and as she uttered these words she paced the room holding the unsheathed dagger with such irregular and disordered steps and such gestures that one would have supposed her to have lost her senses and taken her for some violent desperado instead of a delicate woman and selmo hidden behind some tapestries where he had concealed himself beheld and was amazed by all and already felt that what he had seen and heard was a sufficient answer to even greater suspicions and he would have been now well pleased if the proof afforded by lothario's coming were dispensed with as he feared some sudden mishap but as he was on the point of showing himself and coming forth to embrace and undeceive his wife he paused as he saw leonella returning leading lothario camilla when she saw him drawing a long line in front of her on the floor with the dagger said to him lothario pay attention to what i say to thee if by any chance thou darest to cross this line thou seest or even approaches it the instant i see thee attempt it that same instant will i pierce my bosom with this dagger that i hold in my hand and before thou answerest me a word desire thee to listen to a few from me and afterwards thou shalt reply as may please thee first i desire to tell thee to tell me lothario if thou knowest my husband anselmo and in what light thou regardest him and secondly i desire to know if thou knowest me too answer me this without embarrassment or reflecting deeply what thou wilt answer for they are no riddles i put to thee lothario was not so dull but that from the first instance when camilla directed him to make anselmo hide himself he understood what she intended to do and therefore he fell in with her eyes idea so readily and promptly that between them they made the imposture look more true than truth so he answered her thus i did not think fair camilla that thou wert calling me to ask me questions that remote from the object with which i come but if it is to defer the promised reward thou art doing so thou might have put it off still longer for the ha longing for happiness gives the more distress and nearer comes the hope of gaining it but lest thou should say that i do not answer thy questions i say that i know thy husband anselmo and that we have known each other from our earliest years 
I will not speak of what thou too knowest of our friendship, that I may compel, not compel myself to testify against the wrong that love, the mighty excuse for greater errors, makes me inflict upon him. Thee I know, and hold in the same estimation as he does, for were it not so, I had not for a lesser prize acted in opposition to what I owe my station in the holy laws of true friendship, now broken and violated by me through that powerful enemy love. If thou dost confess that, returned Camilla, mortal enemy of all that rightly deserves to be loved, with what face dost thou dare to come before one who thou knowest to be the mirror wherein he is reflected, on whom thou shouldst look to see how unworthily thou him? But, woe is me, I now comprehend what has made thee give so little heed to what thou owest to thyself. It must have been some freedom of mine, for I will not call it a modesty, as it did not proceed from any deliberate intention, but from some heedlessness such as women are guilty of through inadvertence when they have no occasion for reserve. But tell me, traitor, when did I by word of sign give a reply to thy prayers that could awaken in thee a shadow of hope of attaining thy base wishes? When were not thy professions of love sternly and scornfully rejected and rebuked? When were thy frequent pledges and still more frequent gifts believed or accepted? But as I am persuaded that no one can long persevere in the attempt to win love unsustained by some hope, I am willing to attribute to myself the blame of thy assurance, for no doubt some thoughtless, thoughtlessness of mine has all this time fostered thy hopes, and therefore will I punish myself and inflict upon myself the penalty thy guilt deserves, and that thou mayest see that being so relentless to myself I cannot possibly be otherwise to thee. I have summoned thee to be a witness of the sacrifice I mean to offer to the injured honour of my honoured husband, wronged by thee with all the assiduity thou wert capable, and by me too, though want of caution in avoiding every occasion, if I have given any, of encouraging and sanctioning thy base designs. Once more I say that suspicion in my mind that some imprudence of mine has engendered these lawless thoughts in thee, is what causes me most distress, and what I desire to punish with my own hands for were any other instrument of punishment employed, my error might become what causes me distress, and what I desire, my error might become widely known. But before I do so, in my death I mean to inflict death, and take with me one that will satisfy my longing for the revenge I hope for and have. For I shall see, wheresoever it may be that I go, the penalty awarded by inflexible, unswerving justice on him who has placed me in a position so desperate. As she uttered these words with, words with incredible energy and swiftness, she flew upon Lothario with a naked dagger, so manifestly burnt on burying it in his breast that he was almost uncertain whether these demonstrations were real or feigned, for he was obliged to have recourse to all his skill and strength to prevent her from striking him. And with such reality did she act at this strange farce and mystification that, to give it a color of truth, she determined to stain it with her own blood, for, perceiving or pretending that she could not wound Lothario, she said, Fate, it seems, will not grant my desire complete satisfaction, but it will not be able to keep me from satisfying it partially at least, and making an effort to free the hand with a dagger which Lothario held in his grasp, she released it, and directing the point to a place where it could not inflict a deep wound, she plunged it into her left side high up close to the shoulder, and then allowed herself to fall to the ground as if in a faint. Leonel and Lothario stood amazed and astounded at the catastrophe, and seeing Camilla stretched on the ground and bathed in her blood, they were still uncertain as to the true nature of the act. Lothario, terrified and breathless, ran in haste to pluck out the dagger, but when he saw how slight the wound was, he, relieved of his fears, at once more admired the subtlety, coolness, and ready wit of the fair Camilla. And the better to support the part he had been, he had to play, he began to utter profuse, doleful lamentations over her body as if she were dead, invoking maledictions not only on himself, but also on him who had been the means of placing him in such a position. And knowing that his friend Anselmo heard him, he spoke in such a way as to make a listener feel much more pity for him than for Camilla, even though he supposed her dead. Leonella took her up in her arms and laid her on the bed, entreating Lothario to go in quest of someone to attend to her wound in secret, and at the same time asking his advice and opinion as to what they should say to Anselmo about his lady's wound if he should chance to return before it was healed. He replied they might say what they liked, for he was not in a state to give advice that would be of any use. All he could tell her was to try and stanch the blood, as he was going where he should never more be seen, and with every appearance of deep grief and sorrow he left the house. But when he found himself alone, and where there was nobody to see him, he crossed himself unceasingly, lost in wonder at the adroitness of Camilla, and the consistent acting of Leonella. He reflected how convinced Anselmo would be that he had a second 
Portia for a wife, and he looked forward anxiously to meeting him in order to rejoice together over falsehood and truth, the most craftily veiled that could be imagined. Leonella, as he told her, stanched her lady's blood, which was no more than suffice to support her deception, and washing the wound with a little wine, she bound it up to the best of her school skill. Taking all the time she was sending her in a strain that, even if nothing else had been said before, would have been enough to assure Anselmo that he had in Camilla a model of purity. To Leonella's word Camilla added her own, calling herself cowardly and wanting in spirit, since she had not at the time she had most need of it to rid herself of the life she so much loathed. She asked her attendant's advice as to whether or not she ought to inform her beloved husband of all that had happened, but the other bade her to say nothing about it, as she would lay upon him the obligation of taking vengeance on Lothario, which he could not do but at great risk to himself, and it was the duty of a true wife not to give her husband provocation to quarrel, but on the contrary to remove it as far as possible from him. Camilla replied that she believed she was right and that she would follow her advice, but at any rate it would be well to consider how she was to explain the wound to Anselmo, for he could not help seeing it, to which Leonella answered that she did not know how to tell a lie even in jest. "'How then can I know, my dear?' said Camilla, for I should not dare to forge or keep up a falsehood if my life depended on it. If we can think of no escape from the difficulty, it will be better to tell him the plain truth than he should find us out in an untrue story. Be not uneasy, Signora, said Leonella. Between this and tomorrow, I will think of that which we must say to him, and perhaps the wound being where it is can be hidden from sight, and heaven will be pleasured to aid us in a porpoise so good and honorable. Compose yourself, Signora, and endeavor to calm your excitement, lest my lord find you agitated, and leave the rest to my care and God's, who always supports good intentions. Anselmo had with the deepest attention listened to and seen played out the tragedy of the death of his honor, which the performers acted with such wonderfully effective truth that it seemed as if they had become the realities of the parts they played. He longed for night and an opportunity of escaping from the house to go and see his good friend Lothario, and with him give vent to his joy over the precious pearl he had gained in having established his wife's purity. Both mistress and maid took care to leave him an opportunity to give him time and opportunity to get away, and taking advantage of it he made his escape, and at once he went in quest of Lothario, and it would be impossible to describe how he embraced him when he found him, and the things he said to him in the joy of his heart, and the praises he bestowed upon Camilla, all which Lothario listened to without being able to show any pleasure, for he could not forget how deceived his friend was, and how dishonorably he had wronged him, and though Anselmo could see that Lothario was not glad, Still, he imagined it was only because he had left Camilla wounded and had himself been the cause of it, and so, among other things, he told himself not to be distressed about Camilla's accident, for, as they had agreed to hide it from him, the wound was evidently trifling, and that being so, he had no cause for fear, but should henceforward be of good cheer and rejoice with him, seeing that by his means and adroitness he found himself raised to the greatest height of happiness that he could venture to hope for, and desired no better pastime than making verses in praise of Camilla that would preserve her name for all time to come. Lothario commended his purpose, and promised on his own part to aid him in raising a monument so glorious. And so Anselmo was left the most charmingly hoodwinked man there could be in the world. He himself, persuaded he was conducting the instrument of his glory, led home by the hand him who had been the utter destruction of his good name, whom Camilla received with averted countenance, though with smiles in her heart. The deception was carried on for some time, until at the end of the few months fortune turned her wheel, and the guilt which had been until then so skilfully concealed was published abroad, and then Selmo paid with his life the penalty of his ill-advised curiosity. End of chapter 34 Chapter 35 which treats of the heroic and prodigious battle Don Quixote had with certain skins of red wine, and brings the novel of the ill-advised curiosity to a close. There remained but little more of the novel to be read when Sancho Panza burst forth in wild excitement from the garret where Don Quixote was lying, shouting, Run, sirs, quick, and help my master, who is in the thick of the toughest and stiffest battle I have ever laid eyes on. By the living God he has given the giant the enemy of the lady princess, Mikomikona, such a slash that he has sliced his head clean off as it were a turnip. "'What are you talking about, brother?' said the curate, pausing as he was about to read the remainder of the novel. "'Are you in your senses, Sancho? How the devil can it be, as you say, when the giant is two thousand leagues away?' Here they heard a loud noise in the chamber, and Don Quixote shouting, "'Sand, thief, brigand, villain! Now have I got thee, and thy scimitar shall not avail thee!' And then it seemed as though he were slashing vigorously at the wall. 
"'Don't stop to listen,' said San Sancho, "'but go in and part them, or help my master. "'But there is no need of that now, for no doubt the giant is dead by this time, "'and giving account to God of his wicked past life. "'For I saw the blood flowing on the ground, and the head cut off and fallen on one side. "'And it is as big as a large wineskin. "'May I die,' said the landlord at this, "'if Don Quixote or Don Devil has not been slashing some of the skins of red wine "'that stand full at his bed's head.' and the spilt wine must be what his good fellow takes for blood. And so saying, he went into his room, and the rest after him, and there they found Don Quixote in the strangest costume in the world. He was in his shirt, which was not long enough in front to cover his thighs completely, and was six fingers shorter behind. His legs were very long and lean, covered with hair, and anything but clean. On his head he had a little greasy red cap that belonged to the host. Round his arm he had rolled the blanket of the bed to which Sancho, for reasons best known to himself, owed a grudge, and in his right hand he held his unsheathed sword, with which he was slashing about on all sides, uttering exclamations as if he were actually fighting some giant, and the best of it was his eyes were not open, for he was fast asleep, and dreaming that he was doing battle with a giant, for his imagination was so wrought upon by the adventure he was going to accomplish that it made him dream he had already reached the kingdom of my Comicon, and was engaged in combat with his enemy, and believing he was laying on the giant, he had given so many sword-cuts to the skin that the whole room was full of wine. On seeing this, the landlord was so enraged that he fell on Don Quixote, and with his clenched fists began to pummel him in such a way that if Cardinio and the curate had not dragged him off, he would have brought the war of the giant to an end. But in spite of all, the poor gentleman never woke until the barber brought a great pot of cold water from the well and flung it with one dash all over his body, on which Don Quixote woke up but not so completely as to understand what was the matter. Dorothea, seeing how short and slight his attire was, would not go in to witness the battle between her champion and her opponent. As for Sancho, he went searching all over the floor for the head of the giant, and not finding it, he said, I see now that it's all enchantment in this house, for the last time, on this very spot where I am now, I got ever so many thumps without knowing who gave them to me, or being able to see anybody, and now this head is not to be seen anywhere about though I saw it cut off with my own eyes, and the blood running from the body as if from a fountain. "'What blood and fountains are you talking about, enemy of God and his saints?' said the landlord. "'Don't you see, you thief, that the blood and the fountain are only these skins that have been stabbed in the red wine swimming all over the room? And I wish I saw the soul of him that stabbed them swimming in hell.' "'I know nothing about that,' said Sancho. "'All I know is that it will be bad luck that through not finding his, this head my country will melt away like salt in water.' For Sancho awake was worse than his master's sleep, so much his master's promises addled his wits. The landlord was beside himself at the coolness of the squire and the mischievous doings of the master, and swore it should not be like the last time when they went without paying, and that their privileges of chivalry should not good hold good this time to let one or the other of them without paying, even to the cost of the plugs that would have to be put to the dead wineskins. The curate was holding Don Quixote's hands, who— Fancying he had now ended the adventure, and was in the presence of the princess Mycomicona, knelt before the curate and said, "'Exalted and beauteous lady, your highness may live from this day forth, fearless of any harm this base being could do you, and I too from this day forth am released from the promise I gave you, since by the help of God on high and by the favour of her by whom I live and breathe I have fulfilled it so successfully.' "'Did not I say so?' said Sancho on hearing this. "'You see, I wasn't drunk, and there, you see, my master has already salted the giant. "'There's no doubt about the balls. My country is all right.' "'Who could have helped laughing at the absurdities of the pair, master and man? "'And laugh they did, all except the landlord, who cursed himself. "'But at length the barber, Cardinio, and the curate contrived with no small trouble to get Don Quixote on the bed. "'And he fell asleep with every appearance of excessive weariness.' They left him to sleep, and came out to the gate of the inn to console Sancho Panza for not having found the head of the giant, but much more work had they to appease the landlord, who was furious at the sudden death of his wineskins, and said the landlady, half scolding, half crying, at an evil moment, and in such an unlucky hour he came into the, my house, this knight errant, would that I had never set eyes on him, for dear he has cost me. The last time he went off with the overnight score against him for supper, bed, straw, and barley, for himself and squire and a hack and an ass, saying he was a knight adventurer. God sent unlucky adventures to him and all the adventurers in the world, and therefore not bound to pay anything, for it was so settled by the knight errantry tariff. 
and then, all because of him, came the other gentleman and carried off my tail, and gives it back more than two curatillas the worse, all stripped of its hair, so that it is not for my husband's purpose, and then, for a finishing touch to all, to burst my wine-skins and spill my wine. I wish I saw his own blood spilt, but let him not deceive himself, for by the bones of my father and the shade of my mother they shall pay me down every quartz, or my name is not what it is, and I am not my father's daughter. All this and more to the same effect the landlady delivered with great irritation, and her good maid Meritornes backed her up, while the daughter held her peace and smiled from time to time. The curate smoothed matters by promising to make good all losses to the best of his power, not only as regarded the wine-skin, but also the wine, and above all the depreciation of the tale which they set such store by. Dorothea comforted Sancho, telling him that she pledged herself as soon as it should appear certain that his master had decapitated the giant, and she found herself peacefully established in her kingdom, to bestow upon him the best county there was in it. With this Sancho consoled himself, and assured the princess she might rely upon it that he had seen the head of the giant, and more by token it had a beard that reached to the girdle, and that if it was not to be seen now it was because everything that happened in that house went by enchantment, as he himself had proved the last time he had lodged there. Dorothea said that she fully believed it, and that he need not be uneasy, for all would go well and turn out as he wished and therefore being appeased the curate was anxious to go on with the novel as he saw there was but little more left to read dorothea and the others begged him to finish it and he as he was willing to please them and enjoyed reading it himself continued the tale in these words the result was that from the confidence anselmo felt in camilla's virtue he lived happily and free from anxiety and camilla purposely looked coldly on lothario that Anselmo might suppose her feelings towards him to be the opposite of what they were, and the better to support the position, Lothario begged to be excused from coming to the house, as the displeasure with which Camilla regarded his presence was plain to be seen. But the befooled Anselmo said he would on no account allow such a thing, and so in a thousand ways he became the author of his own dishonour, while he believed he was ensuring his happiness. Meanwhile the satisfaction with which Leonella saw herself in power to carry on her humour reached such a height that, regardless of everything else, she followed her, in her inclinations unrestrainedly, feeling confident that her mistress would screen her and even show her how to manage it safely. At last one night Anselmo heard footsteps in Leonella's room, and on trying to enter to see who it was, he found that the door was held against him, which made him all the more determined to open it, and exerting his strength he forced it open and entered the room in time to see a man leaping through the window into the street. He ran quickly to seize him or discover who he was but he was unable to effect either purpose, for Leonella flung her arms round him, crying, "'Be calm, signor, do not give way to passion or follow him who has escaped from this. He belongs to me, and in fact he is my husband.' And Selma would not believe it, but blind with rage he drew a dragger and threatened to stab Leonella, bidding her to tell her the truth, or he would kill her. She in fear, not knowing what she was saying, exclaimed, "'Do not, do not kill me, signor, for I can tell you more th important things than any you can imagine.' "'Tell me, then, at once, or thou diest,' said Anselmo. "'It would be impossible for me now,' said Leonella. "'I am so agitated. "'Leave me till to-morrow, and then you shall hear from me "'what thou will fill thou with in astonishment. "'But rest assured that he who leaped through the windows "'is the young man of this city, "'who has given me his promise to become my husband.' "'Anselmo was appeased with this, "'and was content to wait the time she asked of him, "'for he never expected to hear anything against Camilla, "'so satisfied and sure for virtue was he, and so he quitted the room and left Leonella locked in, telling her she should not come out until she had told him all she had to make known to him. He went at once to Cam see Camilla, and tell her, as he did, all that passed between him and her handymaid, and the promise she had given to inform him of matters of serious importance. There is no saying whether Camilla was agitated or not, for so great was her fear and dismay that making sure, as she had good reason to do, that Leonella would tell and Selmo all she knew of her faithlessness, she had not the courage to wait and see if her suspicions were confirmed, and that same night, as soon as she thought that Anselmo was asleep, she packed up the most valuable jewels she had and some money, without being observed by anybody, escaped the, from the house, and betook herself to Lotharius, to whom she related what had occurred, imploring him to convey her some, to some place of safety, or to fly with her, where they might be safe from Anselmo. The state of perplexity to which Camilla reduced Lothario was such that he was unable to utter a word in reply, still less to decide upon what he should do. At length he resolved to conduct her to a convent to which a sister of his was prioress. Camilla agreed to this, and with the speed which the circumstances demanded, Lothario took her to the convent and left her there. 
then himself quitted the city without letting any one know of his departure. As soon as daylight came, Anselmo, without missing Camilla from his side, rose eager to learn what Leonela had to tell him, and hastened to the room where he had locked her in. He entered, he opened the door, but found no Leonela. All he found were some sheets knotted to the window, a plain proof that she had let herself down from it and escaped. He returned uneasily to tell Camilla, but not finding her in bed or anywhere in the house, he was lost in amazement. He asked servants of the house about her, but none of them could give him any explanation. As he was going in search of Camilla, it happened by chance that he observed her boxes were lying open, and that the greater part of her jewels were gone, and now he became fully aware of his disgrace, and that Leonella was not the cause of his misfortune, and just as he was, without delaying to dress himself completely, he repaired, sat at heart and dejected, to his friend Lothario to make known his sorrow to him. But when he fell to find him, and his servants reported that he had been absent from his house all night, and had taken with him all the money he had, he felt as though he were losing his senses, and to make all complete on returning to his own house, he found it deserted and empty, not one of all his servants, male or female, remaining in it. He knew not what to think, or say, or do, and his reason seemed to be deserting him little by little. He reviewed his position, and saw himself in a moment left without wife, friend, or servants, abandoned, he felt, by the heavens above him, and more than all robbed of his honour, for in Camilla's disappearance he saw his own ruin. After long reflection he resolved at last to go to his friend's village where he had been staying when he afforded opportunities for the contrivance of this complication of misfortune he had locked the doors of his house mounted his horse and with a broken spirit sent out on his journey but he had hardly gone half way when harassed by his reflections he had to dismount and tie his horse to a tree and at the foot of which he threw himself giving vent to piteous heart-rending sighs and there he remained till nearly nightfall when he observed a man approaching on horseback from the city of whom after saluting him, he asked what was the news in Florence. The citizen replied, The strangest that had been heard for many a day, for it is reported abroad that Lothario, a great friend of the wealthy Anselmo, who lived at San Giovanni, carried off last night Camilla, the wife of Anselmo, who also has disappeared. All this has been told by a maid servant of Camilla's, whom the governor found last night, lowering herself by a sheet from the windows of Anselmo's house. I know not indeed precisely how the affair came to pass. All I know is that the whole city is wondering at the occurrence, for no one could have expected a thing of the kind, seeing the great and intimate friendship that existed between them, so great, they say, that they were called the two friends. Is it known at all, said Anselmo, what road Lothario and Camilla took? Not in the least, said the citizen, though the governor has been very active in searching for them. God speed you, senor, said Anselmo. God be with you, said the citizen, and went on his way. This disastrous intelligence almost robbed Anselmo not only of his senses, but of his life. He got up as well as he was able, and reached the house of his friend, who as yet knew nothing of his misfortune, but seeing him come pale, worn, and haggard, perceived that he was suffering some heavy affliction. Anselmo at once begged to be allowed to retire to rest, and to be given writing materials. His wish was complied with, and he was left lying down and alone, for he desired this, and even that the door should be locked. Finding himself alone, so he took to heart the thought of his misfortune, that by the signs of death he felt within him, he knew well his life was drawing to a close, and therefore he resolved to leave behind him a declaration of the cause of his strange end. He began to write, but there, before he had put down all he meant to say, his breath failed him, and he yielded up his life, a victim to the suffering which his ill-advised curiosity had entailed upon him. The master of the house, observing that it was now late, and that Anselmo did not call, determined to go in and ascertain if his dis in disposition was increasing, and found him lying on his face, his body partly in bed, partly on the writing-table, on which he lay with the written paper open and the pen still in his hand. Having first called him without receiving any answer, his host approached him, and, taking him by the hand, found that it was cold, and saw that he was dead. Greatly surprised and distressed, he summoned the household to witness the sad fate which had befallen Anselmo, and then he read the paper, the handwriting of which he recognized as his, and which contained these words, A fool and ill-advised desire has robbed me of life. If the news of my death should reach there's a Camilla, let her know that I forgive her, for she was not bound to perform miracles, nor ought I to have required her to perform them, and since I have been the author of my own dishonor, there is no reason why— so far Anselmo had written, and thus it was plain that at this point, before he could finish what he had to say, his life came to an end. The next day his friend sent intelligence of his death to his relatives, who had already ascertained his misfortune, as well as the convent where Camilla lay almost on the point of accompanying her husband to that inevitable journey, not on account of the tidings of his death, but because of those she received of her lover's departure, although she saw herself 
A widow, it is said, she refused either to quit the convent or to take the veil, until not long afterwards intelligence reached her that Lothario had been killed in a battle in which Monsieur de Lautrec had been recently engaged with the great Captain Gonzalo Fernandez de Cordova in the kingdom of Naples, whither her too late repentant lover had repaired. On learning this, Camilla took the veil, and shortly afterwards died, worn out by grief and melancholy. This was the end of all three, an end that came of a thoughtless beginning. "'I like this novel,' said the curate, "'but I cannot persuade myself of its truth, and it has been invented. The author's invention is faulty, for it is impossible to imagine any husband so foolish as to try such a costly experiment as Anselmo's. If it had been represented as occurring between a gallant and his mistress, it might pass, but between husband and wife there is something of an impossibility about it as to the way in which the story is told however i find i have no fault to find end of chapter thirty five end of chapter thirty four through thirty five This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kelly Bashar of Mattapoisett, Massachusetts. Don Quixote, Volume 1, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Translated by John Ormsby. Chapters 36 through 38. Chapter 36 Which treats of more curious incidents that occurred at the inn. Just at that instant the landlord, who was standing at the gate of the inn, exclaimed, Here comes a fine troop of guests. If they stop here we may say, Go diamus. What are they? said Cardinio. Four men, said the landlord, riding a legionetta, with lances and bucklers and all with black veils, and with them there is a woman in white on a side-saddle, whose face is also veiled, and two attendants on foot. "'Are they very near?' said the curate. "'So near,' answered the lord, "'that here they come.' Hearing this, Dorothea covered her face, and Cardinia retreated into Don Quixote's room, and they hardly had time to do so before the whole party had the host had described entered the inn, and the four that were on horseback, who were of high-bred appearance and bearing, dismounted and came forward to take down the woman who rode on the side-saddle, and one of them— taking her in his arms, placed her in a chair that stood at the entrance of the room where Cardinio had hidden himself. All this time she nor they had removed their veils or spoken a word. Only on sitting down on the chair the woman gave a deep sigh and let her arms fell like one that was ill and weak. The attendants on foot then led the horses away to the stable. Observing this, the curate, curious to know who these people in such a dress and preserving silence were, went to where the servants were standing and put the question to one of them, and who answered him. "'Faith, sir, I cannot tell you who they are. "'I only know they seem to be people of distinction, "'particularly he who advanced to take the lady you saw on his arms. "'And I say so because all the rest show him respect, "'and nothing is done except what he directs and orders.' "'And the lady, who is she?' asked the curate. "'That I cannot tell you either,' said the servant, "'for I have neither seen her face all the way. "'I have indeed heard her sigh many times, "'and utter such groans as she seems to be giving up the ghosts every time, "'but it is no wonder if we do not know more than we have told you, "'as my comrade and I have only been in their company two days. "'For having met us on the road, they begged and persuaded us to accompany them to Andalusia, "'promising to pay us well. And "'Have you heard any of them called by his name?' asked the curate. "'No, indeed,' replied the servant. "'They all preserve a marvellous silence on the road, "'for not a sound is to be heard among them except the poor lady's sighs and sobs which make us pity her.' and we feel sure that wherever it is she is going, it is against her will, and as far as one can judge from her dress, she is a nun, or what is more likely, about to become one, and perhaps it is because taking the vows is not of her own free will that she is so unhappy as she seems to be. That uh, may well be, said the curate, and leaving them, he returned to where Dorothea was, who, hearing the veiled lady sigh, moved by natural compassion, drew near to her, and said, "'What are you suffering from, Signor? "'If it be anything that women are accustomed "'and know how to relieve, "'I offer you my services with all my heart.' "'To this the unhappy lady made no reply, "'and Dorothea repeated her offers more earnestly, "'and still she kept silence, "'until the gentleman with the veil, "'who the servant said was obeyed by the rest, "'approached and said to Dorothea, "'Do not give yourself the trouble, Signor, "'of making any offers to that woman, "'for it is her way to give no thanks "'for anything that is done for her.' And do not try to make her answer unless you want to hear some lie from her lips. 
I have never told a lie, was the re immediate reply of her who had been silent until now. On the contrary, it is because I am so truthful and so ignorant of lying devices that I am now in this miserable condition, and this I call you yourself to witness, for it is my unstained truth that has made you false and a liar. Cardenio heard these words clearly and distinctly, being close to the speaker, for there was only the door of the Don Quixote's room between them, and the instant he did so, uttering a loud exclamation, he cried, "'Good God, what is this I hear? What voice is this that has reached my ears?' Startled at the voice, the lady turned her head, and not seeing the speaker, she stood up and attempted to enter the room, observing which the gentleman held her back, preventing her from moving a step. In her agitated and sudden movement, the silk with which she had covered her face fell off and disclosed a countenance of incomparable and marvellous beauty, but pale and terrified, for she kept turning her eyes, and everywhere she could direct her gaze with an eagerness that made her look as if she had lost her senses, and so marked that it excited the pity of Dorothea, and all beheld her, though they knew not what caused it. The gentleman grasped her firmly by the shoulders, and being so fully occupied with holding her back, he was unable to put a hand to his veil, which was falling off, as it did at length entirely, and Dorothea, who was holding the lady in her arms, raised her eyes, and saw that he who likewise held her was her husband, Don Fernando. The instant she recognized him, with a prolonged, plaintive cry drew from the depths of her heart, she fell backwards fainting, and but for the barber being close by to catch her in his arms, she would have fallen completely to the ground. The curate at once hastened to uncover her face and throw water on it. As he did so, Don Fernando, for he it was who held the other in his arms, recognized her and stood as if death-stricken by the sight. Not, however, relaxing his grip of Lucianda, for it was she that was struggling to release himself from his hold, having recognized Cardenio by his voice as he had recognized her. Cardenio also heard Dorothea's cry as she fell fainting, and imagining that it came from his Lucinda burst forth in terror from the room, and the first thing he saw was Don Fernando with Lucinda in his arms. Don Fernando, too, knew Cardenio at once, and all three, Lucinda, Cardenio, and Dorothea, stood in silent amazement, scarcely knowing what had happened to them. They gazed at one another without speaking, Dorothea at Don Fernando, Don Fernando at Cardenio, Cardenio at Lucinda, and Lucinda at Cardenio. The first to break the silence was Lucinda, who thus addressed Don Fernando. "'Leave me, Señor Don Fernando, for the sake of what you owe to yourself. If no other reason will induce you, leave me to cling to the wall,' of which I am the ivy, to the support from which neither your importunities, nor your threats, nor your promises, nor your gifts have been able to detach me. See how heaven, by ways strange and hidden from our sight, has brought me face to face with my true husband, and well you know by dear-bought experience that death alone will be able to efface him from my memory. May this plain declaration then lead you, as you can do nothing else, to turn your love into rage, your affection into resentment, and so to take my life, for if I yield it up in the presence of my beloved husband, I count it well bestowed. It may be, by my death, you will be convinced that I kept faith to him to the last moments of life. Meanwhile, Dorothea had come to herself, and had heard Lucinda's words, by means of which she divined who she was, but seeing that Don Fernando did not yet release or reply to her, Summoning up her resolution as well as she could, she rose and knelt at his feet, and with a flood of bright and touching tears addressed him thus. "'If, my lord, the beams of that sun that thou holdest eclipsed in thine arms did not dazzle and rob thine eyes of sight, thou wouldst have seen by this time that she who kneels at thy feet is, so long as thou wilt have it, so the unhappy and unfortunate Dorothea, I am that lowly peasant girl whom in thy goodness or for thy pleasure wouldst raise high enough to call herself thine.' I am she who in the seclusion of innocence led a contented life until at the voice of thy importunity and thy true and tender passion, as it seemed, she opened the gates of her modesty and surrendered to thee the keys of her liberty, a gift received by thee but thanklessly, as it is shown by my forced retreat to the place where thou dost find me, and by thy appearance under the circumstance in which I see thee. Nevertheless, I would not have thee suppose that I have come here driven by my shame, and it is only grief and sorrow at seeing myself forgotten by thee that have led me. It was thy will to make me thine, and thou didst so follow thy will, and that now, even thou though repentest, thou canst not help being mine. Bethink thee, my lord, the insurpassable affection I bear thee may compensate for the beauty and noble birth for which thou wouldst desert me. Thou canst not be the fair Lucinda's, because thou art mine, nor can she be thine, because she is Cardenio's, and it will be easier, remember, to bend thy will to love one who adores thee, than to lead one to love thee who abhors thee now. Thou didst address thyself to my simplicity, thou didst lay siege to my virtue, thou wert not ignorant of my station. Well, dost thou know how I yielded wholly to thy will? There is no ground or reason for thee to plead deception. And if it be so, as it is, and if thou art a Christian, as thou art a gentleman, why dost thou, by such subterfuges, put off making me at, as happy at last as thou didst at first? 
and if thou wilt not have me for what I am, thy true and lawful wife, at least take and accept me as thy slave, for so long as I am thine I will count myself happy and fortunate. Do not by deserting me let my shame become the talk of the gossips in the street. Make not the old age of my parents miserable, for the loyal services they as faithful vassals have ever rendered thine are not deserving of such a return, and if thou thinkest it will debase thy blood to mingle with mine, reflect that there is little or no nobility in the world that has not travelled in the same road, and that in illustrious lineages it is not the woman's blood that is of count, and moreover that true nobility consists in virtue, and if thou art wanting in that, refusing me what injustice thou owest me, then even I have higher claims to nobility than thine. To make an end, senor, these are my last words to thee, whether thou wilt or wilt not. I am thy wife. Witness thy words, which must not and ought not to be false. If thou dost pride thyself on what, for want of which thou scornest me, witness the pledge which thou didst give me, and witness heaven, which thou thyself didst call to witness the promise thou hadst made me. And if all this fail, my own conscience will not fail to lift up its silent voice in the midst of all thy gaiety, and vindicate the truth of what I say, and mar thy highest pleasure and enjoyment." All this and more the injured Dorothea delivered with such earnest feeling and such tears that all present, even those who came with Don Fernando, were constrained to join her in them. Don Fernando listened to her without replying, until, ceasing to speak, she gave way to such sobs and sighs that it must have been a heart of brass that was not softened by the sight of so great sorrow. Lucinda stood regarding her with no less compassion for her sufferings than admiration for intelligence and beauty, and would have gone to her to say some words of comfort to her, but was prevented by Don Fernando's grasp, which held her fast. He, overwhelmed with confusion and astonishment, after regarding Dorothea for some moments with a fixed gaze, opened his arms, and releasing Lucinda, exclaimed, "'Thou hast conquered, fair Dorothea, thou hast conquered, for it is impossible to have the heart to deny the united force of so many truths.' Lucinda, in her feebleness, was on the point of falling to the ground when Don Fernando released her. But Cardenio, who stood near, having retreated behind Don Fernando to escape recognition, casting aside fear and regardless of what might happen, ran forward to support her, and said as he clasped her in his arms, If heaven in its compassion is willing to let thee rest at last, mistress of my heart, true, constant, and fair, nowhere canst thou rest more safely than in these arms that now receive thee, and received thee before when fortune permitted me to call thee mine. At these words Lucinda looked up at Cardenio, at first beginning to recognize him by his voice, and then satisfying herself by her eyes that it was he, and hardly knowing what she did, and heedless of all considerations of decorum, she flung her arms around his neck, and pressing her face close to his, said, "'Yes, my dear lord, you are the true master of this your slave, and even though adverse fate in interpose again, and fresh dangers threaten this life that hangs on yours.' A strange sight was this for Don Fernando, and those that stood around, filled with surprise at an incident so unlooked for. Dorothea fancied that Don Fernando changed color and looked as though he meant to take vengeance on Cardenio, for she observed him put his hand to his sword, and the instant the idea struck her, with wonderful quickness she clasped him round the knees, and kissing them and holding him so as to prevent his from moving, she said, while her tears continued to flow, "'What is it thou wouldst do, my only refuge, in this unforeseen event? Thou hast thy wife at thy feet, and she whom thou wouldst have for thy wife is in the arms of her husband.' Reflect whether it will be right for thee, whether it will be possible for thee to undo what heaven has done, or whether it will be becoming in thee to seek to raise her to be thy mate, who, in spite of every obstacle, and strong in her truth and constancy, is before thine eyes, bathing with the tears of love of the face and bosom of her lawful husband. For God's sake I entreat of thee, for thine own I implore thee, let not this open manifestation rouse thy anger, but rather so calm it as to allow these two lovers to live in peace and quiet without any interference from thee so long as heaven permits them, and in so doing thou wilt prove the generosity of thy lofty noble spirit, and the world shall see what the reason has more influence than passion. All the time Dorothea was speaking, Cardenio, though he held Lucinda in his arms, never took his eyes off Don Fernando, determined, if he saw him make any hostile movement, to try and defend himself, and resist as best he could all who might assail him though it should cost him his life. But now Don Fernando's friends, as well as the curate and the barber, who had been present all the while, not forgetting the worthy Sancho Panza, ran forward and gathered round Don Fernando, entreating him to have regard for the tears of Dorothea, and not suffer her reasonable hopes to be disappointed, since, as they firmly believed what she said was the truth, and bidding him observe that it was not, as it might seem by accident, but a special disposition of providence that they had all met in a place where no one could have expected a meeting, and the curate bade him remember that only death could part Lucinda from Cardenio, 
and even if some sword were to separate them, they would think their death most happy, and that in a case that admitted of no remedy his wisest course was, by conquering and putting a constraint upon himself, to show a generous mind, and of his own accord suffer these two to enjoy the happiness heaven had granted them. He bade him, too, turn his eyes upon the beauty of Dorothea, and he would see that few, if any, could equal much less excel her, while to that beauty should be added her modesty and the surpassing love she bore him. But besides all this, he reminded him that if he prided himself on being a gentleman and a Christian, he could not do otherwise than keep his plighted word, and that in doing so he would obey God and meet the approval of all sensible people who know and recognize it to be the privilege of beauty, even in one of humble birth, provided virtue accompany it, to be able to raise herself to the level of any rank, without any slur upon him who places it upon an equality with himself, and furthermore, that when the potent sway of passion asserts itself, so long as there be no mixture of sin in it, he is not to be blamed who gives way to it. To be brief, they added to these such other forcible arguments that Don Fernando's manly heart, being after all nourished by noble blood, was touched, and yielded to the truth which, even had he wished it, he could not gainsay. And he showed his submission and acceptance of the good advice that had been offered him, by stooping down and embracing Dorothea, saying to her, Rise, dear lady, it is not right that what I hold in my heart should be kneeling at my feet, and if until now I have shown no sign of what I own, it may have been by heaven's decree, in order that, seeing the constancy with which you love me, I may learn to value you as you deserve. What I entreat of you is that you reproach me not with my transgression and grievous wrongdoing, for the same cause and force that drove me to make you mine impelled me to struggle against being yours, and to prove this, turn and look at the eyes of the now happy Lucinda, and you will see in them an excuse for all my errors, and as she has found and gained the object of her desires, and I have found in you what satisfies all my wishes, may she live in peace and contentment and as many happy years with her Cardinio, as on my knees I pray heaven to allow me to live with my Dorothea. And with these words he once more embraced her and pressed his face to hers with so much tenderness that he had to take great heed to keep his tears from completing the proof of his love and repentance in the sight of all. Not so Lucinda and Cardinio, and almost all the others, for they shed so many tears, some in their own happiness, some at that of the others, that one would have supposed a heavy calamity had fallen upon them all. Even Sancho Panza was weeping, but afterwards he said he only wept because he saw that Dorothea was not as he fancied the queen might call me Kona, of whom he had expected such great favours. Their wonder, as well as their weeping, lasted some time, and then Cardinio and Lucinda went on and fell on their knees before Don Fernando, returning him thanks for the favour he had rendered them in language so grateful that he knew not how to answer them, and raising them up embraced them with every mark of affection and courtesy. He then asked Dorothea how she managed to reach a place so far removed from her own home, and she, in a few fitting words, told all that she had previously related to Cardinio, with which Don Fernando and his companions were so delighted that they wished the story had been longer, so charmingly did Dorothea describe her misadventures. When she had finished, Don Fernando recounted what had befallen him in the city after he had found Lucinda's bosom the paper in which she declared that she was Cardinio's wife and could never be his. He said he meant to kill her and would have done so had he not been prevented by her parents, and that he quitted the house full of rage and shame and resolved to avenge himself when a more convenient opportunity should offer. The next day he learned that Lucinda had disappeared from her father's house and that no one could tell whither she had gone. Finally, at the end of some months, he ascertained that she was in a convent and meant to remain there all the rest of her life if she were not to share it with Cardinio. And as soon as he had learned this, taking these three gentlemen as his companions, he arrived at the place where she was, but avoided speaking to her, fearing that if it were known he was there, stricter precautions would be taken in the convent, and wa watching a time when the porter's lodge was open, he left two to guard the gate, and he and the other entered the convent in quest of Lucinda, whom they found in the cloisters in conversation with one of the nuns, and carrying her off without giving her time to resist, they reached a place with her where they provided themselves with what they required for taking her away, all which they were able to do in complete safety, as the convent was in the country at a considerable distance from the city. He added that when Lucinda found herself in his power she lost all consciousness, and after returning to herself did nothing but weep and sigh without speaking a word, and thus in silence and tears they had reached that inn, which for him was reaching heaven, where all the mischances of earth are over and at an end. End of chapter 36 Chapter 37 In which is continued the story of the famous princess Mikomikona with other droll adventures.
To all this Sancho listened with no little sorrow at heart to see how his hopes of dignity were fading away and vanishing in smoke, and how the fair Princess Micomicona had turned into Dorothea, and the giant into Don Fernando, while his master was sleeping tranquilly, totally unconscious of all that had come to pass. Dorothea was unable to persuade herself that her present happiness was not all a dream. Cardenio was in a similar state of mind, and Lucinda's thoughts ran in the same direction. Don Fernando gave thanks to heaven for the favor shown him, and for having been rescued from the intricate labyrinth in which he had been brought so near to the destruction of his good name and of his soul. And in short, everybody at the end was full of contentment and satisfaction at the happy issue of such a complicated and hopeless business. The curate, as a sensible man, made sound reflections upon the whole affair, and congratulated each upon his good fortune. But the one that was in the highest spirits and good humor was the landlady, because of the promise Cardinio and the curate had given her, to pay for all the losses and damage she had sustained through Don Quixote's means. Sancho, as has already been said, was the only one who was distressed, unhappy, and dejected. And so with a long face he went in to his master, who had just awoke, and said to him, "'Sir Rueful Countenance, your worship may as well sleep on as much as you like without troubling yourself about killing any giant or restoring her kingdom to the princess, for that is all over in cells now.' "'I should think it was,' replied Don Quixote, "'for I have had the most prodigious and stupendous battle with the giant that I ever remember having at, at all the days of my life, and with one back stroke, swish!' I brought his head tumbling to the ground, and so much blood gushed forth from him that it ran in rivulets over the earth like water. Like red wine, your worship had better say, replied Sancho, for I would have you know, if you don't know it, that the dead giant is a hacked wineskin, and the blood four and twenty gallons of red wine that it had in its belly, and the cut-off head is the bitch that bore me, and the devil take it all. "'What art thou talking about, fool?' said Don Quixote. "'Art thou in thy senses?' "'Let your worship get up,' said Sancho, "'and you will see the nice business you have made of it, "'and what we have to pay, "'and you will see the queen turn into the private lady called Dorothea, "'and other things that will astonish you if you understand them.' "'I shall not be surprised at anything of the kind,' returned Don Quixote, "'for if thou dost remember the last time we were here, "'I told thee that everything that happened here was a matter of enchantment, and it would be no wonder if it were the same now. I could believe all that, replied Sancho, if my blanketing was the same sort of thing also. Only it wasn't, but real and genuine, for I saw the landlord, who is here today, holding one end of the blanket and jerking me up to the skies very neatly and smartly, and with as much laughter and its strength, and when it comes to be a cause of knowing people, I hold for my part, simple and sinner as I am, there is no enchantment about it at all, but a great deal of bruising and bad luck. "'Well, well, God will give a remedy,' said Don Quixote. "'Hand me my clothes and let me go out, for I want to see these transformations and things thou speakest of.' Sancho fetched him his clothes, and while he was dressing, the curate gave Don Fernando and the others present an account of Don Quixote's madness and of the stratagem they had made use of to withdraw him from that pinapobre where he fancied himself stationed because of his lady's scorn. He described to them also— nearly all the adventures that Sancho had mentioned, at which they marvelled and laughed not a little, thinking it, as all did, the strangest form of madness that crazy in intellect could be capable of. But now the curate said that the lady Dorothea's good fortune prevented her from proceeding with their purpose. It would be necessary to devise or discover some other way of getting him home. Cardinio proposed to carry out the scheme they had begun, and suggested that Lucinda would act and support Dorothea's part sufficiently well. No, said Don Fernando, that must not be, for I want Dorothea to follow out this idea of hers, and if the worthy gentleman's village is not very far off, I shall be happy if I can do anything for his relief. It is not more than two days' journey from this, said the curate. Even if it were more, said Don Fernando, I would gladly travel so far for the sake of doing so good a work. At this moment Don Quixote came out in full panoply, with Mambrino's helmet, all dinted as it was, on his head, his buckler on his arm and leading on his staff or pike. The strange figure he presented filled Don Fernando and the rest with amazement as they contemplated his lean yellow face, half a league long, his armor of all sorts, and the solemnity of his deportment. They stood silent, waiting to see what he would say, and he, fixing his eyes on the fair Dorothea, addressed her with great gravity and composure. "'I am informed, fair lady, by my squire here, that your greatness 
has been annihilated, and your being a bullish since from a queen and lady of high degree as you used to be, you have been turned into a private maiden. If this has been done by the command of the magician king your father, the fear that I should not afford you the aid you need and are entitled to, I may tell you he did not know, and does not know, half the mass, and was little versed in the annals of chivalry, for if he had read and gone through them as intensively and deliberately as I have, he would have found at every turn that knights of less renown than mine have accomplished things more difficult. It is no great matter to kill a whelp of a giant, however arrogant he may be, for it is not many hours since I myself was engaged with one, and I will not speak of it, that they may not say I am lying. Time, however, that reveals all, will tell the tale when we least expect it. You were engaged with a couple of wineskins, and not a giant, said the landlord at this. But Don Fernando told him to hold his tongue, and on no account interrupt Don Quixote, who continued, I say in conclusion, I and this inherited lady, that if your father had brought about this metamorphosis in your person for the reason I have mentioned, you ought not attach any importance to it, for there is no peril on earth through which my sword will not force away, and with it, before many days are over, I will bring your enemy's head to the ground and place on yours the crown of your kingdom. Don Quixote said no more and waited for the reply of the princess, who, aware of Don Fernando's determination to carry on the deception until Don Quixote had been conveyed to his home, with the great ease of manner and gravity, made answer, "'Whoever told you, valiant knight of the rueful countenance, that I, under, uh, that I had undergone any change of transformation, did not tell you the truth, for I am the same as I was yesterday. It is true that certain strokes of good fortune that have given me more than I could have hoped for have made some alteration in me, but I have not therefore ceased to be what I was before, or to entertain the same desire I have had all through of availing myself of the might of your valiant and invincible arm. And so, Signor, let your goodness reinstate the father that begot me in your good opinion, and me assure that he was a wise and prudent man, since by his craft he found out such a sure and easy way of remedying my misfortune, for I believe, Signor, that had it not been for you I should never have lit upon the good fortune I now possess. And in this I am saying what is perfectly true, as most of these gentlemen who are present can fully testify, all that remains is to set out on our journey to-morrow, for to-day we could not make much way, and for the rest of the happy result I am looking forward to, I trust to God and the valour of your heart. So said the sprightly Dorothea, and on hearing her, Don Quixote returned to Sancho, and said to him with an angry air, I declare now, little Sancho, thou art the greatest little villain in Spain. Say, thief and vagabond, hast thou not just told me that this princess had been turned into a maiden called Dorothea, and that the head which I am persuaded I cut off from a giant was the bitch that bore thee, and other nonsense that put me in, in the greatest perplexity I have ever been in all my life? I vow, and here he looked to heaven and ground his teeth, I have a mind to play the mischief with thee in a way that will teach sense for the future to all lying squires of knight errands in the world. Let your worship be calm, Senor, returned Sancho, for it may well be that I have been mistaken as to the char change of the lady princess my common cona, but as to the giant's head, or at least to the piercing of the wineskins and the blood being red wine, I make no mistake, as sure as there is a god, because the wounded skins are there at the head of your worship's bed, and the wine has made a lake of the room, if not... You will see when the eggs come to be fried. I mean when his worship, the landlord, calls for all the damages. For the rest, I am heartily glad that her ladyship is the queen as she was, for it concerns me as much as any one. I tell thee again, Sancho, thou art a fool, said Don Quixote. Forgive me, and that will do. That will do, said Don Fernando. Let us say no more about it, and as her ladyship the princess proposes to set out to-morrow because it is too late to-day, so be it, and we will pass the night in a pleasant conversation, and to-morrow we will all accompany Senor Don Quixote, for we wish to witness the valiant and unparalleled achievements he is about to perform in the course of his mighty enterprise which he has undertaken. It is I who shall wait upon and accompany you, said Don Quixote and I am much gratified with the favour that is bestowed upon me and the good opinion entertained of me, which I shall strive to justify, or it shall cost me my life, or even more, if it can possibly cost me more. Many were the compliments and expressions of politeness that passed between Don Quixote and Don Fernando, 
but they were brought to an end by a traveller who at this moment entered the inn, and who seemed from his attire to be a Christian lately come from the country of the Moors, for he was dressed in a short-skirted coat of blue cloth with half-sleeves and without a collar. His breeches were also of blue cloth, and his hat of the same colour, and he wore yellow buckskins and had a Moorish cutlass slung from a baldric across his breast. Behind him, mounted upon an ass, there came a woman dressed in Moorish fashion, with her face veiled and a scarf on her head, and wearing a little brocaded cap and a mantle that covered her from her shoulders to feet. The man was of a robust and well-proportioned frame, an age a little over forty, rather swarthy in complexion, with long moustache and a full beard, and, in short, his appearance was such that if he had been well-dressed he would have been taken for a person of quality and good birth. On entering he asked for a room, and when they told him there was none in the inn he seemed distressed, and approaching her by her dress seemed to be more, he, he took her down from the saddle in his arms. Lucinda Dorothea, the landlady, her daughter and Maritornes, attracted by the strange and to them entirely new costume, gathered round her, and Dorothea, who was always kindly, courteous, and quick-witted, perceiving that both she and the man who had brought her were annoyed at not finding a room, said to her, "'Do not be put out, Signor, by the discomfort and want of luxuries here, for it is the way of roadside inns to be without them. Still, if you will be pleased to share our lodging with us,' pointing to Lucinda, "'perhaps you will have found worse accommodation in the course of your journey.' To this the veiled lady made no reply. All she did was to rise from her seat, crossing her hands upon her bosom, bowing her head and bending her body as a sign that she returned thanks. From her silence she concluded that she must be a moor and unable to speak a Christian tongue. At this moment the captive came up, having been until now otherwise engaged, and seeing that they all stood around his companion, that she made no reply to what they addressed to her, he said, Ladies, this damsel hardly understands my language, and can speak none but that of her own country, for which reason she does not and cannot answer what has been asked of her. Nothing has been asked of her, returned Lucinda. She has only been offered our company for this evening, and a share of the quarters we occupy, where she shall be made as comfortable as the circumstances allow. With the good will we are bound to show all strangers that stand in need of it, especially if it be a woman to whom the service is rendered. On her part and my own, Signora, replied the captive, I kiss your hands, and I esteem highly, as I ought, the favour you have offered, which on such an occasion, and coming from persons of your appearance, is plain to see, is a very great one. Tell me, Signora, said Dorothea, is this lady a Christian or a Moor? For her dress and her silence leads us to imagine that she is what we could wish she was not. In dress, and outwardly, said he, she is a Moor. But at heart she is thoroughly good Christian, for she has the greatest desire to become one. Then she has not been baptized, returned Lucinda. There has been no opportunity for that, replied the captive. Since she left Algiers, her native country and home, and up to the present she has not found herself in any such imminent danger of death as to make it necessary to baptize her before she has been instructed in all the ceremonies our Holy Mother Church ordains. But, please God, ere long she shall be baptized with the solemnity befitting her which is higher than her dress or mind indicates. By these words he excited desire in all who heard him to know who the Moorish lady and the captive were, but no one liked to ask just then, seeing that it was a fitter moment for helping them to rest themselves than for questioning them about their lives. Dorothy took the Moorish lady by the hand, and leading her to a seat beside herself, requested her to remove her veil. She looked at the captive as if to ask him what they meant and what she was to do. He said to her in Arabic that, they asked her to take off her veil, and thereupon she removed it, and disclosed a countenance so lovely that to Dorothea she seemed more beautiful than Lucinda, and to Lucinda more beautiful than Dorothea, and all the bystanders felt that if any beauty could compare with theirs it was the Moorish ladies, and there were even those who were inclined to give it somewhat the preference, and as it is the privilege and charm of beauty to win the heart and secure good will, all forthwith became eager to show kindness and attention to the lovely Moor. Don Fernando asked the captive what her name was, and he replied that it was Leila Zoraida, but the instant she heard him, she guessed what the Christian had asked, and said hastily, with some displeasure and energy, No, not Zoraida, Maria, Maria, giving them to understand that she was called Maria, and not Zoraida. These words, touching earnestness with which she uttered them, drew more than one tear from some of the listeners, particularly the women who are by nature tender-hearted and compassionate. Lucinda embraced her affectionately, saying, "'Yes, yes, Maria, Maria,' to which the Moor replied, "'Yes, yes, Maria, Zoraida Mancange, which means not Zoraida.' Night was now approaching, and by 
the orders of those who accompanied Don Fernando, the landlord had taken care and pains to prepare for them the best supper that was in his power. The hour, therefore, having arrived, they all took their seats at a long table like a refectory one, for round or square table there was none in the inn, and the seat of honour at the head of it, though he was refusing it, they assigned to Don Quixote, who desired the lady Micomicona to place herself by his side, as he was her protector. Lucinda and Zoraida took their places next to her. Opposite them were Don Fernando and Cardinio, next the captive and the other gentlemen, and by the side of the ladies the curate and the barber. And so they supped in high enjoyment, which was increased when they observed Don Quixote leaving off eating, and moved by an impulse like that which made him deliver himself at such lengths when he supposed with the goatherds began to address them. Verily, gentlemen, if we reflect upon it, great and marvellous are the things they see, who make profession of the order of knight errantry. Say, what being is there in this world, who entering the gate of this castle at this moment, and seeing us as we are here, would suppose or imagine us to be what we are? Who would say that this lady who is beside me was a great queen that we all know her to be, or that I am the knight of the rueful countenance, trumpeted far and wide by the mouth of fame? Now, there can be no doubt that this art and calling surpasses all those that mankind has invented, and is the more deserving of being held in honour of proportion as it is the more exposed to peril. Away with those who assert that letters have the preeminence over arms. I will tell them, whosoever they may be, that they know not what they say, for the reason which such persons commonly assign, and upon which they chiefly rest, is that the labours of the mind are greater than those of the body, and that the arms give employment to the body alone, as if the calling were a porter's trade, for which nothing is more required than sturdy strength, or as if what we who profess to call them arms there were not included acts of vigour for the execution of which high intelligence is requisite, or as if it were the soul of the warrior, then he has an army or the defence of a city under his care, did not exert itself as much by mind as by body. Nay, see whether by bodily strength it be possible to learn or divine the intentions of the enemy, his plans, stratagems, or obstacles, or to ward off impending mischief. For all these are the work of the mind, and in them the body, has no share whatsoever. Since, therefore, arms have need of the mind, as much as letters, let us see now which of the two minds, that of the man of letters, or that of the warrior, has most to do. And this will be seen by the end and goal that each seeks to attain, for that purpose is the more estimable, which has for its aim the nobler object. The end and goal of letters, I am not speaking now of divine letters, the aim of which is to raise and direct the soul to heaven, and for which an end so infinite no other can be compared, I speak of human letters, the end of which is to establish distributive justice, to give every man that which is his, and to see and take care that good laws are observed, and, and undoubtedly noble, lofty, and deserving of high praise, but not such as should be given to that sought by arms, which have for their end and object peace, the greatest boon that men can desire in this life. The first news the world and mankind received was that which the angels announced on the night that was our day, and they sang in the air, Glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth to men of good will. And the salutation which the great master of heaven and earth taught his disciples and chosen followers when they entered any house was to say, Peace be on this house. And many other times he said to them, My peace I give unto you, my peace I leave you, peace be with you, a jewel and precious gift given and left by such a hand, a jewel without which there can be no happiness either on heaven or on earth. This peace is the true end of war, and war is only another name for arms. This, then, being admitted that the end of war is peace, and that so far it has the advantages of the end of letters, let us turn to the bodily labours of the man of letters, and those of him who follows the profession of arms, and see which are the greater. Don Quixote delivered his discourse in such a manner, and in such correct language, that, for the time being, he made it impossible for any of his hearers to consider him a madman. On the contrary, as they were mostly gentlemen, to whom arms are an appurtenance by birth, they listened to him with greatest pleasure as he continued. Here, then, I say, is what the student has to undergo. First of all, poverty. Not that all are poor, but to put the case as strongly as possible. And when I have said that he endures poverty, I think nothing more need to be said about his hard fortune. For he who is poor has no share of the good things of life. This poverty he suffers from in various ways, hunger or cold or nakedness or altogether, 
but for all that it's not so extreme but that he gets something to eat, though it may be at somewhat unseasonable hours and from the leavings of the rich. For the greatest misery of the student is that which they themselves call going out for soup, and there is always some neighbor's brazier or hearth for them, which if it does not warm, at least tempers the cold to them. And lastly, they sleep comfortably at night under a roof. I will not go into other particulars, as for example want of shirts, and no superabundance of shoes, thin and threadbare garments, and gorging themselves to surfeit of veracity when good luck has treated them to a banquet of some sort. By this road that I have described, rough and hard, stumbling here, falling there, getting up again to fall again, they reach the rank they desire, and that once attained, we have seen many who pass these Surtees and Stillas and Charbidiuses, as if born flying on the wings of favouring fortune. We have seen them, I say, ruling and governing the world from a chair, their hunger turned into satiety, their cold into comfort, their nakedness into fine raiment, their sleep on a mat into repose and holland into mask, the justly earned reward of their virtue. But, contrasted and compared with that which the warrior undergoes, all they have undergone falls far short of it, as I am now about to show. End of chapter 37 Chapter 38 Which treats of the curious discourse Don Quixote delivered on arms and letters. Continuing his discourse, Don Quixote said, As we began in the student's case with poverty and its accompaniments, let us see now if the soldier is richer, and we shall find that in poverty there is no one poorer, for he is dependent on his miserable pay, which comes late or never, or else on what he can plunder, seriously imperiling his life and conscience. And sometimes his nakedness will be so great that a slashed doublet serves him for uniform and shirt, and in the depth of winter he has to defend himself against the inclemency of the weather in the open field, with nothing better than the breath of his mouth, which I need not say, coming from an empty place, much come out cold, contrary to the laws of nature. Be sure he looks forward to the approach of night to make up for all of these discomforts on the bed that awaits him, which, unless by some fault of his, never sins by being over-narrow, for he can easily measure out on the ground as he likes, and rolling himself about on it to his heart's content without any fear of the sheet slipping away from him. Then, after all this, suppose the day and hour for taking his degree and his calling to have come. Suppose the day of battle to have arrived. When they invest him with a doctor's cap made of lint to mend some bullet hole, perhaps, that has gone through his temples or left him with a crippled leg or arm. Or if this does not happen, and merciful heaven watches over him, and keeps him safe and sound, it may be he will be in the same poverty he was in before, and he must go through more engagements and more battles, and come victorious out of all before he betters himself. But miracles of that sort are seldom seen. For tell me, sirs, if you have ever reflected upon it, by how much do those who have gained by war fall short of the number of those who have perished in it, no doubt you will reply that there can be no comparison, that the dead cannot be numbered, while the living who have been rewarded may be summed up with three figures, all which is the reverse in the case of men of letters. For my skirts say nothing of sleeves, they all find means of support, so that though the soldier has more to endure, his reward is less. But against all this it may be urged that it is easier to reward two thousand soldiers for the former may be remunerated by giving them places, which must perforce be conferred upon men of their calling, while the latter can only be compensated out of the way of the very property of the master they serve. But this impossibility only strengthens my argument. Putting this, however, aside, for it is a puzzling question for which it is difficult to find a solution, let us return to the superiority of arms over letters, a matter still undecided, so many are the arguments put forward on each side, for the, besides those I have mentioned, let us say that without them arms cannot maintain themselves. For war, too, has its laws and is governed by them, and laws belong to the domain of letters and men of letters. To this arms make answer that without them laws cannot be maintained. For by arms states are defended, kingdoms preserved, cities protected, roads made safe, seas cleared of pirates, and in short, if it were not for them, States, kingdoms, monarchies, cities, ways by sea and land would be exposed to the violence and confusion which war brings it, so long as it lasts and is free to make use of its privileges and powers. And then it is plain that whatever costs most is valued and deserves to be valued most. To attain to eminence in letters costs a man time 
watching hunger, nakedness, headaches, indigestions, and other things of the sorts, some of which I have already referred to. But for a man to come in the ordinary course of things, to be a good soldier, it costs him all the student suffers, and in an incomparably higher degree. For at each step he runs the risk of losing his life. For what dread of want or poverty that can reach or harass the student can compare with what the soldier feels, who finds himself beleaguered in some stronghold mounting guard in some ravelin or cavalier, knows that the enemy is pushing a mine towards the post where he is stationed, and cannot under any circumstances retire or fly from the imminent danger that threatens him. All he can do is inform his captain of what is going on so that he may try to remedy it by a countermine, and then stand his ground in fear and expectation of the moment when he will fly up to the clouds without wings and descend into the deep against his will. And if this seems a trifling task, let us see whether it is equaled or surpassed by the encounter of two galleys stem to stem in the midst of the open sea, locked and entangled one with the other, when the soldier has no more standing room than the two feet of plank in the spur, and yet, though he sees before him threatening as many ministers of death as there are cannon of the foe pointed at him, not a land's length from his body, and sees that with the first heedless step he will go down to visit the profundities of Neptune's bosom, with dauntless heart, urged on by honour that nerves him, he makes himself a target for all that musketry, and struggles to cross that narrow path to the enemy's ship. And what is still more marvellous, no sooner has one gone down into the depths he will never rise from till the end of the world, than another takes his place, and if he too falls into the sea that waits for him like an enemy, another and another will succeed him, without a moment's pause between their deaths, carved and daring the greatest that all the chances of war can show. Happy the blessed ages that knew not the dread fury of these devilish engines of artillery whose inventor, I am persuaded, is in hell, receiving the reward of his diabolical invention, by which he made it easy for a base and cowardly arm to take the life of a gallant gentleman, and that, when he knows not how or whence, in the height of the ardour and enthusiasm that fire and animate brave hearts, there should come some random bullet discharged, perhaps, by one who fled in terror, at the flash when he fired off his accursed machine, when in an instant puts an end to the projects and cuts off the life of one who deserved to live for ages to come. And thus, when I reflect on this, I am almost tempted to say that in my heart I repent of having adopted this profession of knight-errant in so detestable an age as we live in now, for though no peril can make me fear, still it gives me some uneasiness to think that powder and lead may rob me of the opportunity of making myself famous and renowned throughout the known earth by the might of my arm and the edge of my sword. But heaven's will be done. If I succeed in my attempt, I shall be all the more honoured, as I have faced greater dangers than the knight-errants of yore expose themselves to. All this lengthy discourse Don Quixote delivered while the others supped, forgetting to raise a morsel to his lips, though Sancho more than once told him to eat his supper, as he would have time enough afterwards to say all he wanted. It excited fresh pity in those who had heard him to see a man of apparently sound sense, and with rational views on every subject he discussed, so hopelessly wanting in all when his wretched, unlucky chivalry was in question. The curate told him he was quite right in all he had said in favour of arms, and that he himself, though a man of letters and a graduate, was of the same opinion. They finished their supper, the cloth was removed, and while the hostess, her daughter, and Meritorns were getting Don Quixote of La Mancha's garret ready, in which it was arranged that the women were to be quartered by themselves for the night. Don Fernando begged the captain to tell them the story of his life, for it could not fail to be strange and interesting, to judge by the hints he had let fall on his arrival in company with Zoraida. To this the captain replied that he would very willingly yield to his request, only he feared his tale would not give them as much pleasure as he wished. Nevertheless, not to be wanting in compliance, he would tell it. The curate and the others thanked him, and added their entreaties, and he, finding himself so pressed, said there was no occasion to ask where a command at such weight, and added, If your worships will give your attention, you will hear a true story, which, perhaps, fictitious ones constructed with ingenious and studied art cannot come up to. These words made them settle themselves in their places, and preserve a deep silence, and he, seeing them waiting on his words, in mute expectation, began thus in a pleasant, quiet voice. End of chapter 38 End of of chapters 36 through 38. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kelly Bechere of Mattapoisett, Massachusetts. Don Quixote, Volume 1, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Translated by John Ormsby. Chapters 39 through 40. Chapter 39. Wherein the captive relates his life and adventures. My family had its origin in a village in the mountains of Lyon, and nature has been kinder and more generous to it than fortune. Though in the general poverty of those communities my father passed for being even a rich man, and he would have been so in reality had he been as clever in preserving his property as he was in spending it. This tendency of his to be liberal and profuse he had acquired from having been a soldier in his youth, for the soldier's life is a school in which the niggard becomes free-handed and the free-handed prodigal, and if any soldiers are to be found who are misers, they are monsters of rare occurrence. My father went beyond liberality and bordered on prodigality, and a disposition by no means advantageous to a married man who has children to, to succeed his name and position. My father had three, all sons, and all of sufficient age to make choice of a profession. Finding that, it, that he was unable to resist his propensity, he resolved to divest himself of the instrument and cause of his prodigality and lavishness, to divest himself of wealth, without which Alexander himself would have seemed parsimonious, and so calling us all three aside one day into a room, he addressed us in words somewhat to the following effect. My sons, to ensure you that I love you, no more need be known or said than that you are my sons, and to encourage a suspicion that I do not love you, no more is needed than the knowledge that I have no self-control as far as preservation of your patrimony is concerned. Therefore, that you may for the future feel sure that I love you like a father, and have no wish to ruin you like a stepfather, I propose to do with you what I have for some time back me meditated, and after mature deliberation decided upon. You are now of an age to choose your line of life, or at least make choice of a calling that will bring you honor and profit when you are older. And what I have resolved to do is divide my property into four parts. Three I will give to you, to each his portion without making any difference, and the other I will retain to live upon and support myself for whatever remainder of life heaven may be pleased to grant me. But I wish each of you on taking possession of the share that falls to him to follow one of the paths I shall indicate. In this Spain of ours there is a proverb, to my mind very true, as they all are, being short aphorisms drawn from long practical experience. The one I refer to says, the church, or the sea, or the king's house, as much as to say, in plainer language, whoever wants to flourish and become rich, let him follow the church, or go to sea, adopting commerce as his calling, or go into the king's service in his household, for they say, Better a king's crumb than a lord's favour. I say so, because it is my will and pleasure that one of you should follow letters, another trade, and the third serve the king in the wards, for it is a difficult matter to gain admission to his service and in his household, and if war does not bring much wealth, it confers great distinction and fame. Eight days hence I will give you your full shares in money, without defrauding you of a farthing, as you will see in the end. Now, tell me if you are willing to follow out my idea and advice as I have laid it before you. Having called upon me as the eldest to answer, I, after urging him not to strip himself of his property, but to spend it all as he pleased, we were young men able to gain our living, consented to comply with his wishes, and said that mine were to follow the profession of arms, and thereby serve God and my king. My second brother, having made the same proposal, decided upon going to the Indies, embarking the portion that fell to him in trade. The youngest, and in my opinion the wisest, said he would rather follow the church, or go to complete his studies at Salamanca. As soon as we had come to an understanding and made choice of our professions, my father embraced us all, and in the short time he mentioned, carried into effect all he had promised, and when he had given to each a share, which as well as I remember was three thousand ducks apiece in cash, for an uncle of ours bought the estate and paid for it down, not to let it go out of the family. We all three on the same day took leave of our good father, and at the same time, as it seemed to me inhuman to leave my father with such scanty means in his old age, I induced him to take two of my three thousand ducats, as the remainder would be enough to provide me with all a soldier needed. My two brothers, moved by my example, gave him each a thousand ducats, so that there was left for my father four thousand ducats of money, besides three thousand, the value of the portion that fell to him, which he preferred to retain in land instead of selling it. Finally, as I said, we took leave of him, and our uncle, whom I have mentioned, not without sorrow and tears on both sides, they charging us to let them know, whenever an opportunity offered, how we fared, whether well or ill, we promised to do so, and when 
He had embraced us and given us his blessing, one set out for Salamanca, the other for Seville, and I for Alicante, where I had heard there was a Gen Genoese vessel taking in a cargo of wood for Genoa. It is now some twenty-two years since I left my father's house, and all that time, though I have written several letters, I have had no news whatever of him or my brothers. My own adventures during that period I will now relate briefly. I embarked at Alicante, reached Genoa after a prosperous voyage, and proceeded thence to Milan, where I provided myself with arms and a few soldiers' accoutrements. Thence it was my intention to go and take service in Piedmont, but as I was already on the road to Alessandria de la Paglia, I learned that the Duke of Alba was on his way to Flanders. I changed my plans, joined him, served under him in the campaigns he made, was present at the deaths of the Counts Egmont and Horn, and was promoted to be ensign under a famous captain of Guadalajara, Diego de Urbina by name. Some time after my arrival in Flanders, news came of the League that his Holiness Pope Pius V of happy memory had made with Venice and Spain against the common enemy, the Turk, who had just then with his fleet taken the famous island of Cyprus, which belonged to the Venetians, a loss deplorable and disastrous. It was known as a fact that the most serene Don John of Austria, natural brother of our good king Don Philip, was coming as commander-in-chief of the Allied forces, and rumors were abroad of the vast warlike preparations which were being made. Oh, it stirred my heart and filled me with a longing to take part in the campaign which was expected, and though I had reason to believe in almost certain promises that on the first opportunity that presented itself I should be promoted to captain, I preferred to leave all and betake myself as I did to Italy, and it was my good fortune that Don John had arrived at Genoa and, I, and was going to Naples to join the Venetian fleet as he di afterwards did at Messina. I say, in short, that I took part in that glorious expedition, promoted by this time to be a captain of infantry, to which honourable charge my good luck rather than my merits raised me. And that day, so fortunate for Christendom, because then all the nations of the earth were disabused of the air which they lay in imagining the Turks to be invincible on sea on the da that day, I say, on which the ultimate pride and arrogance were broken, among all that were there made happy, for the Christians who died that day were happier than those who remained alive and victorious. I alone was miserable, for instead of the, for instead of some naval crown that I might have expected had it been in Roman times, or the night that followed that famous day, I found myself with fetters on my feet and manacles on my hands. It happened in this way. El Ucoli, the king of the Algiers, a daring and successful corsair, having attacked and taken the leading Maltese galley, only three knights being left alive in it, and they badly wounded. The chief galley of John Andrea, on board of which I and my company were placed, came to its relief, and doing as was bound to do in such a case, I leaped on board the enemy's galley, which, shearing off from that which had attacked it, prevented my men from following me, and so I found myself alone in the midst of enemies who were in such numbers that I was unable to resist. In short, I was taken, covered with wounds, El Ucali, as you know, sirs, made his escape with his entire squadron, and I was left a prisoner in his power, the only sad being among so many filled with joy, and the only captive among so many free. For there were fifteen thousand Christians, all at the oar in the Turkish fleet, that regained their long for liberty that day. They carried me to Constantinople, where the Grand Turk made my master general at sea for having done his duty in battle, and carried off as evidence of his bravery the standard of the Order of Malta. The following year, which was the year 72, I found myself at Navarino, rowing in the leading galley with the three lanterns. There I saw and observed how the opportunity of capturing the whole Turkish fleet in harbour was lost, for all the marines and janissaries that belonged to it made sure that they were about to be attacked inside that very harbour, and had their kits and pa pasamaks, or shoes, ready to f flee at once on shore without waiting to be assailed, and so great fear did they stand of our fleet. But heaven ordered it otherwise, not for any fault or neglect of the general who commanded on our side, but for the sins of Christendom, and because it was God's will and pleasure that we should always have instruments of punishment to chastise us. As it was, El Ucali took refuge at Modon, which is an island near Navarino, and landing forces fortified the mouth of the harbour and waited quietly until John, Don John retired. On this expedition was taken the galley called the Prize, whose captain was the son of the famous corsair Barbarossa. It was taken by the chief Neapolitan galley called the She-Wolf, commanded by that thunderbolt of war, that father of his men, that successful and unconquered captain Don Alvaro de Bazan, Marquis of Santa Cruz, and I cannot help telling you what took place at the capture of the prize. The son of Barbarossa was so cruel and treated his slaves so badly that when those who were at the oars saw the She-Wolf galley was bearing down upon them and gaining upon them, 
They all at once dropped their oars and seized their captain, who stood on the stage at the end of the gangway, shouting to them to row lustily. And passing him on from bench to bench, from poop to the prow, they so bit him that before he got much past the mass, his soul had already gone to hell, so great, as I said, was the cruelty with which he treated them, and the hatred with which they hated him. We returned to Constantinople the following year, 73. It became known that Don John had seized Tunis and taken the kingdom for the Turks, and placed Muley Hamid in possession, putting an end to the hopes with which Muley Hamida, the cruelest and bravest Moor in the world, entertained of returning to reign there. The Grand Turk took the loss greatly to heart, and with cunning which all his race possessed, he made peace with the Venetians, who were much more eager for it than he was. And the following year, 74, he attacked Goletta in the fort which Don John had left half-built near Tunis. While all these events were occurring, I was laboring at the oar without any hope of freedom. At least I had no hope of attaining it by ransom, for I was firmly resolved not to write to my father telling him of my misfortunes. At length the Goletta fell, and the fort fell, in Fort which places there were seventy-five thousand regular Turkish soldiers, and more than four thousand Moors and Arabs from all parts of Africa, and in the train of all this great host, such munitions and engines of war, and so many pioneers, that with their hands they might have covered the Goletta and the fort with handfuls of earth. The first of all was the Goletta, until then reckoned impregnable, and it fell not by any fault of his defenders, who did all they could and should have done, but because experiment proved how easily entrenchments could be made in the debt desert sand there, for water used to be found at two palm steps, while the Turks found none at two yards, and so by means of a quantity of sandbags they raised their work so high that they commanded the walls of the fort, sweeping them as if from a cavalier, so that no one was able to make a stand or maintain the defense. It was a common opinion that our men should not have shut themselves up in the Goletta, but should have waited in the open at the landing place, but those who say so talk at random with little knowledge of such matters. For if in the Goletta and in the, and in the fort there were barely seven thousand soldiers, how could such a small number, however resolute, sally out and hold their own against numbers like those of the enemy? And how is it possible to help losing a stronghold that is not relieved above all when surrounded by a host of determined enemies in their own country? But many thought, and I thought so too, that it was a special favor and mercy which heaven showed to Spain in permitting the destruction of that source and hiding place in mischief, that devour a sponge and moth of countless money, fruitlessly wasted there to no other purpose save preserving the memory of its capture by the invincible Charles V, as if to make that eternal as it is and will be, these stones were needed to support it. The fort also fell, but the Turks had to win it inch by inch, for the soldiers who defended it fought so gallantly and stoutly that the number of the enemy killed in twenty-two general assaults succeeded twenty-five thousand. Of three hundred that remained alive, not one was taken unwounded, a clear and manifest proof of their gallantry and resolution, and how sturdily they had defended themselves and held their post. A small fort or tower, which was in the middle of the lagoon, under command of Don Juan Zanugura, a, a Valencian gentleman and a famous soldier, capitulated upon terms. They took prisoner Don Pedro Puerto Carrero, commander of the Goleta, who had done all in his power to defend his fortress, and took the loss of it so much to heart that he died of grief on the way to Constantinople, where they were carrying him a prisoner. They also took the commander of the fort, Gabriel Serbillon by name, a Milanese gentleman, a great engineer, and a very brave soldier. In these two fortresses perished many persons of note, among whom was Pagano Doria, knight of the Order of St. John, a man of generous disposition, as was shown by his extreme liberality to his brother, the famous John Andrea Doria, and what made his death the more sad was that he was slain by some Arabs to whom, seeing that the fort was now lost, he entrusted himself and who offered to conduct him in the guise of a moor to Tabarca, a small fort or station on the coast held by the Genoese, employed by the coral fishery. These Arabs cut off his head and carried it to the commander of the Turkish fleet, who proved on them the truth of our Castilian proverb that, though the treason may please, the traitor is ha hated, for they say he ordered those who brought him the present to be hanged for not having brought him alive. Among the Christians who were taken in, the fort was one named Don Pedro de Aguilar, a native of some place, I know not what, in Andalusia, who had been my ensign in the fort, a soldier of great repute and rare intelligence, who had in particular a special gift for what they call poetry. I say so because his fate brought him to my galley and to my bench, and made him a slave to the same master. Before we left the, the port, this gentleman composed two sonnets by way of epitaphs, one on the Goletta and the other on the fort. Indeed, I may as well repeat them, for I have them by heart, and I think they will be liked rather than disliked. The instant the captain mentioned the name of Don Pedro de Aguilar, Don Fernando looked at his com companions, and they all three smiled. And when he came to speak of the sonnets, one of them said, 
Before your worship proceeds any further, I entreat you to tell me what became of that Don Pedro de Aguilar you have spoken of. All I know is, replied the captive, that after having been in Constantinople two years, he escaped in the disguise of an Arno, in company with a Greek spy, but whether he regained his liberty or not I cannot tell, though I fancy he did, because a year afterwards I saw the Greek at Constantinople, though I was unable to ask him what the result of the journey was. Well, then, you are right, returned the gentleman, for that Don Pedro is my brother, and he is now in our village in good health, rich, married, and with three children. Thanks be to God for all the mercies he has shown him, said the captive, for to my mind there is no happiness on earth to compare with recovering lost liberty. And what is more, said the gentleman, I know the sonnets my brother made. Let your worship repeat them, said the captive, for you will recite them better than I can. With all my heart, said the gentleman, the dawn the galetta runs thus. End of chapter 39 Chapter 40 In which the story of the captive is continued. Sonnet Bless souls that from this mortal husk set free, In garden of brave deeds beatified, Above this lowly orb of our ab ours abide, Made heirs of heaven and immortality, With noble rage and ardor glowing ye. Your strength, while well, strength was yours, In battle plied, and with your own blood In the foemen's died. The sandy soil and the encircling sea it Was the ebbing lifeblood first that failed, Weary arms as stout hearts ne quelled, Though vanquished, yet ye earned the victor's crown, Though mourned, yet still triumphant was your fall. For there ye won, between the sword and wall, In heaven glory, and on earth renown. That is exactly according to my recollection, said the captive. Well, that on the fort, said the gentleman, if my memory serves me, goes thus. Up from this wasted soil, this shattered shell, whose walls and towers here in ruin lie, three thousand soldiers took wing on high. In the bright mansions of the blessed to dwell, the onslaught of the foemen to repel, by might of arm all vainly did they try, and when at length was left but them to die, Wearied in few the last offenders fell, all this same arid soil hath ever been. A haunt of countless mournful memories, as well in our days as in days of yore. But never yet to heaven it sent, I ween, for it hard bosom purer souls than these, for braver bodies on its surface bore. The sonnets were not disliked, and the captive was rejoiced at the tidings they gave him of his comrade. And continuing his tale, he went on to say, the Galetta and the fort thus being in their hands, the Turks gave orders to dismantle the Galetta, for the fort was reduced to such a state that there was nothing left to level, and to do the work more quickly and easily they mined it in three places, but nowhere were they able to blow up the part which seemed to be the least strong, that is to say, the old walls, while all that remained standing of the new fortifications that the Fratan had made came close to the ground with the greatest ease. Finally the fleet returned victorious and triumphant to Constantinople, and after a few months died my master, El Ukali, otherwise Ukali Fartox, which means in Turkish the scabby renegade, for that he was, it, it was his, it is in the practice with Turks to name people from some defect or virtue they may possess, the reason being that there are among them only four surnames belonging to families tracing their descent from the Ottoman house, and the others, as I have said, take their names and surnames either from bodily blemishes or moral qualities. This scabby one rode at the oar as a slave of the great seigneur's for fourteen years, and when over thirty-four years of age, in resentment at having been struck by a Turk while at the oar, turned renegade and renounced his faith in order to be able to revenge himself, and such was his valor, valor that, without owing his advancements to the base ways and means by which the most favorites of the grand seigneur rise to power, he came to be the king of Algiers, and afterwards general on sea, which is the third place of trust in the realm. He was a Calabrian by birth, and a worthy man morally, and he treated his slaves with great humanity. He had three thousand of them, and after his death they were divided, as he directed by his will, between the Grand Seigneur, who is heir of all who die and shares with the children of the deceased, and his renegades. I felt at the lot of a Venetian renegade, who, when a cabin boy on board a ship, had been taken by Ukali, and was so much beloved by him that he began one of the most favored youths. He came to be the most cruel renegade I ever saw. His name was Hassan Aja, and he grew very rich and became the king of Algiers. With him I went there from Constantinople, rather glad to be so near to Spain. Not that I intended to write any one about my unhappy lot, but to try fortune would be kinder to me in Algiers than in Constantinople, where I had attempted in a thousand ways to escape without ever finding a favorable time or chance. 
But in Algiers I resolved to seek for other means of effecting the purpose I cherished so dearly, for the hope of attaining my liberty never deserted me, and when in my plots and schemes and attempts the result did not answer my expectations, without giving way to despair, I immediately began to look out for or conjure up some new hope to support me, however faint or feeble it might be. In this way I lived on immured in a building or prison called by the Turks of Beno, in which they can find Christian captives, as well as those that are the kings as those belonging to private individuals, and also what they call those of the Almation, which is as much as to say the slaves of the municipality who serve the city in the public works and other employments. But captives of this kind recover their liberty with great difficulty, for as they are public property and have no particular master, there is no one with whom to treat for their ransom, even though they may have the means. To these banos, as I have said, some private individuals of the town are in the habit of bringing their captives, especially when they are to be ransomed, because there they can keep them in safety and comfort until their ransom arrives. The king's captives also are that are on ransom do not go out to work with the rest of the crew, unless when their ransom is delayed for them to make them right for it more pressingly, they compel them to go and work for wood, which is no light labor. I, however, was one of those on ransom, for when it was discovered that I was captain, although I declared my scanty means and want of fortune, nothing could dissuade them from including me among the gentlemen and those wanting to be ransomed. They put a chain on me more as a mark of this than to keep me safe, so I passed my life in that band with several other gentlemen and persons of quality, marked out as held to be ransomed. But though at times, or rather almost always, we suffered from hunger and scanty clothing, nothing distressed us so much hearing and seeing at every turn the unexampled and unheard of cruelty my master inflicted upon the Christians. Every day he hanged a man, impaled one, cut off the ears of another, all with so little provocation or so entirely without any, that the Turks acknowledged he did it merely for the sake of doing it, and because he was by nature murderously disposed toward the whole human race. The only one that fared at all well with him was a Spanish soldier, something de Saavedra by name, to whom he never gave a blow himself, or did a blow to be given or dressed a hard word, although he had done things that will dwell in the memory of the people there for many a year, in order to recover his liberty, and for the least of the many things he did, we all dreaded he would be impelled, and he himself was in fear of it more than once. And only that time does not allow, I could tell you now of something of what that soldier did, that would interest and astonish you more than the narration of my own tale. To go on with my story, the courtyard of our prisons was overlooked by the windows of the house belonging to a wealthy moor of high position, and these, as is usual in Moorish houses, were rather loopholes and windows, and besides were covered with thick and close lattice work. It so happened then, as I was w one day on the terrace of our prison, with three other comrades trying to pass away the time, how far we could leap with our chains, we being alone, for all the other Christians had gone to work. I chanced to raise my eyes and from one of these little closed windows I saw a reed appear with a cloth attached to one end of it, and it kept waving to and fro, and moving as if making signs to us to come and take it. We watched it, and one of those who were with me went and stood under the reed to see whether they would let it drop, or what they would do, but as he did so the reed was raised and moved from side to side as if they meant to say no by a shake of the head. The Christian came back, and it was again lowered, making the same movement as before. Another of my comrades met, and with went, and with him the same happened as with the first, and then the third went forward, but with the same result as the first and second. Seeing this, I did not like to try my luck, and as soon as I came under the reed, it was dropped, and fell inside the bano at my feet. I hastened to untie the cloth, in which I perceived a knot, and then this were ten cianus, which were the coins of base gold, current among the war moors, and each worth ten reels of our money. It is needless to say that I rejoice at this godsend, and my joy was not less than my wonder, as I strove to imagine how this good fortune could have come to us. But to me especially, for the evident unwillingness to drop the reed for any but me showed that it was for me the favour was intended. I took my welcome money, broke the reed, and returned to the terrace, and looking up at the window I saw a very white hand put out that opened and shut very quickly. From this we gathered or fancy that it must be some woman living in the house that had done us this kindness, and to show that we were grateful it we made salams after the fashion of the moors, bowing the head and bending the body, and crossing the arms on the breath. Shortly afterwards, at the same window, a small cross made of reeds was put out and immediately withdrawn. The sign led us to believe that some Christian woman was a captive in the house, and that it was she who had been so good to us. But the whiteness of the hand and the bracelets we had perceived made us dismiss that idea, though we thought it might be one of the Christian renegades whom their masters very often take as lawful wives, and gladly, for they 
prefer them to the women of their own nation. And all our conjectures were wide of the truth. So from that time forward, our sole occupation was watching and gazing at the window where the cross had appeared to us, as if it were our pole star. But at least fifteen days passed without our seeing either it or the hand, or any sign, and though meanwhile we endeavored with the whole utmost pains to ascertain who it was that lived in the house, and whether there were any Christian renegade in it, nobody could tell ever us anything more than that he who lived there was a rich moor of high position, Haji Morato by name, formerly Alcade of Lapata, an office of dignity high among them. But when we least thought it was going to rain any more Shianus from that corner, we saw the reed suddenly appear with another cloth tied in a larger knot attached to it, and this at a time when on former occasion the Baino was deserted and unoccupied. We made a trial as before, each of the same three going forward before I did, but the reed was delivered to none but me, and on my approach it was let to drop. I untied the knot, and I found forty Spanish gold crowns without a paper written with a paper written in Arabic, and at the end of the writing there was a large cross drawn. I kissed the cross, took the crowns, and returned to the terrace, and we all made our salams. Again the hand appeared. I made signs that I would read the paper, and then the window was closed. We were all puzzled, though filled with joy at what had taken place, and, as none of us understood Arabic, great our curiosity was to know what the paper continued, and still greater the difficulty of finding someone to read it. At last I resolved to confide in a renegade, a native of Murcia, who professed a gr very great friendship for me, and had given pledges that bound him to keep any secret I might entrust to him. For it is the custom with some renegades, when they intend to return to Christian territory, to carry about them certain certificates from captives of Mark testifying in whatever form they can that such and such a renegade is a worthy man who has always shown kindness to Christians and is anxious to escape on the first opportunity that may present itself. Some obtain these testimonials with good intentions, others put them to a cunning use, so when they go to pillage on Christian territory, if they chance to be cast away, or taken prisoners, they produce their certificates and say that from these papers may be seen the object they came for, which was to remain on Christian ground, that it was to this end they joined the Turks in their foray. In this way they escape the consequences of the first outburst and make their peace with the church before it does them any harm. And when they have the chance, they return to Barbary to become what they were before. Others, however, who are there are who, who procure these papers and make use of them honestly, and remain on Christian soil. This friend of mine, then, was one of these renegades that I have described. He had certificates from all our comrades, in which we testified in his favor as strongly as we could, and if the Moors had found the papers, they would have had him burned alive. I knew that he understood Arabic very well, and could not only speak, but also write it, but before I disclosed the whole matter to him, I asked him to read for me this paper, which I had found by accident in a hole in my cell. He opened it, and remained some time examining it, and muttering to himself as he translated it. I asked him if he understood it, and he told me he did perfectly well, and that if I wished him to tell him its meaning, word for word, I must give him a pen and ink, that he might do it more satisfactorily. We at once gave him what he required, and he said about translating it bit by bit, and when he had said, and when he had done, he said, All that is here in Spanish is what the Moorish paper contains, and you must bear in mind that when it says Leila Maria, and it means Our Lady the Virgin Mary. We read the paper, and it ran thus. When I was a child, my father had a slave who taught me to pray the Christian prayer in my own language, and told me many things about Leila Maria. The Christian died, and I know that she did not go to the fire, but to Allah, because since then I have read her seen her twice, and she told me to go to the land of the Christians to see Leila Marian, who had great love for me. I know not how to go. I have seen many Christians, but except thyself none has seemed to be to me a gentleman. I am young and beautiful, and have plenty of money to take with me. See if thou canst contrive how we go, and if thou wilt, thou shalt be my husband there, and if thou wilt not, it will not distress me, for Leila Marian will find me some some one to marry me. I myself have written this, have a care to whom thou givest it to read, trust no more, for they are all perfidious. I am greatly troubled on this account, for I would not have thee confide in any one, because if my father knew it, he would at once fling me down a wall, and cover me with stones. I will put a thread to the reed, tie the answer to it, and if thou hast no one to write for thee in Arabic, tell it to me by signs, for Leila Marian will make me understand thee. She and Allah, and this cross, which I often kiss, as the captive bade me, protect thee. Judge, sirs, whether we had reason for surprise and joy at the words of this paper, and both one and the other were so great that the renegade perceived that the paper had not been found by chance, but had been in reality addressed to some one of us, and he begged us, if that what he suspected were the truth, to trust him and tell him all, for he would risk his life for our freedom, and so saying, 
he took out from his breast a metal crucifix, and with many tears swore by God, the image represented in whom, sinful and wicked as he was, he truthfully and faithfully believed to be loyal to us and keep secret whatever we chose to reveal to him, for he thought and almost foresaw that by means of her who had written that paper, he and all of us would obtain our liberty. And he himself obtained the object he so much desired, his restoration to the bosom of the Holy Mother Church, from which, by his own sin and ignorance, he was now severed like a corrupt limb. And the renegade said this with so many tears and such signs of repentance that, with one consent, we all agreed to him to tell him the whole truth of the matter. And so we gave him a full account of all, without hiding anything from him. We pointed out to him the window at which the reed appeared, and he by that means took note of the house, and resolved to ascertain with particular care who lived in it. We agreed also that it would be advisable to answer the Moorish lady's letter, and the renegade, without a moment's delay, took down the words I dictated to him, which were exactly what I tell you, for nothing of importance that took place in this affair has escaped my memory, or ever will, while life lasts. This, then, was the answer returned to the Moorish lady. The true Allah protects thee, lady, and that blessed Mary, and who is the true mother of God, and who has put it into thy heart to go into the land of the Christians, because she loves thee. Entreat her that she be pleased to show thee how thou canst execute the command she gives thee, for she will, such is her goodness. On my own part, and on that of all these Christians who are with me, I promise to do all that we can for thee, even to death. Fail not to write me and inform thee of what thou dost mean to do, and I will always answer thee, for the great Allah has given us a Christian captive who can speak and write thy language well, as thou mayest see by this paper, without fear, therefore, thou canst inform us of all thou wouldst. As to what thou sayest, that if thou dost reach the land of the Christians, thou wilt find me my wife. I give thee my promise upon it as a good Christian, and know that the Christians keep their promises better than the Moors. Allah and Mary and his mother watch over thee, my lady. The paper being written and folded, I waited two days until the bayonet was empty as before, and immediately repaired to the usual walk of the terrace to see if there were any sign of the reed which was not long in making its appearance. As soon as I saw it, although I could not distinguish who put it out, I showed the paper as a sign to attach the thread, but it was already fixed to the reed, and to it I tied the paper. And shortly afterwards our star once more made its appearance with the white flag of peace, the little bundle. It was stopped and I picked it up, and found in cloth and gold and silver coins of all sorts more than fifty crowns, which fifty times more strengthened our joy and doubled our hope of gaining our liberty. That, was ver that very night our renegade returned and said he had learned that the moor who had been told that we lived in our, that house, that his name was Haji Murato, that he was enormously rich, and that he had only one daughter, the heiress of all his wealth, and that it was the general opinion throughout the city that she was the most beautiful woman in Barbary, and that several of the viceroys who came there had sought her for a wife, but that she had always been unwilling to marry, and he had learned, moreover, that she had had a Christian slave who was now dead, all which agreed with the contents of the paper. We immediately took counsel with the grenegade as to what means would have to be adopted in order to carry off the Moorish lady and bring us all to Christian territory. And in the end it was agreed that for the present we should wait for a second communication from Zoraida, for that was the name of her who now desires to be called Maria, because we saw clearly that she and no one else could find a way out of all these difficulties. When we had decided upon this, the renegade told us to be, not to be uneasy, for he would lose his life or restore us to liberty. For four days the Baino was filled with people, for which reason the reed delayed its appearance for four days. But at the end of that time, when the baina was, as it generally was, empty, it appeared with a cloth so bulky that it promised a happy birth. Reed and cloth came down to me, and I found another paper and a hundred crowns in gold, without any other coin. We were any age present, and in our cell we gave him the paper, and read, which was to this effect, I cannot think of a plan, Signor, for our going to Spain, nor has Leila Murian shown me one, though I have asked her. All that can be done is for me to give you plenty of money in gold from this window, with it, ransom yourself and your friends, and let one of you go to the land of the Christians, and there buy a vessel, and come back for the others. And he will find me in my father's garden, which is at the Babazan Gate, near the seashore, where I shall be all this summer with my father and my servants. You can carry me away from there by night, without any danger, and bring me to the vessel. And remember, thou art to be my husband, else I will pray to marry and then punish thee. If thou canst not trust any one to go for the vessel, ransom thyself, and do thou go." for I know thou wilt return more surely than any other, as thou art a gentleman and a Christian. Endeavour to make thyself acquainted with the garden, and when I see thee walking yonder, I shall know that the bayno is empty, and I will give thee abundance of money. Allah protect thee, Signor. These were the words and contents of the second paper, and on hearing them, each declared himself willing to be the ransom one, and promised to go in return with a scrupulous good faith. And I too made the same offer, to, but all this... The renegade objected, saying that he would not on any account consent to one of us being sent free before all went together, 
His experience had taught us, had taught him how ill those who have been set free keep their promises, which they made in captivity, captivity, for captives of distinction frequently had recourse to this plan, paying the ransom of one who was to go back to Valencia or Majorca with money to enable him to arm a bank in return for the others who had ransomed him, but who never came back, for it recovered liberty and the dread of losing it again, effaced from the memory all the obligations in the world. And to prove the truth of what he said, he told us briefly of what had happened to a certain Christian gentleman, almost at that very time, the strangest case that had ever occurred, even there, where astonishing and marvellous things are happening every instant. In short, he ended by saying that what he could and ought to be done was to give the money intended for the ransom of one of us Christians to him, so that he might with it buy a vessel there in Algiers under the pretense of becoming a merchant and trader to Chun and along the coast, and when the master of the vessel, it would be easy for him to hit on some way of getting us all out of the Baino and putting us on board, especially if the Moorish lady gave, as she said, money enough to ransom all, because once free it would be the easiest thing in the world for us to embark, even in open day. But the greatest difficulty was that the Moors do not allow any renegade to buy or own any craft unless it be a large vessel for going on roving expeditions, because they are afraid of any that any one who buys a small vessel especially if he a Spaniard wants it only for the purpose of escaping to Christian territory. This he could get over by arranging with a tagger and more to go shares with him in the purchase of the vessel, and in the profit on the cargo, and under cover of this he could become the master of the vessel in which he looked upon, all the rest is accomplished. But though to me and my comrades it had seemed a better plan to send one to Majorca for the vessel, as the Moorish lady suggested, we did not dare to oppose him, fearing that if we did not go, as he said, he would denounce us and place us in danger of losing all our lives if he were to disclose our dealings with Zoraida, for whose life he would have given all our own. We therefore resolved to put ourselves in the hands of God and in the renegades, and at the same time an answer was given to Zoraida, telling her we would do all she recommended, for she had given us good advice as if Leila Marian had delivered it, and that it depended on her alone whether we were to defer the business or to put it into execution at once. I renewed my promise to be her husband, and thus the next day that the Beno chanced to be empty, she at different times gave us by means the reed and cloth two thousand gold crowns and a paper in which she said that the next Juna, that is to say Friday, she was going to her father's garden, but that before she went she would give us more money, and if it were not enough, we were to let her know, and she would come and give us as much as we asked for, for her father had so much he would not miss it, and besides, he kept all the keys. We at once gave the renegade five hundred crowns to buy the vessel, and with eight hundred I ransomed myself, giving the money to a Valencian merchant who happened to be in Algiers at the time, and who had released me on his word, pledging it that on the arrival of the first ship from Valencia he would pay my ransom, for if he had given the money at once it would have made the king suspect that my ransom money had been for a long time in Algiers, and that the merchant had for his own advantage kept it secret. In fact, my master was so difficult to deal with that I dared not on any account pay down the money at once. The Thursday before the Friday on which the fair Zoraida was to go to the garden, she gave us a thousand crowns more, and warned of us, us of her departure, begging me, if I were ransomed, to find her at her father's garden at once, and by all means seek an opportunity of going there to see her. I answered in a few words that I would do so, and that you must remember to commend us to Lila Marie and with all the prayers the captive had taught her. This having been done, steps were taken to ransom our three comrades, so as to enable them to quit the bano, unless seeing me ransom and themselves not, though the money was forthcoming, they should make a disturbance about it, and the devil should prompt them to do something that might injure Zoraida. For their proposition might be sufficient to relieve me from this apprehension, nevertheless I was unwilling to run any risk in the matter, and so I had them ransomed in the same way as I was, handing over all the money to the merchant, so that he might with safety and confidence give security, without, however, arranging our confiding our arrangement in secret to him, which might have been dangerous. End of chapter 40「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. » Recording by Cynthia Lyons, Naperville, Illinois. Don Quixote, Volume 1, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Translated by John Ormsby. Part 14, Chapter 41. in which the captive still continues his adventures. 
Before fifteen days were over, our renegade had already purchased an excellent vessel with room for more than thirty persons, and to make the transaction safe and lend a color to it, he thought it well to make, as he did, a voyage to a place called Cherchel, twenty leagues from Algiers, on the Oran side, where there is an extensive trade in dried figs. Two or three times he made this voyage in company with the Tagarin already mentioned. The Moors of Aragon are called Tagarins in Barbary, and those of Granada Mudahyars, but in the kingdom of Fez they call the Mudahyars Elkes, and they are the people the king chiefly employs in war. To proceed, Every time he passed with his vessel, he anchored in a cove that was not two crossbow shots from the garden where Zoreda was waiting. And there the renegade, together with two Moorish lads that rode, used purposely to station himself, either going through his prayers or else practicing as a part of what he meant to perform in earnest. And thus he would go to Zoreda's garden and ask for fruit, which her father gave him, not knowing him. But though, as he afterward told me, he sought to speak to Zoreda, to tell her who he was, and that by my orders he was to take her to the land of the Christians, so that she might feel satisfied and easy. He had never been able to do so, for the Moorish women do not allow themselves to be seen by any Moor or Turk unless their husband or father bid them. With Christian captives they permit freedom of intercourse and communication, even more than, than might be considered proper. But for my part I should have been sorry if he had spoken to her for perhaps it might have alarmed her to find her affairs talked of by renegades. But God, who ordered it otherwise, afforded no opportunity for our renegade's well-meant purpose, and he, seeing how safely he could go to Cherchel and return, and anchor when and how and where he liked, and that the Tagarin, his partner, had no will but his, and that now I was ransomed, all we wanted was to find some Christians to row, told me to look out for any I should be willing to take with me, over and above those who had been ransomed, and to engage them for the next Friday, which he fixed upon for our departure. On this I spoke to twelve Spaniards, all stout rowers, and such as could most easily leave the city. But it was no easy matter to find so many just then, because there were twenty ships out on a cruise, and they had taken all the rowers with them, and these would not have been found were it not that their master remained at home that summer without going to sea, in order to finish a galliot that he had upon the stocks. To these men I said nothing more than that the next Friday in the evening they were to come out stealthily one by one and hang about Haji Murato's garden, waiting for me there until I came. These directions I gave each one separately, with orders that if they saw any other Christians there, they were not to say anything to them except that I had directed them to wait at that spot. This preliminary having been settled, another still more necessary step had to be taken, which was to let Zoraida know how matters stood, that she might be prepared and forewarned so as not to be taken by surprise if we were suddenly to seize upon her before she thought the Christian's vessels could have returned. I determined, therefore, to go to the garden and try if I could speak to her, and the day before my departure I went there under the pretense of gathering herbs. The first person I met was her father, 
who addressed me in the language that all over Barbary, and even in Constantinople, is the medium between captives and Moors, and is neither Morisco nor Castilian, nor of any other nation, but a mixture of all languages, by means of which we can all understand one another. In this sort of language, I say, he asked me what I wanted in his garden, and to whom I belonged. I replied that I was a slave of the Arno Mami, for I knew as a certainty that he was a very great friend of his, and that I wanted some herbs to make a salad. He asked me then whether I were on ransom or not, and what my master demanded for me. While these questions and answers were proceeding, the fair Zoraida, who had already perceived me some time before, came out of the house in the garden, and as Moorish women are by no means particular about letting themselves be seen by Christians, or, as I have said before, at all coy, she had no hesitation in coming to where her father stood with me. Moreover, her father, seeing her approach slowly, called her to come. It would be beyond my power now to describe to you the great beauty, the high-bred air, the brilliant attire of my beloved Zoraida, as she presented herself before my eyes. I will content myself with saying that more pearls hung from her fair neck, her ears, and her hair than she had hairs on her head. On her ankles, which, as is customary, were bare, she had carsages, for so bracelets or anklets are called in Morisco, of the purest gold, set with so many diamonds that she told me afterwards her father valued them at ten thousand doubloons, and those she had on her wrists were worth as much more. The pearls were in profusion and very fine, for the highest display and adornment of the Moorish women is decking themselves with rich pearls and seed pearls, and of these there are therefore more among the Moors than among any other people. Zoraida's father had to the reputation of possessing a great number, and the purest in all Algiers and of possessing also more than two hundred thousand Spanish crowns, and she, who is now mistress of me only, was mistress of all this. Whether thus adorned she would have been beautiful or not, and what she must have been in her prosperity, may be imagined from the beauty remaining to her after so many hardships." For, as every one knows, the beauty of some women has its times and its seasons, and is increased or diminished by chance causes, and naturally the emotions of the mind will heighten or impair it, though indeed more frequently they totally destroy it. In a word, she presented herself before me that day attired with the utmost splendor, and supremely beautiful. At any rate, she seemed to me the most beautiful object I had ever seen, and when, besides, I thought of all I owed to her, I felt as though I had before me some heavenly being come to earth to bring me relief and happiness. As she approached, her father told her, in his own language, that I was a captive belonging to his friend, the Arno Mami, and that I had come for salad. She took up the conversation, and in that mixture of tongues I have spoken of, she asked me if I was a gentleman, and why I was not ransomed. I answered that I was already ransomed, and that by the price it might be seen what value my master set on me as I had given one thousand five hundred zoltanis for me. To which she replied, Hadst thou been my father's, I can tell thee I would not have let him part with thee for twice as much, for you Christians 
always tell lies about yourself and make yourselves out poor to cheat the moors that may be lady said i but indeed i dealt truthfully with my master as i do and mean to do with everybody in the world and when dost thou go said zoraida to-morrow i think said i for there is a vessel here from france which sails to-morrow and i think i shall go in her would it not be better said zoraida to wait for the arrival of ships from spain and go with them and not with the french who are not your friends no said i though if there were intelligence that a vessel were now coming from spain it is true i might perhaps wait for it however it is more likely i shall depart to-morrow for the longing i feel to return to my country and to those i love is so great that it will not allow me to wait for another opportunity however more convenient if it be delayed no doubt thou art married in thine own country said zoraida and for that reason thou art anxious to go and see thy wife i am not married i replied but i have given my promise to marry on my arrival there and is the lady beautiful to whom thou hast given it said zoraida so beautiful said i that to describe her worthily and tell thee the truth she is very like thee at this her father laughed very heartily and said by allah christian she must be very beautiful if she is like my daughter who is the most beautiful woman in all this kingdom only look at her well and thou wilt see i am telling the truth zoraida's father as the better linguist helped to interpret most of these words and phrases for though she spoke the bastard language that as i have said is employed there she expressed her meaning more by signs than by words while we were still engaged in this conversation a moor came running up exclaiming that four turks had leaped over the fence or wall of the garden and were gathering the fruit though it was not yet ripe the old man was alarmed and zoraida too for the moors commonly and so to speak instinctively have a dread of the turks but particularly of the soldiers who are so insolent and domineering to the moors who are under their power that they treat them worse than if they were their slaves her father said to zoraida daughter retire into the house and shut thyself in while i go and speak to these dogs and thou christian pick thy herbs and go in peace and allah bring thee safe to thy own country i bowed and he went away to look for the turks leaving me alone with zoraida who made as if she were about to retire as her father bade her but the moment he was concealed by the trees of the garden turning to me with her eyes full of tears she said tamiji cristiano tamiji that is to say art thou going christian art thou going i made answer yes lady but not without thee come what may be on the watch for me on the next juma and be not alarmed when thou seest us for most surely we shall go to the land of the christians this i said in such a way that she understood perfectly all that passed between us and throwing her arm round my neck she began with feeble steps to move towards the house but as fate would have it and it might have been very unfortunate if heaven had not otherwise ordered it just as we were moving on in the manner and position i have described with her arm round my neck her father as he returned after having sent away the turks saw how we were walking and we perceived that he saw us but zoraida ready and quick-witted took care not to remove her arm from my neck but on the contrary drew closer to me and laid her head on my breast bending her knees a little 
and showing all the signs and tokens of fainting, while I at the same time made it seem as though I were supporting her against my will. Her father came running up to where we were, and seeing his daughter in this state, asked what was the matter with her. She, however, giving no answer, he said, no doubt she has fainted in alarm at the entrance of those dogs, and taking her from mine, he drew her to his own breast, while she, sighing, her eyes still wet with tears, said again, Amigi, Cristiano, Amigi, go, Christian, go. To this her father replied, There is no need, daughter, for the Christian to go, for he has done thee no harm, and the Turks have now gone. Feel no alarm, there is nothing to hurt thee, for, as I say, the Turks at my request have gone back the way they came. It was they who terrified her, as thou hast said, senor, said I to her father, but since she tells me to go, I have no wish to displease her. Peace be with thee, and with thy leave I will come back to this garden for herbs, if need be for my master says there are nowhere better herbs for salad than here. Come back for any thou hast need of, replied Haji Murato, for my daughter does not speak thus because she is displeased with thee or any Christian. She only meant that the Turks should go, not thou, or that it was time for thee to look for thy herbs. With this, I at once took my leave of both, and she, looking as though her heart were breaking, retired with her father. While pretending to look for herbs, I made the round of the garden at my ease and studied carefully all the approaches and outlets, and the fastenings of the house and everything that could be taken advantage of to make our task easy. Having done so, I went and gave an account of all that had taken place to the renegade and my comrades, and looking forward with impatience to the hour when, all fear at an end, I should find myself in possession of the prize which fortune held out to me in the fair and lovely Zoraida. The time passed at length, and the appointed day we so longed for arrived, and all following out the arrangement and plan which, after careful consideration and many a long discussion we had de decided upon, we succeeded as fully as we could have wished, for on the Friday following the day upon which I spoke to Zoraida in the garden, the renegade anchored his vessel at nightfall, almost opposite the spot where she was. The Christians, who were to row, were ready and in hiding in different places round about, all waiting for me, anxious and elated, and eager to attack the vessel they had before their eyes, for they did not know the renegade's plan, but expected that they were to gain their liberty by force of arms and by killing the Moors who were on board the vessel. As soon, then, as I and my comrades made our appearance, all those that were in hiding, seeing us, came and joined us. It was now the time when the city gates are shut, and there was no one to be seen in all the space outside. When we were collected together, we debated whether it would be better first to go for Sarida or to make prisoners of the Moorish rowers who first rowed in the vessel. But while we were still uncertain, our renegade came up asking us what kept us, as it was now the time, and all the Moors were off their guard, and most of them asleep. We told him why we hesitated, but he said it was of more importance first to secure the vessel, which could be done with the greatest ease and without any danger, and then we could go for Zoraida. We all approved of what he said and so without further delay guided by him we made for the vessel and he leaping on board first drew his cutlass and said in morisco let no one stir from this if he does not want it to cost him his life 
By this almost all the Christians were on board, and the Moors, who were faint-hearted, hearing their captain speak in this way, were cowed, and without any one of them taking up his arms, indeed they had few or hardly any, they submitted without saying a word to be bound by the Christians, who quickly secured them, threatening them that if they raised any kind of outcry they would all be put to the sword. This having been accomplished, and half of our party being left to keep guard over them, the rest of us, again taking the renegade as our guide, hastened towards Haji Murato's garden, and as good luck would have it, on trying the gate it opened as easily as if it had not been locked, and so, quite quietly and in silence, we reached the house without being perceived by anybody. The lovely Zoraida was watching for us at a window, and as soon as she perceived that there were people there, she asked in a low voice if we were Nizarani, as much as to say or ask if we were Christians. I answered that we were, and begged her to come down. As soon as she recognized me, she did not delay an instant, but without answering a word came down immediately and opened the door and presented herself before us all, so beautiful and so richly attired that I cannot attempt to describe her. The moment I saw her, I took her hand and kissed it, and the renegade and my two comrades did the same, and the rest, who knew nothing of the circumstances, did as they saw us do, for it only seemed as if we were returning thanks to her and recognizing her as the giver of our liberty. The renegade asked her in the Morisco language if her father was in the house. She replied that he was and that he was asleep. Then it will be necessary to waken him and take him with us, said the renegade, and everything of value in this fair mansion. Nay, said she, my father must not on any account be touched, and there is nothing in the house except what I shall take, and that will be quite enough to enrich and satisfy all of you. Wait a little, and you shall see. And so saying, she went in, telling us she would return immediately, and bidding us keep quiet, making any noise. I asked the renegade what had passed between them, and when he told me, I declared that nothing should be done except in accordance with the wishes of Zoraida, who now came back with a little trunk so full of gold crowns that she could scarcely carry it. Unfortunately, her father awoke while this was going on, and hearing a noise in the garden, came to the window, and at once perceiving that all those who were there were Christians, raising a prodigiously loud outcry, he began to call out in Arabic, Christians, Christians, thieves, thieves, by which cries we were all thrown into the greatest fear and embarrassment. But this, the renegade, seeing the danger we were in and how important it was for him to effect his purpose before we were heard, mounted with the utmost quickness to where Haji Morato was and with him went some of our party. I, however, did not dare leave Zoraida, who had fallen almost fainting in my arms. To be brief, those who had gone upstairs acted so promptly that in an instant they came down, carrying Haji Morato with his hands bound and a napkin tied over his mouth, which prevented him from uttering a word, warning him at the same time that to attempt to speak would cost him his life. When his daughter caught sight of him, she covered her eyes so as not to see him, and her father was horror-stricken, not knowing how willingly she had placed herself in our hands. But it was now most essential for us to be on the move, and carefully and quickly we regained the vessel, where those who had remained on board were waiting for us in apprehension of some mishap having befallen us. 
It was barely two hours after night set in when we were all on board the vessel, where the cords were removed from the hands of Zoraida's father and the napkin from his mouth. But the renegade once more told him not to utter a word or they would take his life. He, when he saw his daughter there, began to sigh piteously, and still more when he perceived that I held her co closely embraced, and that she lay quiet without resisting or complaining, or showing any reluctance. Nevertheless, he remained silent, lest they should carry into effect the repeated threats the renegade had addressed to him. Finding herself now on board, and that we were about to give way with the oars, Zoraida, seeing her father there and the other moors bound, bade the renegade ask me to do her the favor of releasing the moors and setting her father at liberty, for she would rather drown herself in the sea than suffer a father that had loved her so dearly to be carried away captive before her eyes and on her account. The renegade repeated this to me, and I replied that I was very willing to do so, but he replied that it was not advisable, because if they were left there they would at once raise the country and stir up the city and lead to the dispatch of swift cruisers in pursuit and our being taken by land or sea without any possibility of escape and that all that could be done was to set them free on the first Christian ground we reached. On this point we all agreed, and Zoraida, to whom it was explained, together with the reasons likewise, and then in glad silence and with cheerful alacrity, each of our hearts, we began to shape our course for the island of Majorca, the nearest Christian land. Owing, however, to the Tramontana rising a little and the sea growing somewhat rough, it was impossible for us to keep a straight course from Majorca, and we were compelled to coast in the direction of Oran, not without great uneasiness on our part, lest we should be observed from the town of Shershal, which lies on that coast, not more than sixty miles from Algiers. Moreover, we were afraid of meeting on that course one of the galliots that usually come with goods from Tetuan, although each of us for himself and all of us together felt confident that, if we were to meet a merchant galliot, so that it were not a cruiser, not only should we not be lost, but that we should take a vessel in which we could more safely accomplish our voyage. As we pursued our course, Zoraida kept her head between my hands so as not to see her father, and I felt that she would, was praying to Lila Marianne to help us. We might have made about thirty miles when daybreak found us some three musket shots off the land, which seemed to us deserted, and with, without anyone to see us. For all that, however, by hard rowing, we put out a little to sea, for it was now somewhat calmer, and having gained about two leagues, the word was given to row by batches, while we ate something, for the vessel was well provided, but the rowers said it was not a time to take any rest. Let food be served out to those who were not rowing, but they would not leave their oars on any account. This was done but now a stiff breeze began to blow, which obliged us to leave off rowing and to make sail at once and steer for Oran, as it was impossible to make any other course. All this was done very promptly, and under sail we ran more than eight miles an hour without any fear, except that of coming across some vessel out on a ro roving expedition. We gave the Moorish rowers some food, and the renegade comforted them by telling them that they were not held as captives, as we should set them free on the first opportunity. The same was said to Zoraida's father, who replied, Anything else, Christian, I might hope for or think likely from your generosity and good behavior. But do not think me so simple as to imagine you will give me my liberty. 
for you would never have exposed yourself to the danger of depriving me of it only to restore it to me so generously, especially as you know who I am and the sum you may expect to receive on restoring it. And if you will only name that, I here offer you all you require for myself and for my unhappy daughter there, or else for her alone, for she is the greatest and most precious part of my soul. As he said this, he began to weep so bitterly that he filled us all with compassion and forced Zoraida to look at him, and when she saw him weeping, she was so moved that she rose from my feet and ran to throw her arms round him, and pressing her face to his, they both gave way to such an outburst of tears that several of us were constrained to keep them company. But when her father saw her in full dress and with all her jewels about her, he said to her in his own language, What means this, my daughter? Last night, before this terrible misfortune in which we are plunged befell us, I saw thee in thy every day and indoor garments, and now, without having had time to attire thyself, and without my bringing thee any joyful tidings to furnish an occasion for adorning and bedecking, bedecking thyself, I see thee arrayed in the finest attire it would be in my power to give thee when fortune was most kind to us. Answer me this, for it causes me greater anxiety and surprise than even this misfortune itself. The renegade interpreted to us what the Moor said to his daughter. She, however, returned him no answer. But when he observed in one corner of the vessel the little trunk in which she used to keep her jewels, which he well knew he had left in Algiers and had not brought to the garden, he was still more amazed, and asked her how that trunk had come into our hands and what there was in it to which the renegade, without waiting for Zoraida to reply, made answer. Do not trouble thyself by asking thy daughter Zoraida so many questions, senor, for the one answer I will give thee will serve for all. I would have thee know that she is a Christian, and that it is she who has been the file for our chains and our deliverer from captivity. She is here of her own free will, as glad, I imagine, to find herself in this position as he who escapes from darkness into light, from death to life, from suffering to glory. Daughter, is this true, what he says? cried the moor. It is, replied Zoraida. That thou art in truth a Christian, said the old man, and that thou hast given thy father into the power of his enemies, To which Zoraida made answer, A Christian I am, but it is not I who have placed thee in this position, for it never was my wish to leave thee or do thee harm, but only to do good to myself. And what good hast thou done thyself, daughter? said he. Ask thou that, said she, of Lila Marianne, for she can tell thee better than I. The moor had hardly heard these words when with marvellous quickness he flung himself head foremost into the sea, where no doubt he would have been drowned had not the long and full dress he wore held him up for a little on the surface of the water. Zoraida cried aloud to us to save him, and we were all hastened to help, and seizing him by his robe, we drew him in half-drowned and insensible, at which Zoraida was in such distress that she wept over him as piteously and bitterly as though he were already dead. We turned him upon his face, and he voided a great quantity of water, and at the end of two hours came to himself. Meanwhile, the wind having changed, we were compelled to head for the land and ply our oars to avoid being driven on shore. 
but it was our good fortune to reach a creek that lies on one side of a small promontory or cape called by the moors that of the Cavarumia, which in our language means the wicked christian woman for it is a tradition among them that la cava through which spain was lost lies buried at that spot cava in their language meaning wicked woman and rumia christian moreover they count it unlucky to anchor there when necessity compels them and they never do so otherwise for us however it was not the resting place of the wicked woman but a haven of safety for our relief so much had the sea now got up we posted a lookout on shore and never let the oars out of our hands and ate of the stores the renegade had laid in imploring god and our lady with all our hearts to help and protect us that we might give a happy ending to a beginning so prosperous at the entreaty of zoraida orders were given to set on shore her father and the other moors who were still bound for she could not endure nor could her tender heart bear to see her father in bonds and her fellow countrymen prisoners before her eyes we promised her to do this at the moment of departure for as it was uninhabited we ran no risk in releasing them that place. Our prayers were not so far in vain as to be unheard by heaven, for after a while the wind changed in our favor and made the sea calm, inviting us once more to resume our voyage with a good heart. Seeing this, we unbound the moors and one by one put them on shore, at which they were filled with amazement. But when we came to land Zoraida's father, who had now completely recovered his senses, he said, Why is it, think ye, Christians, that this wicked woman is rejoiced at your giving me my liberty? Think ye it is because of the affection she bears me? Nay, verily, it is only because of the hindrance my present offers to the execution of her base designs and think not that it is her belief that yours is better than ours and that has led her to change her religion it is only because she knows that immodesty is more freely practiced in your country than in ours then turning to zoraida while i and another of the christians held him fast by both arms lest he should do some mad act he said to her infamous girl misguided maiden whether in thy blindness and madness art thou going in the hands of these dogs our natural enemies cursed be the hour when i begot thee cursed the luxury and indulgence in which i reared thee but seeing that he was not likely soon to cease i made haste to put him on shore and thence he continued his maledictions and lamentations aloud, calling on Mohammed to pray to Allah to destroy us, to confound us, to make an end of us, and when, in consequence of having made sail, we could no longer hear what he said, we could see what he did, how he plucked out his beard and tore his hair and lay writhing on the ground. But once he raised his voice, to such a pitch that we were able to hear what he said come back dear daughter come back to shore i forgive thee all let those men have the money for it is theirs now and come back to comfort thy sorrowing father who will yield up his life on this barren strand if thou dost leave him all this zoraida heard and heard with sorrow and tears and all she could say in answer was, Allah grant that Leila Marianne, who has made me become a Christian, give thee comfort in thy sorrow, my father. Allah knows that I could not do otherwise than I have done, and that these Christians owe nothing to my will, for even had I wished not to accompany them, but remain at home, it would have been impossible for me, so eagerly did my soul urge me on to the accomplishment of this purpose which i feel to be as righteous as to thee dear father it seems wicked 
but neither could her father hear her nor we see him when she said this and so while i consoled zoraida we turned our attention to our voyage in which a breeze from the right point so favoured us that we made sure of finding ourselves off the coast of spain on the morrow by daybreak but as good seldom or never comes pure and unmixed without being attended or followed by some disturbing evil that gives a shock to it our fortune or perhaps the curses which the moor had hurled at his daughter for whatever kind of father they may come from these are always to be dreaded brought it about that when we were now in mid-sea and the night about three hours spent as we were running with all sails set and oars lashed for the favouring breeze saved us the trouble of using them we saw by the light of the moon which shone brilliantly a square rigged vessel in full sail close to us luffing up and standing across our course and so close that we had to strike sail to avoid running foul of her while they too put the helm hard up to let us pass they came to the side of the ship to ask who we were whither we were bound and whence we came but as they asked this in french our renegade said let no one answer for no doubt these are french corsairs who plunder all comers acting on this warning no one answered a word but after we had gone a little ahead and the vessel was now lying to leeward, suddenly they fired two guns, and apparently both loaded with chain-shot, for with one they cut our mast in half and brought down both it and the sail into the sea, and the other, discharged at the same moment, sent a ball into our vessel amidship, staving her in completely, but without doing any further damage. We, however, finding ourselves sinking, began to shout for help, and call upon those in the ship to pick us up as we were beginning to fill. Then they lay to, and lowering a skiff or boat, as many as a dozen Frenchmen, well armed with matchlocks, and all their matches burning, got into it and came alongside, and seeing how few we were, and that our vessel was going down, they took us in telling us that this had come to us through our incivility in not giving them an answer. Our renegade took the trunk containing Zoraida's wealth and dropped it into the sea without any one perceiving what he did. In short, we went on board with a Frenchman, who, after having ascertained all they wanted to know about us, rifled us of everything we had as if they had been our bitterest enemies, and from Zoraida they took even the anklets she wore on her feet, but the distress they caused her did not distress me so much as the fear that I was in that from robbing her of her rich and precious jewels they would proceed to rob her of the most precious jewel that she valued more than all. The desires, however, of those people do not go beyond money but of that their covetousness is insatiable and on this occasion it was carried to such a pitch that they would have taken even the clothes we wore as captives if they had been worth anything to them it was the advice of some of them to throw us all into the sea wrapped up in a sail for their purpose was to trade at some of the ports of spain giving themselves out as bretons and if they brought us alive they would be punished as soon as the robbery was discovered but the captain who was the one who had plundered my beloved zoraida said he was satisfied with the prize he had got and that he would not touch at any spanish port but pass the straits of gibraltar by night or as best he could and make for la rochelle from which he had sailed so they agreed by common consent to give us the skiff belonging to their ship and all we required for the short voyage that remained to us and this they did the next day on coming in sight of the spanish coast with which 
and the joy we felt, all our sufferings and miseries were as completely forgotten as if they had never been endured by us. Such is the delight of recovering lost liberty. It may have been about midday when they placed us in the boat, giving us two kegs of water and some biscuit, and the captain, moved by I know not what compassion, as the lovely Zoraida was about to embark, gave her some forty gold crowns, and would not permit his men to take from her those same garments which she has on now. We got into the boat, returning them thanks for their kindness to us, and showing ourselves grateful rather than indignant. They stood out to sea, steering for the straits. We, without looking to any compass save the land we had before us, set ourselves to the row with such energy that by sunset we were so near that we might easily, we thought, land before the night was far advanced. But as the moon did not show that night, and the sky was clouded, and as we knew not whereabouts we were, it did not seem to us a prudent thing to make for the shore, as several of us advised, saying we ought to run ourselves ashore even if it were on rocks and far from any habitation, for in this way we should be relieved from the apprehensions we naturally felt of the prowling vessels of the Tetuan corsairs, who leave Barbary at nightfall and are on the Spanish coast by daybreak, where they commonly take some prize and then go home to sleep in their own houses. But of the conflicting counsels, the one which was adopted was that we should approach gradually and land where we could if the sea were calm enough to permit us. This was done, and a little before midnight we drew near to the foot of a huge and lofty mountain, not so close to the sea, but that it left a narrow space on which to land conveniently. We ran our boat up on the sand, and all sprang out and kissed the ground, and with tears of joyful satisfaction returned thanks to God our Lord for all his incomparable goodness to us on our voyage. We took out of the boat the provisions it contained, and drew it up on the shore, and then climbed a long way up the mountain, for even there we could not feel easy in our hearts or persuade ourselves that it was the Christian soil that was now under our feet. The dawn came more slowly, I think, than we could have wished. We completed the ascent in order to see if from the summit any habitation or any shepherd's huts could be discovered, but strain our eyes as we might, neither dwelling nor human being nor path nor road could we perceive. However, we determined to push on farther, as it could not but be that ere long we must see someone who could tell us where we were. But what distressed me most was to see Zoraida going on foot over that rough ground, for though I once carried her on my shoulders, she was more wearied by my weariness than rested by the rest, and so she would never again allow me to undergo the exertion and went on very patiently and cheerfully while I led her by the hand. We had gone rather less than a quarter of a league when the sound of a little bell fell on our ears, a clear proof that there were flocks hard by, and looking about carefully to see if any were within view, we observed a young shepherd tranquilly and unsuspiciously trimming a stick with his knife at the foot of a cork tree. We called to him, and he, raising his head, sprang nimbly to his feet, for, as we afterwards learned, the first who presented themselves to his sight were the renegade and Zoraida, and seeing them in Moorish dress, he imagined that all the Moors of Barbary were upon him, and plunging with marvellous swiftness into the thicket in front of him, he began to raise a prodigious outcry, exclaiming, The Moors, the Moors have landed to arms, to arms. 
we were all thrown into perplexity by these cries not knowing what to do but reflecting that the shouts of the shepherd would raise the country and that the mounted coast guard would come at once to see what was the matter we agreed that the renegade must strip off his turkish garments and put on a captive's jacket or coat which one of our party gave him at once though he himself was reduced to his shirt and so commending ourselves to god we followed the same road which we saw the shepherd take expecting every moment that the coast guard would be down upon us nor did our expectation deceive us for two hours had not passed when coming out of the brushwood into the open ground we perceived some fifty mounted men swiftly approach, approaching us at a hand gallop as soon as we saw them we stood, stood still waiting for them but as they came close and instead of the moors they were in quest of we saw a set of poor christians they were taken aback and one of them asked if it could be we who were the cause of the shepherd having raised the call to arms i said yes and as i was about to explain to him what had occurred and whence we came and who we were one of the christians of our party recognized the horseman who had put the question to us and before i could say anything more he exclaimed thanks be to god sirs for bringing us to such good quarters for if i do not deceive myself the ground we stand on is that of velez malaga unless indeed all my years of captivity have made me unable to recollect that you senor who ask who we are are pedro de bustamante my uncle the christian captive had hardly uttered these words when the horseman threw himself off his horse and ran to embrace the young man crying nephew of my soul and life i recognize thee now and long have i mourned thee as dead i and my sister thy mother and all thy kin that are still alive and whom god has been pleased to preserve that they may enjoy the happiness of seeing thee we knew long since that thou wert in algiers and from the appearance of thy garments and those of all this company i conclude that ye have had a miraculous restoration to liberty it is true replied the young man and by and by we will tell you all as soon as the horsemen understood that we were christian captives they dismounted from their horses and each offered his to carry us to the city of velez malaga which was a league and a half distant some of them went to bring the boat to the city we having told them where we had left it others took us up behind them and zoraida was placed on the horse of the young man's uncle the whole town came out to meet us for they had by this time heard of our arrival from one who had gone on in advance they were not astonished to see liberated captives or captive moors for people on that coast are well used to see both one and the other but they were astonished at the beauty of zoraida which was just then heightened as well by the exertion of travelling as by the joy of finding herself on christian soil and relieved of all fear of being lost for this had brought such a glow upon her face that unless my affection for her were deceiving me i would venture to say that there was not a more beautiful creature in the world at least that i had ever seen we went straight to the church to return thanks to god for the mercies we had received and when zoraida entered it she said there were faces there like lila marian's we told her they were her images and as well as he could the renegade explained to her what they meant that she might adore them as if each of them were the very same lila marian that she had that had spoken to her and she having great intelligence and a quick and clear instinct understood at once all he said to her about them thence they took us away and distributed us all in different houses in the town 
But as for the renegade Zoraida and myself, the Christian who came with us brought us to the house of his parents, who had a fair share of the gifts of fortune, and treated us with as much kindness as they did their own son. We remained six days in Velez, at the end of which the renegade, having informed himself of all that was requisite for him to do, set out for the city of Granada to restore himself to the sacred bosom of the church through the medium of the Holy Inquisition. The other released captives took their departures, each the way that seemed best to him, and Zoraida and I were left alone with nothing more than the crowns which the courtesy of the Frenchman had bestowed upon Zoraida, out of which I bought the beast on which she rides, and I, for the present, attending her as her father and squire and not as her husband, we are now going to ascertain if my father is living, or if any of my brothers has had better fortune than mine has been though, as heaven has made me the companion of Zoraida, I think no other lot could be assigned to me, however happy that I would rather have. The patience with which she endures the hardship that poverty brings with it, and the eagerness she shows to become a Christian, are such that they fill me with admiration and bind me to serve her all my life though the happiness I feel in seeing myself, hers, and her mine, is disturbed and marred by not knowing whether I shall find any corner to shelter her in my own country, or whether time and death may not have made such changes in the fortunes and lives of my father and brothers, that I shall hardly find any one who knows me if they are not alive." I have no more of my story to tell you, gentlemen. Whether it be an interesting or a curious one, let your better judgments decide. All I can say is I would gladly have told it to you more briefly, although my fear of weir wearying you has made me leave out more than one circumstance. End of chapter 41. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. Don Quixote, Volume 1, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Translated by John Ormsby. Part 15. Chapters 42 and 43 Chapter 42 Which treats of what further took place in the inn, and of several other things worth knowing. With these words the captive held his peace, and Don Fernando said to him, In truth, Captain, the manner in which you have related this remarkable adventure has been such as befitted the novelty and strangeness of the matter. The whole story is curious and uncommon, and abounds with incidents that fill the hearers with wonder and astonishment, and so great is the pleasure we have found in listening to it, that we should be glad if it were to begin again, even though to-morrow were to find us still occupied with the same tale. And while he said this, Cardinio and the rest of them offered to be of service to him in any way that lay in their power and in words and language so kindly and sincere, that the captain was much gratified by their good will. In particular, Don Fernando offered, if he would go back with him, to get his brother the Marquis to become godfather at the baptism of Zoraida, and on his own part to provide him with the means of making his appearance in his own country with the credit and comfort he was entitled to. For all this the captive returned thanks very courteously, although he would not accept any of their generous offers. By this time night closed in, and as it did, there came up to the inn a coach attended by some men on horseback, who demanded accommodation, to which the landlady replied that there was not a hand's breadth of the whole inn unoccupied. Still, for all that, 
said one of those who had entered on horseback. "'Room must be found for his lordship the judge here.' At this name the landlady was taken aback, and said, "'Seigneur, the fact is I have no beds. "'But if his lordship the judge carries one with him, as no doubt he does, "'let him come in and welcome, "'for my husband and I will give up our room to accommodate his worship.' "'Very good. So be it,' said the squire. "'But in the meantime a man had got out of the coach, "'whose dress indicated at a glance the office and post he held. "'For the long robe with ruffled sleeves that he wore "'showed that he was, as his servant said, a judge of appeal. "'He led by the hand a young girl in a travelling dress, "'apparently about sixteen years of age.' and of such a high-bred air, so beautiful and so graceful, that all were filled with admiration when she made her appearance. And but for having seen Dorothea, Lucinda, and Zoraida, who were there in the inn, they would have fancied that a beauty like that of this maiden's would have been hard to find. Don Quixote was present at the entrance of the judge with the young lady, and as soon as he saw him he said, "'Your worship may with confidence enter "'and take your ease in this castle, "'for though the accommodation be scanty and poor, "'there are no quarters so cramped or inconvenient "'that they cannot make room for arms and letters. "'Above all, if arms and letters have beauty for a guide and leader, "'as letters represented by your worship have in this fair maiden, "'to whom not only ought castles to throw themselves open "'and yield themselves up, "'but rocks should rend themselves asunder.' "'and mountains divide and bow themselves down "'to give her a reception. "'Enter your worship, I say, into this paradise, "'for here you will find stars and suns "'to accompany the heaven your worship brings with you. "'Here you will find arms in their supreme excellence "'and beauty in its highest perfection.' "'The judge was struck with amazement "'at the language of Don Quixote, "'whom he scrutinised very carefully.' "'no less astonished by his figure than by his talk. "'And before he could find words to answer him, "'he had a fresh surprise, "'when he saw opposite to him Lucinda, Dorothea, and Zoraida, "'who, having heard of the new guests "'and of the beauty of the young lady, "'had come to see her and welcome her. "'Don Fernando, Cardinio, and the curate, however, "'greeted him with a more intelligible and polished style.' In short, the judge made his entrance in a state of bewilderment, as well with what he saw as what he heard, and the fair ladies of the inn gave the fair damsel a cordial welcome. On the whole he could perceive that all who were there were people of quality, but with the figure, countenance, and bearing of Don Quixote, he was at his wit's end, and all civilities having been exchanged, and the accommodation of the inn inquired into, it was settled, as it had been before settled, that all the women should retire to the garret that had already been mentioned, and that the men should remain outside as if to guard them. The judge, therefore, was very well pleased to allow his daughter, for such the damsel was, to go with the ladies, which she did very willingly, and with part of the host's narrow bed, and half of what the judge had brought with him, they made a more comfortable arrangement for the night than they had expected. The captive, whose heart had leaped within him the instant he saw the judge, telling him somehow that this was his brother, asked one of the servants who accompanied him what his name was, and whether he knew from what part of the country he came. The servant replied that he was called the Licentiate Juan Perez de Viedma and that he had heard it said he came from a village in the mountains of Leon. From this statement, and what he himself had seen, he felt convinced that this was his brother, who had adopted his letters by his father's advice. And excited and rejoiced, he called Don Fernando and Cardinio and the curate aside, and told them how the matter stood, assuring them that the judge was his brother. The servant had further informed him that he was now going to the Indies with the appointment of judge of the Supreme Court of Mexico, and he had learned likewise 
that the young lady was his daughter, whose mother had died in giving birth to her, and that he was very rich in consequence of the dowry left to him with the daughter. He asked their advice as to what means he should adopt to make himself known, or to ascertain beforehand whether, when he had made himself known, his brother, seeing him so poor, would be ashamed of him, or would receive him with a warm heart. "'Leave it to me to find out that,' said the curate. "'Though there is no reason for supposing, Signor Capitan, "'that you will not be kindly received, "'because the worth and wisdom that your brother's bearing shows him to possess "'do not make it likely that he would have proved haughty or insensible, "'or that he would not know how to estimate the accidents of fortune at their proper value.' "'Still,' said the captain, "'I would not make myself known abruptly, but in some indirect way.' "'I have told you already,' said the curate, "'that I will manage it in a way to satisfy us all.' By the time supper was ready, and they all took their seats at the table, except the captive, and the ladies who supped by themselves in their own room, in the middle of supper the curate said, "'I had a comrade of your worship's name, Senor Judge, in Constantinople, where I was a captive for several years.' and that same comrade was one of the stoutest soldiers and captains in the whole Spanish infantry. But he had as large a share of misfortune as he had of gallantry and courage. "'And how was the captain called, Senor? asked the judge. "'He was called Roy Perez de Vidme,' replied the curate. "'And he was born in a village in the mountains of Leon. "'And he mentioned a circumstance connected with his father and his brothers, "'which, had it not been told me by so truthful a man as he was, I should have set down as one of those fables the old women tell over the fire in winter, for he said his father had divided his property among his three sons, and had addressed words of advice to them sounder than any of Cato's. But I can say this much, that the choice he made of going to the wars was attended with such success, that by his gallant conduct and courage, and without any help save his own merit, he rose in a few years to be captain of infantry, and to see himself on the high road, and in position to be given the command of a corps before long. But fortune was against him, for where he might have expected her favour, he lost it, and with it his liberty, on that glorious day when so many received theirs, at the Battle of Lepanto. I lost mine at the Galetta, and after a variety of adventures we found ourselves comrades at Constantinople. Thence he went to Algiers, where he met with one of the most extraordinary adventures that ever befell any one in the world. Here the curate went on to relate briefly his brother's adventure with Zoraida, to all which the judge gave such an attentive hearing, that he never before had been so much of a hearer. The curate, however, only went so far as to describe how the Frenchman plundered those who were in the boat, and the poverty and distress in which his comrade and the fair moor were left, of whom he said he had not been able to learn what became of them, or whether they had reached Spain, or been carried to France by the Frenchman. The captain, standing a little to one side, was listening to all the curate said, and watching every movement of his brother, who, as soon as he perceived the curate had made an end to his story, gave a deep sigh, and said with his eyes full of tears, "'O oh, Seigneur, if you only knew what news you have given me, and how it comes home to me, making me show I have feel it with these tears that spring from my eyes in spite of all my worldly wisdom and self-restraint. That brave captain that you speak of is my eldest brother, who, being of a bolder and loftier mind than my other brother or myself, chose the honourable and worthy calling of arms, which was one of the three careers our father proposed to us as your comrade mentioned in that fable you thought he was telling you. I followed that of letters, in which God and my own excitations have raised me to the position in which you see me. My second brother is in Peru, so wealthy that with what he has sent to my father and to me, he has fully repaid the portion he took with him, and has even furnished my father's hands with the means of gratifying his natural generosity, while I too have been enabled to pursue my studies in a more becoming and creditable fashion, and so to attain my present standing. My father is still alive, 
though dying with anxiety to hear of his eldest son. And you praise God unceasingly that death may not close his eyes, until he has looked upon those of his son. But with regard to him what surprises me is, that having so much common sense as he had, he should have neglected to give any intelligence about himself, either in his troubles and sufferings, or in his prosperity. For if his father or any of us had known of his condition, he need not have waited for that miracle of the reed to obtain his ransom. But what now disquiets me is the uncertainty whether those Frenchmen may have restored him to liberty, or murdered him to hide the robbery. All this will make me continue my journey, not with the satisfaction in which I began it, but in the deepest melancholy and sadness. O oh, dear brother, that I only knew where thou art now, and I would hasten to seek thee out, and deliver thee from thy sufferings, though it were to cost me suffering myself. O oh, that I could bring news to our old father that thou art alive, even wert thou in the deepest dungeon of Barbary, for his wealth and my brother's and mine would rescue thee thence. O oh, beautiful and generous Zoraida, that I could repay thy good goodness to a brother, that I could be present at the new birth of thy soul, and at thy bridal that would give us all such happiness. All this and more the judge uttered with such deep emotion, at the news he had received of his brother, that all who heard him shared in it, showing their sympathy with his sorrow. The curate, seeing then how well he had succeeded in carrying out his purpose, and the captain's wishes, had no desire to keep them unhappy any longer. So he rose from the table, and going to the room where Zoraida was, he took her by the hand, Lucinda, Dorothea, and the judge's daughter following her. The captain was waiting to see what the curate would do, when the latter, taking him with the other hand, advanced with both of them to where the judge and the other gentlemen were, and said, let your tears cease to flow, Signor Judge, and the wish of your heart be gratified as fully as you could desire, for you have before you your worthy brother and your good sister-in-law. He whom you see here is the Captain Fidme, and this is the fair Moor who has been so good to him. The Frenchmen I told you of have reduced them to the state of poverty you see, that you may show them the generosity of your kind heart. The Captain ran to embrace his brother who placed both hands on his breast so as to have a good look at him, holding him a little way off. But as soon as he had fully recognised him, he clasped him in his arms so closely, shedding such tears of heartfelt joy, that most of those present could not but join in them. The words the brothers exchanged, the emotion they showed, can scarcely be imagined, I fancy, much less put down in writing. They told each other in a few words the events of their lives. They showed the true affection of brothers in all its strength. Then the judge embraced Zoraida, putting all he possessed at her disposal. Then he made his daughter embrace her, and the fair Christian and the lovely Moor drew fresh tears from every eye. And there was Don Quixote, observing all these strange proceedings attentively, without uttering a word and attributing the whole to chimeras of a knightly errantry. Then they agreed that the captain and Zoraida should return with his brother to Seville, and send news to his father of his having been delivered and found, so as to enable him to come and be present at the marriage and baptism of Zoraida, for it was impossible for the judge to put off his journey, as he was informed that in a month from that time the fleet was to sail from Seville for New Spain and to miss the passage would have been a great inconvenience to him. In short, everybody was well pleased, and glad at the captive's good fortune. And as now almost two-thirds of the night were passed, they resolved to retire to rest for the remainder of it. Don Quixote offered to mount guard over the castle, lest they should be attacked by some giant, or other malevolent scoundrel. Covetous of the great treasure of beauty the castle contained. Those who understood him returned him thanks for this service, and they gave the judge an account of his extraordinary humour, with which he was not a little amused. 
Sancho Panza alone was fuming at the lateness of the hour for retiring to rest, and he, of all, was the one that made himself most comfortable. As he stretched himself on the trappings of his ass, which, as will be told farther on, cost him so dear. The ladies, then having retired to their chamber, and the others having disposed themselves with as little discomfort as they could, Don Quixote sallied out of the inn to act as sentinel of the castle as he had promised. It happened, however, that a little before the approach of dawn, a voice so musical and sweet reached the ears of the ladies, that it forced them all to listen attentively. But especially Dorothea, who had been awake, and by whose side Donna Clara de Vadme, for so the judge's daughter was called, lay sleeping. No one could imagine who it was that sang so sweetly, and the voice was unaccompanied by any instrument. At one moment it seemed to them as if the singer were in the courtyard, at another in the stable. And as they were all attention wondering, Cardinio came to the door and said, Listen, whoever is not asleep, and you will hear a muleteer's voice that enchants as it chants. We are listening to it already, Signor, said Dorothea, on which Cardinio went away, and Dorothea, giving all her attention to it, made out the words of the song to be these. Chapter 43 wherein is related the pleasant story of the muleteer, together with other strange things that come to pass in the inn. Ah, me! Love's mariner am I, on love's deep ocean sailing. I know not where the haven lies, I dare not hope to gain it. One solitary distant star is all I have to guide me, a brighter orb than those of old that Polinarus lighted. And vaguely drifting am I born, I know not where it leads me. I fix my gaze on it alone, of all besides it heedless. But over cautious prudery, and coyness cold and cruel, When most I need it, these, like clouds, its longed-for light refuse me. Bright star, goal of my yearning eyes, as thou above me beamest, When thou shalt hide thee from my sight, I'll know that death is near me. The singer had got so far when it struck Dorothea that it was not fair to let Clara miss hearing such a sweet voice. So, shaking her from side to side, she woke her, saying, Forgive me, child, for waking thee, but I do so that thou mayest have the pleasure of hearing the best voice thou hast ever heard, perhaps in all thy life. Clara awoke quite drowsy, and not understanding at the moment what Dorothea said, asked her what it was. She repeated what she had said, and Clara became attentive at once. But she had hardly heard two lines, as the singer continued, when a strange trembling seized her, as if she were suffering from a severe attack of quartine ague, and throwing her arms around Dorothea, she said, Ah, dear lady of my soul and my life, why did you wake me? The greatest kindness fortune could do me now would be to close my eyes and ears, so as neither to see or hear that unhappy musician. What are thou talking about, child? said Dorothea. Why, they say this singer is a muleteer. Nay, he is the lord of many places, replied Clara, and that one in my heart which he holds so firmly shall never be taken from him, unless he be willing to surrender it. Dorothea was amazed at the ardent language of the girl, for it seemed to be far beyond such experience of life as her tender years gave promise of. So she said to her, "'You speak in a way that I cannot understand you, Signor Clara. Explain yourself more clearly, and tell me what it is that you are saying about hearts and places, and this musician whose voice has so moved you. But do not tell me anything now.' I do not want to lose the pleasure I get from listening to the singer, by giving my attention to your transports. For I perceive he is beginning to sing a new strain and a new air. Let him, in heaven's name, returned Clara, and not to hear him she stopped both ears with her hands, at which Dorothea was again surprised. But turning her attention to the song, she found that it ran in this fashion. 
Sweet hope, my stay, That onward to the goal of thy intent Dost make thy way, Heedless of hindrance or impediment. Have thou no fear, If at each step thou findest death is near. No victory, no joy of triumph Dost the faint heart know. Unblessed is he, That a bold font to fortune dares not show. But soul and sense, in bondage yieldeth up to indolence. If love he wears do dearly sell, his right must be contest. What gold compares with that whereon his stamp he hath impressed? And all men know what cost is little that we rate but low. Love, resolute, knows not the word impossibility. And though my suit be set by endless obstacles I see, Yet no despair shall hold me bound to earth while heaven is there. Here the voice ceased, and Clara's sobs began afresh, all which excited Dorothea's curiosity to know what could be the cause of singing so sweet and weeping so bitter. So she again asked her what it was she was going to say before. On this Clara, afraid that Lucinda might overhear her, winding her arms tightly round Dorothea, put her mouth so close to her ear that she could speak without fear of being heard by any one else, and said, "'This singer, dear Signora, is the son of a gentleman of Aragon, lord of two villages, who lives opposite my father's house at Madrid. And though my father had curtains to the windows of his house in winter, and lattice work in summer, in some way, I know not how, this gentleman, who was pursuing his studies, saw me, or whether in church or elsewhere, I cannot tell, and, in fact, fell in love with me, and gave me to know it from the window of his house, with so many signs and tears that I was forced to believe him, and even to love him, without knowing what it was he wanted of me. One of the signs he used to make me was to link one hand in the other, to show me he wished to marry me. And though I should have been glad, if that could be, being alone and motherless, I knew not whom to open my mind to, and so I left it as it was, showing him no favour, except when my father and his two were from home, to raise the curtain or the lattice a little, and let him see me plainly, at which he would show such delight that he seemed as if he were going mad. Meanwhile, the time for my father's departure arrived, which he became aware of, but not from me, for I had never been able to tell him of it. He fell sick, of grief, I believe, and so the day we were going away I could not see him to take farewell of him, were it only with the eyes. But after we had been two days on the road, on entering the posoda of a village a day's journey from this, I saw him at the inn's door, in the dress of a muleteer, and so well disguised that if I did not carry his image graven on my heart, it would have been impossible for me to recognise him. But I knew him, and I was surprised and glad. He watched me, unsuspected by my father, from whom he always hides himself when he crosses my path on the road, or in the pesaders where we halt. And, as I know what he is, and reflect that for love of me he makes this journey on foot in all this hardship, I am ready to die of sorrow, and where he sets foot there I set my eyes. I know not with what object he has come, or how he could have got away from his father, who loves him beyond measure, having no other heir, and because he deserves it, as you will perceive when you see him. And moreover, I can tell you, all that he sings is out of his own head, for I have heard them say he is a great scholar and poet. And what is more, every time I see him, or hear him sing, I tremble all over, and am terrified lest my father should recognise him and come to know of our loves. I have never spoken a word to him in my life, and for all that I love him, so that I could not live without him. This, dear Signora, is all I have to tell you about the musician, whose voice has delighted you so much. And from it alone you might easily perceive he is no muleteer but a lord of hearts and towns, as I told you already. Say no more, Donna Clara, said Dorothea at this, at the same time kissing her a thousand times over. Say no more, I tell you, but wait till day comes, 
when I trust in God to arrange this affair of yours, so that it may have the happy ending such an innocent beginning deserves. Ah, Signora, said Donna Clara, what end can be hoped for when his father is of such lofty position and so wealthy that he would think I was not fit to be even a servant to his son, much less wife? and as to marrying without the knowledge of my father, I would not do it for all the world. I would not ask anything more than that this youth should go back and leave me, perhaps with not seeing him, and the long distance we shall have to travel. The pain I suffer now may become easier. Though I dare say the remedy I propose will do me very little good. I don't know how the devil this has come about, or how this love I have for him got in. I, such a young girl, and he such a mere boy, for I very believe we are both of an age, and I am not sixteen yet, for I will be sixteen Michaelmas day next, my father says. Dorothea could not help laughing to hear how like a child Donna Clara spoke. Let us go to sleep now, Signora, said she, for the little of the night that I fancy is left to us. God will soon send us daylight, and we will set all to rights, or it will go hard with me. With this they fell asleep, and deep silence reigned all through the inn. The only persons not asleep were the landlady's daughter, and her servant, Maritornus, who, knowing the weak point of Don Quixote's humour, and that he was outside the inn mounting guard in armour and on horseback, resolved, the pair of them, to play some trick upon him, or at any rate to amuse themselves for a while by listening to his nonsense. As it so happened, there was not a window in the whole inn that looked outwards, except a hole in the wall of a straw-loft, through which they used to throw out the straw. At this hole the two demi-damsels posted themselves, and observed Don Quixote on his horse, leaning on his pike, and from time to time sending forth such deep and doleful sighs, that he seemed to pluck up his soul by the roots with each of them, and they could hear him, too, saying in a soft, tender, loving tone, O oh, my lady Dulcinea del Toboso, perfection of all beauty, summit and crown of discretion, treasure-house of grace, depository of virtue, and finally, ideal of all that is good, honourable, and delectable in this world. What is thy grace doing now? Art thou, perchance, mindful of thy enslaved knight, who, of his own free will, hath exposed himself to so great perils, and all to serve thee? Give me tidings of her, O luminary of the three faces. Perhaps, at this moment, envious of hers, thou art regarding her, either as she paces to and fro some gallery of her sumptuous palaces, or leans over some balcony, meditating how, whilst preserving her purity and greatness, she may mitigate the tortures this wretched heart of mine endures for her sake. What glory should recompense my sufferings? What repose my toil? And lastly, what death my life, and what reward my services? And thou, O oh son, Thou art now doubtless harnessing thy steeds in haste to raise betimes and come forth to see my lady. When thou seest her, I entreat of thee to salute her on my behalf. But have a care, when thou shalt see her and salute her, that thou kiss not her face, for I shall be more jealous of thee than thou wert of that light-footed ingrate that made thee sweat and run so on the plains of Thessaly, or in the banks of the Pennus for I do not exactly recollect where it was thou didst run on that occasion, in thy jealousy and love. Don Quixote had got so far in his pathetic speech, when the landlady's daughter began to signal him, saying, Senor, come over here, please. At these signals and voice, Don Quixote turned his head, and saw by the light of the moon, which then was in its full splendour, that someone was calling to him from the hole in the wall which seemed to him to be a window, and what is more, with a gilt grating as rich castles, such as he believed the inn to be, or to have. And it immediately suggested itself to his imagination that, as on the former occasion, the fair damsel, the daughter of the lady of the castle, 
overcome by love for him, was once more endeavouring to win his affections. And with this idea, not to show himself discourteous or ungrateful, he turned Rothenanti's head and approached the hole. And as he perceived the two wenches, he said, I pity you, beauteous lady, that you should have directed your thoughts of love to a quarter from whence it is impossible that such a return can be made to you, as is due to your great merit and gentle birth, for which you must not blame this unhappy knight errant, whom love renders incapable of submission to any other than her whom, the first moment his eyes beheld her, he made absolute mistress of his soul. Forgive me, noble lady, and retire to your apartment, and do not, by any further declaration of your passion, compel me to show myself more ungrateful. And if, of the love you bear me, you should find that there is anything else in my power wherein I can gratify you, provided it be not love itself, demand it of me, for I swear to you, by that sweet absent enemy of mine, to grant it this instant, though it be that you require of me a lock of Medusa's hair, which was all snakes, or even the very beams of the sun shut up in a vial. "'My mistress wants nothing of that sort, Sir Knight,' said Mary Tornes at this. "'What, then, discreet dame, is it that your mistress wants?' replied Don Quixote. "'Only one of your fair hands,' said Mary Tornes, "'to enable her to vent over it the great passion which has brought her to this loophole, "'so much to the risk of her honour, for if the lord her father had heard her, "'the last slice he would cut off would be her ear.' "'I should like to see that tried,' said Don Quixote. "'But he had better beware of that, "'if he does not want to meet the most disastrous end "'that ever father in the world met "'for having laid hands on the tender limbs of a love-stricken daughter.' "'Maritornus felt sure that Don Quixote "'would present the hand she had asked, "'and making up her mind what to do, "'she got down from the hole and went into the stable, "'where she took the halter of Sancho Panza's ass.' and in all haste returned to the hole. Just as Don Quixote had planted himself, standing on Rothenanti's saddle, in order to reach the grated window where he supposed the lovelorn damsel to be, and giving her his hand, he said, Lady, take this hand, or rather, this scourge of the evildoers of the earth. Take, I say, this hand which no other hand of woman has ever touched. "'not even hers who has complete possession of my entire body. "'I present it to you, not that you may kiss it, "'but that you may observe the contexture of the sinews, "'the close network of the muscles, "'the breadth and capacity of the veins, "'and whence you may infer what must be the strength of the arm "'that has such a hand.' "'That we shall see presently,' said Maritones, "'and making a running knot on the halter, "'she passed it over his wrist.' and coming down from the hole, tied the other end very firmly to the bolt of the door of the straw-loft. Don Quixote, feeling the roughness of the rope on his wrist, exclaimed, "'Your grace seems to be grating rather than caressing my hand. Treat it not so harshly, for it is not to blame for the offence my resolution has given you, nor is it just to wreck all your vengeance on so small a part. Remember that one who loves so well should not revenge herself so cruelly.' But there was nobody now to listen to these words of Don Quixote's. For as soon as Maritones had tied him, she and the other made off, ready to die with laughing, leaving him fastened in such a way that it was impossible for him to release himself. He was, as has been said, standing on Rothenanti, with his arm passed through the hole and his wrist tied to the bolt of the door, and in mighty fear and dread, of being left hanging by the arm if Rothanti were to stir one side or the other, so he did not dare to make the least movement. Although, from the patience and imperturbable disposition of Rothanti, he had good reason to expect that he would stand without budging for a whole century. Finding himself fast, then, and that the ladies had retired, he began to fancy that all this was done by enchantment, as on the former occasion when, in that same castle, that enchanted moor of a carrier had belaboured him. 
and he cursed in his heart his own want of sense and judgment in venturing to enter the castle again, after having come off so badly the first time, it being a settled point with knight-errants, that when they have tried an adventure and have not succeeded in it, it is a sign that it is not reserved for them but for others, and that therefore they need not try it again. Nevertheless he pulled his arm to see if he could release himself, but it had been made so fast that all his efforts were in vain. It is true he pulled it gently, lest Rothenanti should move. But, try as he might to seat himself in the saddle, he had nothing for it but to stand upright or pull his hand off. Then it was he wished for the sword of Amadis, against which no enchantment, whatever, had any power. Then he cursed his ill fortune. Then he magnified to the loss the world was sustained by his absence, while he remained there enchanted for that, he believed, was beyond all doubt. Then he once more took to thinking of his beloved Dulcinea del Toboso. Then he called to his worthy squire, Sancho Panza, who, buried in sleep, and stretched upon the pack-saddle of his ass, was oblivious at that moment of the mother that bore him. Then he called upon the sages Logandio and Alquif to come to his aid. Then he invoked his good friend Uganda, to succour him, and then, at last, morning found him in such a state of desperation and perplexity that he was bellowing like a bull, for he had no hope the day would bring any relief to his suffering, which he believed would last for ever, insomuch as he was enchanted, and of this he was convinced by seeing that raw Fanante never stirred, much or little, and he felt persuaded that he and his horse were to remain in this state, without eating or drinking or sleeping, until the malign influence of the stars was overpassed, or until some other more sage enchanter should disenchant him. But he was very much deceived in this conclusion, for daylight had hardly begun to appear, when there came up to the inn four men on horseback, well equipped and accoutred, with firelocks across their saddle bows. They called out and knocked loudly at the gate of the inn, which was still shut. On seeing which, Don Quixote, even there where he was, did not forget to act as sentinel, and said in a loud and imperious tone, Knights or squires, or whatever ye be, ye have no right to knock at the gates of this castle, for it is plain enough that they who are within are either asleep or else are not in the habit of throwing open the fortress until the sun's rays are spread over the whole surface of the earth. Withdraw to a distance, and wait till it is broad daylight, and then we shall see whether it will be proper or not to open to you. "'What the devil fortress or castle is this?' said one. "'To make us stand on such ceremony? If you are the innkeeper, bid them open to us. We are travellers, who only want to feed our horses and go on, for we are in haste.' "'Do you think, gentlemen, that I look like an innkeeper?' said Don Quixote. "'I don't know what you look like,' replied the other. "'But I know that you are talking nonsense when you call this inn a castle.' "'A castle it is,' returned Don Quixote. "'Nay, more. One of the best in this whole province. "'And it has within it people who have had the sceptre in their hand and the crown on their head.' "'It would be better if it were the other way,' said the traveller the sceptre on the head, and the crown in the hand. But, if so, maybe there is within some company of players, with whom it is a common thing to have these crowns and sceptres you speak of, for in such a small inn as this, and where such silence is kept, I do not believe any people entitled to crowns and sceptres could have taken up their quarters. You know but little of the world, returned Don Quixote, since you are ignorant of what commonly occurs in knight errantry. But the comrades of the spokesman, growing weary of the dialogue with Don Quixote, renewed their knocks with great vehemence. So much so that the host, and not only he, but everybody in the inn, awoke, and he got up to ask who knocked. It happened at this moment that one of the horses of the four who were seeking admittance went to smell Rothenanti, 
who, melancholy, dejected, and with drooping ears stood motionless, supporting his sorely stretched master. And as he was, after all flesh, though he looked as if he were made of wood, he could not help giving way, and in return smelling the one who had come to offer him attentions. But he had hardly moved at all, when Don Quixote lost his footing, and slipping off the saddle he would have come to the ground, but for being suspended by the arm, which caused him such agony that he believed either his wrist would be cut through, or his arm torn off, and he hung so near the ground that he could just touch it with his feet, which was all the worse for him, for, finding how little was wanted to enable him to plant his feet firmly, he struggled and stretched himself as much as he could to gain a footing, just like those who undergo the torture of the strapado, when they are fixed at touch and no touch, who aggravate their own sufferings by their violent efforts to stretch themselves, deceived by the hope which makes them fancy that with a very little more they will reach the ground. End of part 15 Chapters 42 and 43This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. Don Quixote, Volume 1. By Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Translated by John Normsby. Part 15. Chapters 44 and 45. Chapter 44 in which are continued the unheard-of adventures of the inn. So loud, in fact, were the shouts of Don Quixote, that the landlord, opening the gate of the inn in all haste, came out in dismay, and ran to see who was uttering such cries, and those who were outside joined him. Maritornes, who had been by this time roused up by the same outcry, suspecting what it was, ran to the loft, and, without any one seeing her, untied the halter by which Don Quixote was suspended, and down he came to the ground, in the sight of the landlord and the travellers, who, approaching, asked him what was the matter with him that he shouted so. He, without replying a word, took the rope off his wrist, and rising to his feet, leaped upon Rothanati, braced his buckler on his arm, put his lance in rest, and made a considerable circuit of the plain, came back at a half-gallop, exclaiming, "'Whoever shall say that I have been enchanted with just cause, provided my lady the princess, Miko Mikona, grant me permission to do so, I give him the lie, challenge him, and defy him to single combat.' The newly arrived travellers were amazed at the words of Don Quixote, but the landlord removed their surprise, by telling them who he was, and not to mind him as he was out of his senses. They then asked the landlord if, by any chance, a youth of about fifteen years of age had come to that inn, one dressed like a muleteer, and of such and such an appearance, describing that of Donna Clara's lover. The landlord replied that there were so many people in the inn, he had not noticed the person they were inquiring for. But one of them, observing the coach in which the judge had come, said, "'He is here, no doubt, for this is the coach he is following. Let one of us stay at the gate, and the rest go in to look for him. Or indeed it would be as well if one of us went round the inn, lest he should escape over the wall of the yard.' "'So be it,' said another. And while two of them went in, one remained at the gate, and the other made the circuit of the inn." observing all which, the landlord was unable to conjecture for what reason they were taking all these precautions, though he understood they were looking for the youth whose description they had given him. It was by this time broad daylight, and for that reason, as well as in consequence of the noise Don Quixote had made, everybody was awake and up, but particularly Donna Clara and Dorothea, for they had been able to sleep but badly that night the one from agitation at having her lover so near her, 
the other from curiosity to see him. Don Quixote, when he saw that not one of the four travellers took any notice of him, or replied to his challenge, was furious and ready to die with indignation and wrath. And if he could have found in the ordinances of chivalry that it was lawful for a knight-errant to undertake or engage in another enterprise, when he had plighted his word and faith not to involve himself in any until he had made an end of the one to which he was pledged, he would have attacked the whole of them, and would have made them return an answer in spite of themselves. But, considering that it would not become him, nor be right, to begin any new enterprise until he had established Microma Connor in her kingdom, he was constrained to hold his peace, and wait quietly to see what would be the upshot of the proceedings of these same travellers, one of whom found the youth they were seeking lying asleep by the side of a muleteer, without a thought of any one coming in search of him, much less finding him. The man laid hold of him by the arm, saying, "'It becomes you well indeed, Senor Don Luis, to be in the dress you wear, and well the bed in which I find you agrees with the luxury in which your mother reared you.' The youth rubbed his sleepy eyes, and stared for a while at him who held him, but presently recognised him as one of his father's servants, at which he was so taken aback that for some time he could not find or utter a word, while the servant went on to say, "'There is nothing for it now, Senor Don Luis, but to submit quietly and return home, unless it is your wish that my lord, your father, should take his departure for the other world, for nothing else can be the consequence of the grief he is in at your absence.' "'But how did my father know that I had gone this road, and in this dress?' said Don Luis. "'It was a student to whom you confided your intentions,' answered the servant, "'that disclosed them, touched with pity at the distress he saw your father in on missing you. "'He therefore dispatched four of his servants in quest of you, "'and here we all are at your service, "'better pleased than you can imagine that we shall return so soon, "'and be able to restore you to those eyes that so yearn for you.' "'That shall be as I please, or as heaven orders,' returned Don Luis. "'What can you please, or heaven order?' said the other. "'Except agree to go back. Anything else is impossible.' All this conversation between the two was overheard by the muleteer, at whose side Don Luis lay, and rising he went to report what had taken place to Don Fernando, Cardinio, and the others, who had by this time dressed themselves.' and told them how the man had addressed the youth as Don, and what words had passed, and how he wanted him to return to his father, which the youth was unwilling to do. With this, and what they already knew of the rare voice that heaven had bestowed upon him, they all felt very anxious to know more, particularly who he was, and even to help him if it was attempted to employ force against him. So they hastened to where he was still talking and arguing with his servant, Dorothea at this instant came out of her room, followed by Donna Clara, all in a tremor. And calling Cardinio aside, she told him in a few words the story of the musician and Donna Clara. And he, at the same time, told her what had happened, how his father's servants had come in search of him. But in telling her so, he did not speak low enough, but that Donna Clara heard what he said, at which she was so much agitated that had not Dorothea hastened to support her, she would have fallen to the ground. Cardinio then bade Dorothea return to her room, as he would endeavour to make the whole matter right, and they did as he desired. All the four who had come in quest of Don Luis had now come into the inn, and surrounded him, urging him to return and console his father at once and without a moment's delay. He replied that he could not do so on any account, until he had concluded some business in which his life, honour, and heart were at stake. The servants pressed him, saying that most certainly they would not return without him, and that they would take him away whether he liked it or not. "'You shall not do that,' replied Don Luis, "'unless you take me dead, though, however you take me, 
"'It will be without life.' "'By this time most of those in the inn "'had been attracted by the dispute, "'but particularly Cardinio, Don Fernando, his companions, "'the judge, the curate, the barber, and Don Quixote. "'For he now considered there was no necessity "'for mounting guard over the castle any longer. "'Cardinio, being already acquainted with the young man's story, "'asked the men who wanted to take him away, "'what object they had in seeking to carry off this youth against his will. "'Our object,' said one of the four, "'is to save the life of his father, "'who is in danger of losing it through this gentleman's disappearance.' "'Upon this Don Luis exclaimed, "'There is no need to make my affairs public here. "'I am free, and I will return if I please. "'And if not, none of you shall compel me.' "'Reasons will compel your worship,' said the man, "'and if it has no power over you, it has power over us, "'to make us do what we came for, and what it is our duty to do. "'Let us hear what the whole affair is about,' said the judge at this. "'But the man, who knew him as a neighbour of theirs, replied, "'Do you not know this gentleman, Senor Judge? "'He is the son of your neighbour, who has run away from his father's house "'in a dress so unbecoming his rank.' "'as your worship may perceive.' "'The judge, on this, looked at him more carefully, "'and recognised him, and embracing him, said, "'What folly is this, Senor Don Luis? "'Or what can have been the cause "'that could have induced you to come here in this way, "'and in this dress, which so ill becomes your condition?' "'Tears came into the eyes of the young man, "'and he was unable to utter a word in reply to the judge, "'who told the four servants not to be uneasy.' "'for all would be satisfactory settled. "'And then, taking Don Lewis by the hand, "'he drew him aside and asked the reason of his having come there. "'But while he was questioning him, "'they heard a loud outcry at the gate of the inn, "'the cause of which was that two of the guests "'who had passed the night there, "'seeing everybody busy about finding out "'what it was the four men wanted, "'had conceived the idea of going off "'without paying what they owed.' But the landlord, who minded his own affairs more than other people's, caught them going out of the gate, and demanded his reckoning, abusing them for their dishonesty, with such language that he drove them to reply with their fists. And so they began to lay on him in such a style that the poor man was forced to cry out and call for help. The landlady and her daughter could see no one more free to give aid than Don Quixote, and to him the daughter said, "'Sir Knight, by the virtue God has given you, help my poor father, "'for two wicked men are beating him to a mummy.' "'To which Don Quixote, very deliberately and phlegmatically, replied, "'Fair damsel, at the present moment your request is inopportune, "'for I am debarred from involving myself in any adventure, "'until I have brought to a happy conclusion one to which my world has pledged me. "'But that which I can do for you is what I will now mention.' "'Run, and tell your father to stand his ground as well as he can in this battle, "'and on no account to allow himself to be vanquished, "'while I go and request permission of the Princess Mikomikona "'to enable me to succour him in his distress, "'and if she grants it, rest assured I will relieve him from it.' "'Sinner that I am!' exclaimed Maritornes, who stood by. "'Before you have got your permission, my master will be in the other world.' "'Give me leave, Signora, to obtain the permission I speak of,' returned Don Quixote. "'And if I get it, it will matter very little if he is in the other world, "'for I will rescue him thence in spite of all the same world can do. "'Or, at any rate, I will give you such a revenge over those who have sent him there "'that you will be more than moderately satisfied.' "'And without saying anything more, he went and knelt before Dorothea, "'requesting a highness in knightly and errant phrase.' "'to be pleased to grant him permission to aid and succour the Castilian of the castle, "'who now stood in grievous jeopardy. "'The princess granted it graciously, "'and he at once, bracing his buckler on his arm and drawing his sword, "'hastened to the inn gate, "'where the two guests were still handling the landlord roughly. "'But as soon as he reached the spot, he stopped short and stood still. "'The Maritornis and the landlady asked him why he hesitated.' "'to help their master and husband.' "'I hesitate,' said Don Quixote, 
because it is not lawful for me to draw sword against persons of squirely condition. But call my squire Sancho to me, for this defence and vengeance are his affair and business. Thus matters stood at the inn gate, where there was a very lively exchange of fisticuffs and punches, to the sore damage of the landlord, and to the wrath of Maritones, the landlady, and her daughter, who were furious when they saw the pusillanimity of Don Quixote, and the hard treatment of their master, husband, and father was undergoing. But let us leave him there, for he will surely find someone to help him. And if not, let him suffer and hold his tongue who attempts more than his strength allows him to do. And let us go back fifty paces to see what Don Lewis said in reply to the judge, whom we left questioning him privately as to the reasons for coming on foot and so meanly dressed. To which the youth, pressing his hand in a way that showed his heart was troubled by some great sorrow, and shedding a flood of tears, made answer, Seigneur, I have no more to tell you than that from the moment when, through heaven's will and our being near neighbours, I first saw Donna Clara, your daughter, and my lady. From that instant I made her the mistress of my will. And if yours, my true lord and father, offers no impediment, this very day she shall become my wife. For her I left my father's house, and for her I assumed this disguise, to follow her whithersoever she may go, as the arrow seeks its mark, or the sailor the pole-star. She knows nothing more of my passion than what she may have learnt from having sometimes seen me from a distance, that my eyes were filled with tears. You know already, Seigneur, the wealth and noble birth of my parents, and that I am the sole heir. If this be a sufficient inducement for you to venture to make me completely happy, accept me at once as your son. For if my father, influenced by other objects of his own, should disapprove of this happiness I have sought for myself, time has more power to alter and change things than human will. With this the love-smitten youth was silent, while the judge, after hearing him, was astonished, perplexed, and surprised. As well at the manner and intelligence with which Don Lewis had confessed the secret of his heart, as at the position in which he found himself, not knowing what course to take in the matter so sudden and unexpected. All the answer, therefore, he gave him, was to bid him to make his mind easy for the present, and arrange with his servants not to take him back that day, so that there might be time to consider what was best for all parties. Don Lewis kissed his hands by force, nay, bathed them with his tears, in a way that would have touched the heart of marble, not to say that of the judge, who, as a shrewd man, had already perceived how advantageous the marriage would be to his daughter. Though, were it possible, he would have preferred that it should be brought about with the consent of the father of Don Luis, who he knew looked for a title for his son. The guests had by this time made peace with the landlord, for, by persuasion, and by Don Quixote's fair words more than by threats, they paid him what he demanded, and the servants of Don Luis were waiting for the end of the conversation with the judge, and their master's decision, when the devil, who never sleeps, contrived that the barber, for whom Don Quixote had taken Mambrino's helmet, and Sancho Panza the trappings of his ass in exchange for those of his own, should at this instant enter the inn, which, said barber, as he led his ass to the stable, "'observed Sancho Panza, engaged in repairing something or other belonging to the pack-saddle. "'And the moment he saw it, he knew it, and made bold to attack Sancho, exclaiming, "'Ho, Sir Thief, I have caught you. "'Hand over my basin and my pack-saddle, and all my trappings that you robbed me of.' "'Sancho, finding himself so unexpectedly assailed, and hearing the abuse poured upon him, "'seized the pack-saddle with one hand.' and with the other gave the barber a cuff that bathed his teeth in blood. The barber, however, was not so ready to relinquish the prize he had made in the pack saddle. On the contrary, he raised such an outcry that everyone in the inn came running, to know what the noise and quarrel meant. "'Here, in the name of the king and justice,' he cried, "'this thief and highwayman wants to kill me for trying to recover my property.' "'You lie,' said Sancho. 
I am no highwayman. It was in fair war my master Don Quixote won these spoils. Don Quixote was standing by at this time, highly pleased to see his squire's stoutness, both offensive and defensive. And from that time forth he reckoned him a man of metal, and in his heart resolved to dub him a knight on the first opportunity that presented itself. "'feeling sure that the order of chivalry would be fittingly bestowed upon him. "'In the course of the altercation, among other things, the barber said, "'Gentlemen, this pack-saddle is mine as surely as I owe God a death, "'and I know it as well as if I had given birth to it, "'and here is my ass in the stable who will not let me lie. "'Only try it, and if it does not fit him like a glove, call me a rascal. "'And what is more, the same day I was robbed of this,' They robbed me likewise of a new brass basin, never yet hand selled, that would fetch a crown any day. At this Don Quixote could not keep himself from answering, and interposing between the two, and separating them, he placed the pack saddle on the ground, to lie there in sight until the truth was established, and said, Your worships may perceive clearly and plainly the error under which this worthy squire lies. "'when he calls a basin which was, is, and shall be the helmet of Mambrino, "'which I won from him in air war, "'I made myself master of by legitimate and lawful possession. "'With the pack-saddle I do not concern myself, "'but I may tell you on that head that my squire, Sancho, "'asked my permission to strip off the caparison of this vanquished poltroon steed, "'and with it adorned his own. "'I allowed him, and he took it.' and as to having it been changed from a caparison into a pack-saddle, I can give no explanation except the usual one, that such transformations will take place in adventures of chivalry. To confirm all which, run, Sancho, my son, and fetch hither the helmet which this good fellow calls a basin. E guard, master, said Sancho, if we have no other proof of our case than that your worship puts forward, Mambrino's helmet is just as much a basin "'as this good fellow's caparison is pack-saddle. "'Do as I bid thee,' said Don Quixote. "'It cannot be that everything in this castle goes by enchantment.' "'Sancho hastened to where the basin was, "'and brought it back with him. "'And when Don Quixote saw it, he took hold of it and said, "'Your worships may see with what a face the squire can assert "'that this is a basin and not the helmet I told you of. "'And I swear by the order of chivalry I profess,' "'that this helmet is the identical one I took from him, "'without anything added to or taken from it.' "'There is no doubt of that,' said Sancho, "'for from the time my master won it until now "'he has only fought one battle in it, "'when he let loose those unlucky men in chains. "'And if it had not been for this basin helmet, "'he would not have come off over well that time, "'for there was plenty of stone-throwing in the affair. "'Chapter 45 in which the doubtful question of Membrino's helmet and the pack-saddle is finally settled, with other adventures that occurred in truth and earnest. "'What do you think now, gentlemen?' said the barber. "'Of what these gentles say, when they want to make out that this is a helmet?' "'And whoever says the contrary?' said Don Quixote. "'I will let him know he lies if he is a knight, and if he is a squire that he lies again a thousand times.' Our owner barber, who was present at this, and understood Don Quixote's humour so thoroughly, that it took into his head to back up his delusion, and carry on the joke for the general amusement. So addressing the other barber, he said, Senor Barber, or whatever you are, you must know that I belong to your profession too, and have had a license to practice for more than twenty years. "'and I know the implements of the barber-craft, "'every one of them perfectly well. "'And I was likewise a soldier from some time "'in the days of my youth. "'And I know also what a helmet is, "'and a morion, and a headpiece with a visor, "'and other things pertaining to soldiering. "'I meant to say to soldiers' arms, "'and I say, saving better opinions "'and always with submission to sounder judgments, "'that this piece we now have before us, which this worthy gentleman has in his hands, not only is no barber's basin, but it is far from being one as white is from black, and truth from falsehood. I say, moreover, that this, although it is a helmet, 
is not a complete helmet. Certainly not, said Don Quixote, for half of it is wanting, that is to say the beaver. It is quite true, said the curate, who saw the object of his friend the barber, and Cardinio, Don Fernando, and his companions agreed with him. And even the judge, if his thoughts had not been so full of Don Lewis's affair, would have helped to carry on the joke. But he was so taken up with the serious matters he had on his mind, that he paid little or no attention to these facetious proceedings. "'God bless me!' exclaimed their butt, the barber, at this. "'Is it possible that such an honourable company can say that this is not a basin but a helmet?' "'Why, this is a thing that would astonish a whole university, however wise it might be. "'That will do. "'If this basin is a helmet, why, then the pack-saddle must be a horse's capsin, as the gentleman has said.' "'To me it looks like a pack-saddle,' said Don Quixote. "'But I have already said that with that question I do not concern myself. "'As to whether it be pack-saddle or caparison,' said the curate, it is only for Signor Don Quixote to say, for in these matters of chivalry, all these gentlemen and I bow to his authority. By God, gentlemen, said Don Quixote, so many strange things have happened to me in this castle, on the two occasions on which I have sojourned in it, that I will not venture to assert anything positively in reply to any question touching anything it contains. For it is my belief that everything that goes on within it goes by enchantment. The first time, an enchanted moor that there is in it gave me sore trouble, nor did Sancho fare well among certain followers of his. And last night I was kept hanging by this arm for nearly two hours, without knowing how or why I came by such a mishap. So that now, for me to come forward to give an opinion in such a puzzling matter would be to risk a rash decision. As regards the assertion that this is a basin and not a helmet, I have already given an answer. But as to the question whether this is a pack-saddle, or a caparison, I will not venture to give a positive opinion, but will leave it to your worship's better judgment. Perhaps, as you are not dubbed knights like myself, the enchantments of this place have nothing to do with you, and your faculties are unfettered, and you can see things in this castle as they really and truly are, and not as they appear to me. There can be no question, said Don Fernando on this, but that Señor Don Quixote has spoken very wisely, and that with us rests the decision of this matter, and that we may have surer ground to go on, I will take the votes of the gentlemen in secret, and declare the result clearly and fully. To those who were in the secret of Don Quixote's humour, all this afforded great amusement. But to those who knew nothing about it, it seemed the greatest nonsense in the world, in particular to the four servants of Don Luis, as well as to Don Luis himself, and to three other travellers who had by chance come to the inn, and had the appearance of officers of the Holy Brotherhood, as indeed they were. But the one who above all was at his wit's end was the barber basin, there before his very eyes had been turned into Mambrino's helmet and whose pack-saddle he had no doubt whatever, was about to become a rich comparison for a horse. All laughed to see Don Fernando going from one to another, collecting the votes, and whispering to them to give him their private opinion, whether the treasure over which they had been so much fighting was a pack-saddle or a comparison. But after he had taken the votes of those who knew Don Quixote, he said aloud, "'The fact is, my good fellow,' that I am tired collecting such a number of opinions, for I find that there is not one of whom I ask what I desire to know, who does not tell me that it is absurd to say that this is a pack-saddle of an ass, and not the comparison of a horse, nay, of a thoroughbred horse. So you must submit, for in spite of you and your ass, this is a comparison and no pack-saddle, and you have stated and proved your case very badly. May I never share heaven, said the poor barber, if your worships are not all mistaken, and may my soul appear before God as that appears to me a pack-saddle, and not a comparison. 
But laws go, I say no more, and indeed I am not drunk, for I am fasting, except it be from sin. The simple talk of the barber did not afford less amusement than the absurdities of Don Quixote, who now observed, There is no more to be done now than for each to take what belongs to him, and to whom God has given it, may St. Peter add his blessing. But, said one of the four servants, Unless, indeed, this is a deliberate joke, I cannot bring myself to believe that men so intelligent as those presents are, or seem to be, can venture to declare and assert that this is not a basin, and that not a pack-saddle. But as I perceive that they do assert and declare it, I can only come to the conclusion that there is some mystery in this persistence in what is so opposed to the evidence of experience and truth itself. For I swear by, and here he rapped out a round oath, all the people in the world would not make me believe that that is not a barber's basin, and that a jackass's pack-saddle. It might easily be a she-ass's, observed the curate. It is all the same, said the servant. That is not the point, but whether it is or is not a pack-saddle, as your worships say. On hearing this, one of the newly arrived officers of the Brotherhood, who had been listening to this dispute and controversy, unable to restrain his anger and impatience, exclaimed, "'It is a pack-saddle, as sure as my father is my father, "'and whoever has said or will say anything else must be drunk.' "'You lie like a rascally clown,' returned Don Quixote, "'and lifting his pike, which he had never let out of his hand, "'he delivered such a blow at his head that, "'had not the officer dodged it, "'it would have stretched him at a full length. "'The pike was shivered in pieces against the ground.' and the rest of the officers, seeing their comrade assaulted, raised a shout, calling for help for the Holy Brotherhood. The landlord, who was of that fraternity, ran at once to fetch his staff of office and his sword, and ranged himself on the side of his comrades. The servants of Don Lewis clustered round him, lest he should escape from them in the confusion. The barber, seeing the house turned upside down, once more laid hold of his pack-saddle, and Sancho did the same. Don Quixote drew his sword and charged the officers. Don Luis cried out to his servants to leave him alone, and go and help Don Quixote, and Cardinio and Don Fernando, who were supporting him. The curate was shouting at the top of his voice. The landlady was screaming. Her daughter was wailing. Maritornes was weeping. Dorothea was aghast, Lucinda terror-stricken, and Donna Clara in a faint. The barber cudgelled Sancho, and Sancho pummeled the barber. Don Luis gave one of his servants, who ventured to catch him by the arm to keep him from escaping, a cuff that bathed his teeth in blood. The judge took his part. Don Fernando had got one of the officers down, and was belabouring him heartily. The landlord raised his voice again, calling for help for the Holy Brotherhood, so that the whole inn was nothing but cries, shouts, shrieks, confusion, terror, dismay, mishaps, sword-cuts, fisticuffs, cudgelings, kicks, and bloodshed. And, in the midst of all this chaos, complication, and general entanglement, Don Quixote took it into his head that he had been plunged into the thick of the discord at Agramont's camp. And, in a voice that shook the inn like thunder, he cried out, Hold all, let all sheath their swords. Let all be calm and attend to me as they value thy lives. All paused at his mighty voice, and he went on to say, Did I not tell you, sirs, that this castle was enchanted, and that a legion or so of devils dwelt in it? In proof whereof I call upon you to behold with your very eyes how the discord of Agramont's camp has come hither, and been transferred into the midst of us. See how they fight, there for the sword, here for the horse, on that side for the eagle, on this for the helmet. We are all fighting, and all at cross-purposes. Come then, you, Senor Judge, and you, Senor Curate. Let the one represent King Agramont, and the other King Sobrino, and make peace among us. 
for, by God Almighty, it is a sorry business that so many persons of quality as we are should slay one another for such trifling cause. The officers, who did not understand Don Quixote's mode of speaking, and found themselves roughly handled by Don Fernando, Cardenio, and their companions, were not to be appeased. The barber was, however, for both his beard and his pack-saddle were the worse for the struggle. Sancho, like a good servant, obeyed the slightest word of his master, while the four servants of Don Luis kept quiet when they saw how little they gained by not being so. The landlord alone insisted upon it, that they must punish the insolence of this madman, who, at every turn, raised a disturbance in the inn. But, at length, the uproar was stilled for the present, the pack saddle remained a caparison to the day of judgment, and the basin a helmet, and the inn a castle in Don Quixote's imagination. All having been now pacified and made friends by the persuasion of the judge and the curate, the servants of Don Lewis began again to urge him to return with them at once. And while he was discussing the matter with them, the judge took counsel with Don Fernando, Cardenio, and the curate, as to what he ought to do in the case, telling them how it stood, and what Don Lewis had said to him. It was agreed, at length, that Don Fernando should tell the servants of Don Lewis who he was, and that it was his desire that Don Lewis should accompany him to Andalusa, where he would receive from the Marquis his brother the welcome his quality entitled him to, for otherwise it was easy to see from the determination of Don Lewis that he would not return to his father at present, though they tore him to pieces. On learning the rank of Don Fernando, and the resolution of Don Luis, the four then settled it between themselves, that three of them should return to tell his father how matters stood, and that the other should remain to wait upon Don Luis, and not to leave him until they came back for him, or his father's orders were known. Thus, by the authority of Agramant, and the wisdom of King Sobrino, all this complication of dispute was arranged, but the enemy of concord and hater of peace, feeling himself slighted and made a fool of, and seeing how little he had gained after having involved them all in such an elaborate entanglement, resolved to try his hand once more by stirring up fresh quarrels and disturbances. It came about in this way. The officers were pacified on learning the rank of those whom they had been engaged, and withdrew from the contest considering that whatever the result might be, they were likely to get the worst of the battle. But one of them, the one who had been thrashed and kicked by Don Fernando, recollected that among some warrants he carried for the arrest of certain delinquents, he had one against Don Quixote, whom the Holy Brotherhood had ordered to be arrested for setting the galley slaves free, as Sancho had, with very good reason, apprehended. Suspecting how it was then, he wished to satisfy himself as to whether Don Quixote's features corresponded. And taking a parchment out of his bosom, he lit upon what he was in search of, and setting himself to read it deliberately, for he was not a quick reader. As he made out each word, he fixed his eyes on Don Quixote, and went on comparing the description in the warrant with his face and discovered that beyond all doubt he was the person described in it. As soon as he had satisfied himself, folding up the parchment, he took the warrant in his left hand, and with his right seized Don Quixote by the collar, so tightly that he did not allow him to breathe, and shouted aloud, Help for the Holy Brotherhood, and that you may see I demand it in earnest, read this warrant, which says this highwayman is to be arrested. The curate took the warrant, and saw that what the officer said was true, and that it agreed with Don Quixote's appearance, who, on his part, when he found himself roughly handled by this rascally clown, worked up to the highest pitch of wrath, and all his joints creaking with rage, with both hands seized the officer by the throat with all his might, so that, had he not been helped by his comrades, 
he would have yielded up his life ere Don Quixote released his hold. The landlord, who had perforce to support his brother officers, ran at once to aid them. The landlady, when she saw her husband engaged in a fresh quarrel, lifted up her voice afresh, and its note was immediately caught up by Maritonis and her daughter, calling upon heaven and all present for help. And Sancho, seeing what was going on, exclaimed, "'By the Lord, it is quite true what my master says about the enchantments of this castle, "'for it is impossible to live an hour in peace in it.' "'Don Fernando parted the officer and Don Quixote, "'and to their mutual contentment made them relax the grips by which they held. "'The one the coat-collar, the other the throat of his adversary. "'For all this, however, the officers did not cease to demand their prisoner "'and call on them to help.' and deliver him overbound into their power, as was required for the service of the king and of the Holy Brotherhood, on whose behalf they again demanded aid and assistance, to effect the capture of this robber and footpad of the highways. Don Quixote smiled when he heard these words, and said very calmly, Come now, base, ill-born brood. Call ye it highway robbery, to give freedom to those in bondage, to release the captives, to succour the miserable, to raise up the fallen, to relieve the needy, infamous beings, who, by your vile grovelling intellects, deserve that heaven should not make known to you the virtue that lies in knight errantry, or show you the sin and ignorance in which ye lie, when you refuse to respect the shadow, not to say the presence, of any knight errant. Come now, band, not of officers, but of thieves, footpads with the licence of the Holy Brotherhood, "'Tell me, who is the ignoramus who signed a warrant of arrest against such a knight as I am? "'Who was he that he did not know that knight-errants are independent of all jurisdictions? "'That their law is their sword, their charge their prowess, and their edicts their will? "'Who, I say again, was the fool that knows not that there are no letters patent of nobility "'that confer such privileges or exemptions as a knight-errant acquires the day he is dubbed a knight?' "'and devotes himself to the arduous calling of chivalry. "'What knight-errant ever paid poll-tax, duty, "'queen's pin-money, king's dues, toll, or ferry? "'What tailor ever took payment of him for making his clothes? "'What Castilian that received him in his castle "'ever made him pay his shot? "'What king did not set him at his table? "'What damsel was not enamoured of him, "'and did not yield herself up wholly to his will and pleasure? "'And lastly... What knight-errant has there been, is there, or will there ever be in the world, not bold enough to give, single-handed, four hundred cudgelings to four hundred officers of the Holy Brotherhood, if they came in his way? End of Part 15 Chapters 44 and 45This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. Don Quixote, Volume 1. By Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Translated by John Ormsby. Part 15, Chapter 46. Of the end of the notable adventure of the officers of the Holy Brotherhood and of the great ferocity of our worthy knight, Don Quixote. While Don Quixote was talking in this strain, the curate was endeavouring to persuade the officers that he was out of his senses, as they might perceive by his deeds and his words, and that they need not press the matter any further. For even if they arrested him and carried him off, they would have to release him by and by as a madman. "'to which the holder of the warrant replied "'that he had nothing to do with inquiring into Don Quixote's madness, "'but only to execute his superior's orders, "'and that, once taken, they might let him go three hundred times if they liked. "'For all that,' said the curate, "'you must not take him away this time, "'nor will he, it is my opinion, let himself be taken away.' "'In short, the curate used such arguments,' and Don Quixote did such mad things, 
that the officers would have been more mad than he was, if they had not perceived his want of wits. And so they thought it best to allow themselves to be pacified, and even to act as peacemakers between the barber and Sancho Panza, who still continued their altercation with much bitterness. In the end, they, as officers of justice, settled the question by arbitration in such a manner that both sides were, if not perfectly contented, at least to some extent satisfied. For they changed the pack saddles, but not the girths or headstalls. And as to Mambrino's helmet, the curate, under the rose, and without Don Quixote's knowing it, paid eight reals for the basin, and the barber executed a full receipt and engagement to make no further demand then or thenceforth for evermore. Amen. These two disputes, which were the most important and gravest, being settled, it only remained for the servants of Don Luis to consent that three of them should return while one was left to accompany him whither Don Fernando desired to take him. And good luck and better fortune, having already begun to solve difficulties and remove obstacles in favour of the lovers and warriors of the inn, were pleased to preserve and bring everything to a happy issue. But the servants agreed to do as Don Luis wished, which gave Donna Clara such happiness that no one could have looked into her face just then without seeing the joy of her heart. Zoraida, though she did not fully comprehend all she saw, was grave or gay without knowing why, as she watched and studied the various countenances, but particularly her Spaniards, whom she followed with her eyes and clung to with her soul. The gift and compensation which the curate gave the barber had not escaped the landlord's notice and he demanded Don Quixote's reckoning, together with the amount of the damage to his wine-skins and the loss of his wine, swearing that neither Rothanante nor Sancho's ass should leave the inn until he had been paid to the very last farthing. The curate settled all amicably, and Don Fernando paid, though the judge had also very readily offered to pay the score, and all became so peaceful and quiet that the inn no longer reminded one of the discord of Agramante's camp, as Don Quixote said, but of the peace and tranquillity of the days of Octavianus. For all which it was the universal opinion, that their thanks were due to the great zeal and eloquence of the curate, and to the unexampled generosity of Don Fernando. Finding himself now clear and quit of all quarrels, his squires as well as his own, Don Quixote considered that it would be advisable to continue the journey he had begun, and bring to a close that great adventure for which he had been called and chosen. And with this high resolve he went and knelt before Dorothea, who, however, would not allow him to utter a word until he had risen. So to obey her he rose and said, "'It is a common proverb, fair lady, that diligence is the mother of good fortune.' and experience has often shown in important affairs that the earnestness of a negotiator brings the doubtful case to a successful termination. But in nothing does this truth show itself more plainly than in war, where quickness and activity forestall the devices of the enemy, and win the victory before the foe has time to defend himself. All this, I say, exalted and esteemed lady, "'because it seems to me that for us to remain any longer in this castle "'now is useless, "'and may be injurious to us in a way that we shall find out some day, "'for who knows but that your enemy the giant may have learned by means "'of secret and diligent spies that I am going to destroy him. "'And if the opportunity be given him, "'he may seize it to fortify himself in some impregnable castle or stronghold.' against which all my efforts and the might of my indefatigable army may avail but little. Therefore, lady, let us, as I say, forestall his schemes by our activity, and let us depart at once in quest of fair fortune. For your highness is only kept from enjoying it as fully as you could desire, by my delay in encountering your adversary. Don Quixote held his peace, and said no more calmly awaiting the response of the beauteous princess, 
who, with commanding dignity, and in a style adopted to Don Quixote's own, replied to him in these words, I give you thanks, sir knight, for the eagerness you, like a good knight, to whom it is a natural obligation to succour the orphan and the needy, display to afford me aid in my sore trouble, and heaven grant that your wishes and mine may be realised, so that you may see that there are women in this world capable of gratitude. As to my departure, let it be forthwith, for I have no will but yours. Dispose of me entirely in accordance with your good pleasure, for she, who has once entrusted to you the defence of her person, and placed in your hands the recovery of her dominions, must not think of offering opposition to that which your wisdom may ordain. On then, in God's name, said Don Quixote, for when a lady humbles herself to me, I will not lose the opportunity of raising her up, and placing her on the throne of her ancestors. Let us depart at once, for the common saying that in delay there is danger, lends spurs to my eagerness to take the road, and as neither heaven has created, nor hell seen any that can daunt or intimidate me, saddle Rothanante, Sancho, and get ready thy ass and the queen's palfrey, and let us take leave of the Castilian and these gentlemen, and go hence this very instant. Sancho, who was standing by all this time, said, shaking his head, Ah, master, master, there is more mischief in the village than one hears of, begging all good body's pardon. What mischief can there be in any village, or in all the cities of the world, you booby, that can hurt my reputation? said Don Quixote. Your worship is angry, replied Sancho. I will hold my tongue, and will leave unsaid what as a good squire I am bound to say, and what a good servant should tell his master. Say what thou wilt, returned Don Quixote, provided thy words be not meant to work upon my fears. For thou, if thou fearest, art behaving like thyself, but I like myself in not fearing. It is nothing of the sort, as I am a sinner before God, said Sancho, but that I take it to be sure and certain, that this lady, who calls herself queen of the great kingdom of Micromicon, is no more so than my mother, for, if she was what she says, she would not go rubbing noses with one that is here every instant and behind every door. Dorothea turned red at Sancho's words, for the truth was that her husband, Don Fernando, had now and then, when the others were not looking, gathered from her lips some of the reward his love had earned, and Sancho, seeing this, had considered that such freedom was more like a courtesan than a queen of a great kingdom. She, however, being unable, or not caring to answer him, allowed him to proceed, and he continued, This, I say, seigneur, because if after we have travelled roads and highways, and passed bad nights and worse days, one who is now enjoying himself in this inn is to reap the fruit of our labours. There is no need for me to be in a hurry to saddle Rothanante, put the pad on the ass, or get ready the palfrey, for it will be better for us to stay quiet, and let every jade mind her spinning, and let us go to dinner. Good God, what was the indignation of Don Quixote, when he heard the audacious words of his squire? So great was it, that in a voice inarticulate with rage, with a stammering tongue, and eyes that flashed living fire, he exclaimed, Rascally clown, boorish, insolent, and ignorant, ill-spoken, foul-mouthed, impudent, backbiter, and slanderer. Hast thou dared to utter such words in my present, and in that of these illustrious ladies? Hast thou dared to harbour such gross and shameless thoughts in thy muddled imagination? Be gone from my presence, thou born monster, storehouse of lies, hoard of untruths, garner of knaveries, inventor of scandals, publisher of absurdities, enemy of the respect due to royal personages. Be gone, Show thyself no more before me under pain of my wrath. And so saying, he knitted his brows, puffed out his cheeks, gazed around him, and stomped on the ground violently with his right foot, showing in every way the rage that was pent up in his heart. And at his words and furious gestures, Sancho was so scared and terrified that he would have been glad if the earth had opened up that instant and swallowed him and his only thought was to turn round and make his escape from the angry presence of his master. But the ready-witted Dorothea, who by this time so well understood Don Quixote's humour, said, to mollify his wrath, Be not irritate at the absurdities your good squire has uttered, Sir Knight of the Rueful Countenance, 
for perhaps he did not utter them without cause. And from his good sense and Christian conscience, it is not likely that he would bear false witness against any one. We may therefore believe, without any hesitation, that since, as you say, Sir Knight, everything in this castle goes and is brought about by means of enchantment, Sancho, I say, may possibly have seen, through this diabolical medium, what he says he saw, so much to the detriment of my modesty. "'I swear by God omnipotent,' exclaimed Don Quixote at this, "'your highness has hit the point, and that some vile illusion must have come before this sinner of a Sancho, that made him see what it would have been impossible to see by any other means than enchantments. For I know well enough, from the poor fellow's goodness and harmlessness, that he is incapable of bearing false witness against anybody.' "'True, no doubt,' said Don Fernando. "'For which reason, Senor Don Quixote, you ought to forgive him, "'and restore him to the bosom of your favour. "'Sicut irat in principio, "'before illusions of this sort had taken away his senses.' "'Don Quixote said he was ready to pardon him, "'and the curate went for Sancho, "'who came in very humbly, "'and falling on his knees begged for the hand of his master, "'who, having presented it to him and allowed him to kiss it, gave him his blessing, and said, "'Now, Sancho, my son, thou wilt be convinced of the truth, of which I have many time told thee, that everything in this castle is done by means of enchantment.' "'So it is, I believe,' said Sancho, "'except the affair of the blanket, which came to pass in reality by ordinary means.' "'Believe it not,' said Don Quixote, "'for had it been so, I would have avenged thee that instant, or even now. But neither there nor now could I.' nor have I seen any one upon whom to avenge thy wrong. They were all eager to know what the affair of the blanket was, and the landlord gave them a minute account of Sancho's flights, at which they laughed not a little, and at which Sancho would be no less out of countenance, had not his master once more assured him it was all enchantment. For all that his simplicity never reached so high a pitch that he could persuade himself it was not the plain and simple truth, without any deception whatever about it. That he had been blanketed by beings of flesh and blood, and not by visionary and imaginary phantoms, as his master believed and protested. The illustrious company had now been two days in the inn, and as it seemed to them time to depart, they devised a plan so that, without giving Dorothea and Don Fernando the trouble of going back with Don Quixote, to his village, under pretense of restoring Queen Macomicona, the curate and the barber might carry him away with them as they proposed, and the curate be able to take his madness in hand at home. And in pursuance of their plan, they arranged with the owner of an ox-cart, who happened to be passing that way, to carry him after this fashion. They constructed a kind of cage with wooden bars, large enough to hold Don Quixote comfortably, and then Don Fernando and his companions, the servants of Don Luis, and the officers of the Brotherhood, together with the landlord, by the directions and advice of the curate, covered their faces and disguised themselves, some in one way, some in another, so as to appear to Don Quixote quite different from the persons he had seen in the castle. This done, in profound silence they entered the room where he was asleep, "'taking his rest after the past phrase, "'and advancing to where he was sleeping tranquilly, "'not dreaming of anything of the kind happening, "'they seized him firmly and bound him fast, hand and foot, "'so that, when he awoke startled, he was unable to move, "'and could only marvel and wonder at the strange figures he saw before him, "'upon which he at once gave way to the idea "'which his crazed fancy invariably conjured up before him, and took it into his head that all these shapes were phantoms of the enchanted castle, and that he himself was unquestionably enchanted, as he could neither move nor help himself. Precisely what the curate, the concocter of the scheme, expected would happen. Of all that were there, Sancho was the only one who was at once in his senses, and in his own proper character. And he though he was within very little of sharing his master's infirmity, did not fail to perceive who all these disguised figures were. But he did not dare to open his lips until he saw what came of this assault and capture of his master. 
nor did the latter utter a word, waiting to the upshot of his mishap, which was that bringing in the cage, they shut him up in it, and nailed the bars so firmly that they could not be easily burst open. Then they took him on their shoulders, and as they passed out of the room an awful voice, as much so as the barber, not he of the pack-saddle, but the other, was able to make it, was heard to say, O knight of the rueful countenance, let not this captivity in which thou art placed afflict thee, for this must needs be, for the more speedy accomplishment of the adventure in which thy great heart has engaged thee, the which shall be accomplished with the raging manchigan lion, and the white de bose and dove shall be linked together, having first humbled their haughty necks to the gentle yoke of matrimony. And from this marvellous union shall come forth to light of the world, brave whelps that shall rival the ravening claws of their valiant father. And this shall come to pass, ere the pursuer of the flying nymph shall, in his swift natural course, have twice visited the starry signs. And thou, O most noble and obedient squire, that ever bore sword at side, beard and face, or nose to smell with, be not dismayed or grieved to see the flower of night errantry carried away thus before thy very eyes. For soon, if it so please the framer of the universe, thou shalt see thyself exalted to such a height that thou shalt not know thyself, and the promises which thy good master has made thee shall not prove false. And I assure thee, on the authority of the sage Mentoronian, that thy wages shall be paid thee, as thou shalt see in due season. Follow then the footsteps of the valiant enchanted knight, for it is expedient that thou should go to the destination assigned to both of you. And as it is not permitted to me to say more, God be with thee, for I return to the place I wot of. And as he brought the prophecy to a close, he raised his voice to a high pitch, and then lowered it to a soft tone, that even those who knew it was all a joke were almost inclined to take what they had heard seriously. Don Quixote was comforted by the prophecy he heard, for he at once comprehended its meaning perfectly, and perceived it was promised to him that he should see himself united in holy and lawful matrimony with his beloved Dulcinea del Toboso, from whose blessed womb should produce the whelps, his sons, to the eternal glory of La Mancha. And, being thoroughly and firmly persuaded of this, he lifted up his voice, and with a deep sigh exclaimed, O thou, whoever thou art, who hast foretold me so much good, I implore of thee, that on my part, thou entreat that sage enchanter, who takes charge of my interests, that he leave me not to perish in this captivity, in which they are now carrying me away, ere I see fulfilled promises so joyful and incomparable, as those which have been now made me. For, let this but come to pass, and I shall glory in the pains of my prison, find comfort in these chains wherewith they bind me, and regard this bed whereon they stretch me, not as a hard battlefield, but as a soft and happy nuptial couch. And touching the constellation of Sancho Panza, my squire, I rely upon his goodness and rectitude, that he will not desert me in good or evil fortune. For if, by his ill luck or mine, it may not happen to be in my power to give him the island I had promised, or any equivalent for it, at least his wages shall not be lost. For in my will, which is already made, I have declared the sum that shall be paid to him, measured not by his many faithful services, but by the means at my disposal. Sancho bowed his head very respectfully, and kissed both his hands, for, being tied together, he could not kiss one and then the apparitions lifted the cage upon their shoulders, and fixed it upon the ox-cart. End of Part 15, Chapter 46 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andy Minter Don Quixote, Volume 1 
by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Translated by John Ormsby. Part 16. Chapters 47 to 49. Chapter 47. Of the strange manner in which Don Quixote of La Mancha was carried away enchanted, together with other remarkable incidents. When Don Quixote saw himself caged and hoisted on the cart in this way, he said, "'Many grave histories of knights errant have I read, but never yet have I read, seen, or heard of their carrying off enchanted knights errant in this fashion, or at the slow pace that these lazy, sluggish animals promise. For they always take them away through the air with marvellous swiftness, enveloped in a dark, thick cloud, or on a chariot of fire, or it may be on some hippogriff or other beast of the kind. But to carry me off like this, on an ox-cart, by God it puzzles me. But perhaps the chivalry and enchantments of our day take a different course from that of those in days gone by, and it may be, too, that as I am a new knight in the world, and the first to revive the already forgotten calling of knight adventurers, they may have newly invented other kinds of enchantments and other modes of carrying off the enchanted. What thinkest thou of the matter, Sancho, my son? I don't know what to think, answered Sancho, not being as well read as your worship in errant writings. But for all that, I venture to say and swear that these apparitions that are about us are not quite Catholic. Catholic? said Don Quixote. Father of me, how can they be Catholic when they are all devils that have taken fantastic shapes to come and do this, and bring me to this condition? And if thou wouldst prove it, touch them and feel them, and thou wilt find they have only bodies of air, and no consistency except in appearance. My God, master, returned Sancho, I have touched them already, and that devil that goes about there so busily has firm flesh, and another property very different from what I have heard say devils have, for by all accounts they all smell of brimstone and other bad smells. "'But this one smells of amber, half a league off.' Sancho was here speaking of Don Fernando, who, like a gentleman of his rank, was very likely perfumed, as Sancho said. "'Marvel not at that, Sancho, my friend,' said Don Quixote, "'for let me tell thee, devils are crafty, and even if they do carry odours about with them, they themselves have no smell, because they are spirits.' or if they have any smell, they cannot smell of anything sweet, but of something foul and fetid. And the reason is, that as they carry hell with them wherever they go, and can get no ease whatever from their torments, and as a sweet smell is a thing that gives pleasure and enjoyment, it is impossible that they can smell sweet. If then this devil thou speakest of seems to thee to smell of amber, either thou art deceiving thyself, or he wants to deceive thee by making thee fancy he is not a devil. Such was the conversation that passed between master and man, and Don Fernando and Cardenio, apprehensive of Sancho's making a complete discovery of their scheme, towards which he had already gone some way, resolved to hasten their departure, and calling the landlord aside, they directed him to saddle Rosinante and put the pack-saddle on Sancho's ass, which he did with great alacrity. In the meantime, the curate had made an arrangement with the officers that they should bear them company as far as his village, he paying them so much a day. Cardenio hung the buckler on one side of the bow of Rocinante's saddle, and the basin on the other, and by signs commanded Sancho to mount his ass and take Rocinante's bridle, and at each side of the cart he placed two officers with their muskets, but before the cart was put in motion, out came the landlady and her daughter and Maritones to bid Don Quixote farewell, pretending to weep with grief at his misfortune. And to them Don Quixote said, Weep not, good ladies, for all these mishaps are the lot of those who follow the profession I profess. 
and if these reverses did not befall me, I should not esteem myself a famous knight-errant, for such things never happen to knights of little renown and fame, because nobody in the world thinks about them. To valiant knights they do, for these are envied for their virtue and valour by many princes, and other knights who compass the destruction of the worthy by base means. Nevertheless, virtue is of herself so mighty, that in spite of all the magic that Zoroaster, its first inventor, knew, she will come victorious out of every trial, and shed her light upon the earth as the sun does upon the heavens. Forgive me, fair ladies, if through inadvertence I have in aught offended you, for intentionally and wittingly I have never done so to any, and pray to God that he deliver me from this captivity to which some malevolent enchanter has consigned me, and should I find myself released therefrom, the favours that ye have bestowed upon me in this castle shall be held in memory by me, that I may acknowledge, recognise, and requite them as they deserve. While this was passing between the ladies of the castle and Don Quixote, the curate and the barber bade farewell to Don Fernando and his companions, to the captain, his brother, and the ladies, now all made happy, and in particular to Dorothea and Lucinda. They all embraced one another, and promised to let each other know how things went with them, and Don Fernando directed the curate where to write to him, to tell him what became of Don Quixote, assuring him that there was nothing that could give him more pleasure than to hear of it, and that he too, on his part, would send him word of everything he thought he would like to know, about his marriage, Zoreda's baptism, Don Luis's affair, and Lucinda's return to her home. The curate promised to comply with his request carefully, and they embraced once more and renewed their promises. The landlord approached the curate, and handed him some papers, saying that he had discovered them in the lining of the valise in which the novel of The Ill-Advised Curiosity had been found, and that he might take them all away the with him as their owner had not since returned, for, as he could not read, he did not want them himself. The curate thanked him, and opening them he saw at the beginning of the manuscript the words, Novel of Rishonete and Cortadillo by which he perceived that it was a novel, and as that of The Ill-Advised Curiosity had been good, he concluded that this would be so too, as they were both probably by the same author. So he kept it, intending to read it when he had an opportunity. He then mounted, and his friend the barber did the same, both masked, so as not to be recognised by Don Quixote, and set out following in the rear of the cart. The order of march was this— First went the cart, with the owner leading it. At each side of it marched the officers of the Brotherhood, as has been said, with their muskets. Then followed Sancho Panza on his ass, leading Rocinante by the bridle, and behind all came the curate and the barber on their mighty mules, with faces covered, as aforesaid, and a grave and serious air measuring their pace to suit the slow steps of the oxen. Don Quixote was seated in the cage, with his hands tied and his feet stretched out, leaning against the bars as silent and as patient as if he were a stone statue, and not a man of flesh. Thus, slowly and silently, they made, it might be, two leagues, until they reached a valley, which the carter thought a convenient place for resting and feeding his oxen, and he said so to the curate, but the barber was of opinion that they ought to push on a little further, as at the other side of a hill which appeared close by he knew there was a valley that had more grass and much better than the one where they proposed to halt and his advice was taken and they continued their journey just at that moment the curate looking back saw coming on behind them six or seven mounted men well found and equipped who soon overtook them for they were travelling not at the sluggish deliberate pace of oxen but like men who rode cannon's mules and in haste to take their noontide rest as soon as possible at the inn which was in sight not a league off. The quick travellers came up with the slow, and courteous salutations were exchanged, and one of the newcomers, who was in fact the canon of Toledo, and master of the others who accompanied him, observing the regular order of the procession, the cart, officers, Sancho, Rocinante, the curate, and the barber, 
and above all Don Quixote, caged and confined, could not help asking what was the meaning of carrying the man in that fashion, though from the badges of the officers he already concluded that he must be some desperate highwayman or other malefactor, whose punishment fell within the jurisdiction of the Holy Brotherhood. One of the officers, to whom he had put the question, replied, "'Let the gentleman himself tell you the meaning of his going this way, senor, for we do not know.' Don Quixote overheard the conversation, and said, "'Haply, gentlemen, you are versed and learned in matters of errant chivalry, because if you are, I will tell you my misfortunes. If not, there is no good in my giving myself the trouble of relating them. But here the curate and the barber, seeing that the travellers were engaged in conversation with Don Quixote, came forward in order to answer in such a way as to save their stratagem from being discovered. The canon, replying to Don Quixote, said, "'In truth, brother, I know more about books of chivalry than I do about Philalpando's elements of logic. So, if that be all, you may safely tell me what you please.' "'In God's name, then, senor,' replied Don Quixote, "'if that be so, I would have you know that I am held enchanted in this cage "'by the envy and fraud of wicked enchanters, "'for virtue is more persecuted by the wicked than loved by the good. "'I am a knight-errant, and not one of those whose name fame "'never thought of immortalising in her record, "'but of those who, in defiance and in spite of envy itself, and all the magicians that Persia, or Brahmans that India, or gymnosophists that Ethiopia ever produced, will place their names in the temple of immortality, to serve as examples and patterns for ages to come, whereby knights errant may see the footsteps in which they must tread if they would attain the summit and crowning point of honour in arms. What Senor Don Quixote of La Mancha says, observed the curate, is the truth, for he goes enchanted in this cart, not from any fault or sins of his, but because of the malevolence of those to whom virtue is odious and valour hateful. This, senor, is the knight of the rueful countenance, if you have ever heard him named, whose valiant achievements and mighty deeds shall be written on lasting brass and imperishable marble, notwithstanding all the efforts of envy to obscure them, and malice to hide them. When the canon heard both the prisoner and the man who was at liberty talk in such a strain, he was ready to cross himself in his astonishment, and could not make out what had befallen him, and all his attendants were in the same state of amazement. At this point Sancho Panza, who had drawn near to hear the conversation, said, in order to make everything plain, "'Well, sirs, you may like or dislike what I am going to say, but the fact of the matter is my master Don Quixote is just as much enchanted as my mother. He is in his full senses. He eats and he drinks and he has his calls like other men, and as he had yesterday before they caged him. And if that's the case, what do they mean by wanting me to believe that he is enchanted?' for I have heard many a one say that enchanted people neither eat nor sleep nor talk, and my master, if you don't stop him, will talk more than thirty lawyers. Then, turning to the curate, he exclaimed, Ah, senor curate, senor curate, do you think I don't know you? Do you think I don't guess and see the drift of these new enchantments? Well, then, I can tell you I know you, for all your face is covered, and I can tell you that I am up to you, however you may hide your tricks. After all, where envy reigns, virtue cannot live, and where there is niggardliness there can be no liberality. Ill betide the devil. If it had not been for your worship, my master would be married to the princess my Comicona this minute, and I should be accounted least, for no less was to be expected, as well for the goodness of my master, him of the rueful countenance, as from the greatness of my services. But I see now how true it is what they say in these parts, that the wheel of fortune turns faster than a mill-wheel, and that those who were up yesterday are down to-day. I am sorry for my wife and children, for when they might fairly and reasonably expect to see their father return to them, a governor or viceroy of some island or kingdom, they will see him come back a horse-boy. I have said all this, senor curate, 
only to urge your paternity, to lay to your conscience your ill-treatment of my master, and have a care that God does not call you to account in another life for making a prisoner of him in this way, and charge against you all the suckers and good deeds that my lord Don Quixote leaves undone while he is shut up. Trim those lamps there, exclaimed the barber at this. So you are of the same fraternity as your master too, Sancho. By God, I begin to see that you will have to keep him company in the cage, and be enchanted like him for having caught some of his humour and chivalry. It was an evil hour when you let yourself be got with child by his promises, and that island you long so much for found its way into your head. I am not with child by any one, returned Sancho. "'Nor am I a man to let myself be got with child, if it was by the king himself. "'Though I am poor, I am an old Christian, and I owe nothing to nobody. "'And if I long for an island, other people long for worse. "'Each of us is the son of his own works, and being a man, I may come to be Pope, "'not to say governor of an island, especially as my master may win so many "'that he will not know whom to give them to. "'Mind how you talk, Master Barber, for shaving is not everything.' "'and there is some difference between Peter and Peter. "'I say this because we all know one another, "'and it will not do to throw false dice with me. "'And as to the enchantment of my master, "'God knows the truth. "'Leave it as it is. "'It only makes it worse to stir it.' "'The barber did not care to answer Sancho, "'lest, by his plain speaking, "'he should disclose what the curate and he himself "'were trying so hard to conceal.' and under the same apprehension the curate had asked the canon to ride on a little in advance, so that he might tell him of the mystery of this man in the cage, and other things that would amuse him. The canon agreed, and on going ahead with his servants, listened with attention to the account of the character, life, madness, and ways of Don Quixote given him by the curate, who described to him briefly the beginning and origin of his craze, and told him the whole story of his adventures, up to his being confined in the cage, together with the plan they had of taking him home, to try if by any means they could discover a cure for his madness. The canon and his servants were surprised anew when they heard Don Quixote's strange story, and when it was finished he said, "'To tell the truth, senor curate, I, for my part, consider what they call books of chivalry to be mischievous to the state.' And though, led by idle and false taste, I have read the beginnings of almost all that have been printed, I never could manage to read any one of them from beginning to end. For it seems to me that they are all more or less the same thing, and one has no more in it than another, this no more than that. And in my opinion, this sort of writing and composition is of the same species as the fables they call the Milesian, nonsensical tales, that aims solely at giving amusement, and not instruction, exactly the opposite of the apologue fables, which amuse and instruct at the same time. And though it may be the chief object of such books to amuse, I do not know how they can succeed when they are so full of such monstrous nonsense. For the enjoyment the mind feels must come from the beauty and harmony with which it perceives or contemplates, in the things that the eye or the imagination brings before it, and nothing that has any ugliness or disproportion about it can give any pleasure. What beauty, then, or what proportion of the parts to the whole, or of the whole to the parts, can there be in a book or fable where a lad of sixteen cuts down a giant as tall as a tower, and makes two halves of him as if he were an almond cake? And when they want to give us a picture of a battle, after having told us that there are a million of combatants on the side of the enemy, let the hero of the book be opposed to them, and we have perforce to believe, whether we like it or not, that the said knight wins the victory by the single might of his strong arm. And then, what shall we say of the facility with which a born queen or empress will give herself over into the arms of some unknown wandering knight? What mind that is not wholly barbarous and uncultured can find pleasure in reading of how a great tower full of knights sails away across the sea like a ship with a fair wind, and will be to-night in Lombardy and to-morrow morning in the land of Prester John of the Indies, or some other that Ptolemy never described nor Marco Polo saw? 
and if in answer to this I am told that the authors of books of the kind write them as fiction, and therefore are not bound to regard niceties of truth, I would reply that fiction is all the better the more it looks like truth, and gives the more pleasure the more probability and possibility there is about it. Plots in fiction should be wedded to the understanding of the reader, and be constructed in such a way that, reconciling impossibilities, smoothing over difficulties, keeping the mind on the alert, they may surprise, interest, divert, and entertain, so that wonder and delight joined may keep pace one with the other, all of which he will fail to effect, who shuns verisimilitude and truth to nature. Wherein lies the perfection of writing? I have never yet seen any book of chivalry that puts together a connected plot complete in all its numbers, so that the middle agrees with the beginning, and the end with the beginning and the middle. On the contrary, they construct them with such a multitude of members that it now seems as though they meant to produce a chimera or monster rather than a well-proportioned figure. And besides all this, they are harsh in their style, incredible in their achievements, licentious in their amours, uncouth in their courtly speeches, prolix in their battles, silly in their arguments, absurd in their travels, and, in short, wanting in everything like intelligent art, for which reason they deserve to be banished from the Christian commonwealth as a worthless breed. The curate listened to him attentively and felt that he was a man of sound understanding, and that there was good reason in what he said. So he told him that, being of the same opinion himself, and bearing a grudge to books of chivalry, he had burned all Don Quixote's, which were many, and gave him an account of the scrutiny he had made of them, and of those he had condemned to the flames, and those he had spared, with which the canon was not a little amused, adding that though he had said so much in condemnation of these books, Still he found one good thing in them, and that was the opportunity they afforded to a gifted intellect for displaying itself, for they presented a wide and spacious field over which the pen might range freely, describing shipwrecks, tempests, combats, battles, portraying a valiant captain with all the qualifications requisite to make one, showing him sagacious in foreseeing the wiles of the enemy, eloquent in speech to encourage or restrain his soldiers, ripe in counsel, rapid in resolve, as bold in biding his time as in pressing the attack, now picturing some tragic incident, now some joyful and unexpected event, here a beauteous lady, virtuous, wise, and modest, there a Christian knight, brave and gentle, here a lawless, barbarous braggart, there a courteous prince, gallant and gracious, setting forth the devotion and loyalty of vassals, the greatness and generosity of nobles, or again, said he, the author may show himself to be an astronomer, or a skilled cosmographer, or musician, or one versed in affairs of state, and sometimes he will have a chance of coming forward as a magician, if he likes. He can set forth the craftiness of Ulysses, the piety of Aeneas, the valour of Achilles, the misfortunes of Hector, the treachery of Sinon, the friendship of Euryalus, the generosity of Alexander, the boldness of Caesar, the clemency and truth of Trajan, the fidelity of Zapyrus, the wisdom of Cato, and, in short, all the faculties that serve to make an illustrious man perfect, now uniting them in one individual, again distributing them among many. And if this be done with charm of style and ingenious invention, aiming at the truth as much as possible, he will assuredly weave a web of bright and varied threads, that, when finished, will display such perfection and beauty that it will attain the worthiest object any writing can seek, which, as I said before, is to give instruction and pleasure combined. For the unrestricted range of these books enables the author to show his powers, epic, lyric, tragic, or comic, and all the moods the sweet and winning arts of poesy and oratory are capable of. For the epic may be written in prose just as well as in verse. Chapter 48 in which the canon pursues the subject of the books of chivalry, with other matters worthy of his wit. "'It is as you say, Senor Canon,' said the curate, "'and for that reason those who have hitherto written books of the sort deserve all the more censure for writing without paying any attention to good taste or the rules of art. 
by which they might guide themselves and become as famous in prose as the two princes of Greek and Latin poetry are in verse. "'I myself, at any rate,' said the canon, "'was once tempted to write a book of chivalry, "'in which all the points I have mentioned were to be observed. "'And if I must own the truth, I have more than a hundred sheets written, "'and to try if it came up to my own opinion of it. "'I showed them to persons who were fond of this kind of reading, "'to learned and intelligent men, "'as well as to ignorant people who cared for nothing "'but the pleasure of listening to nonsense. "'And from all I obtained flattering approval.' Nevertheless, I proceeded no farther with it, as well because it seemed to me an occupation inconsistent with my profession, as because I perceived that the fools are more numerous than the wise, and though it is better to be praised by the wise few than applauded by the foolish many, I have no mind to submit myself to the stupid judgment of the silly public, to whom the reading of such books falls for the most part." But what most of all made me hold my hand, and even abandon all idea of finishing it, was an argument I put to myself taken from the plays that are acted nowadays, which was in this wise. If those that are now in vogue, as well those that are pure invention as those founded on history, are all, or most of them, downright nonsense and things that have neither head nor tail, and yet the public listens to them with delight, and regards and cries them up as perfection, when they are so far from it. And if the authors who write them, and the players who act them, say that this is what they must be, for the public wants this and will have nothing else, and that those that go by rule and work out a plot according to the laws of art will only find some half a dozen intelligent people to understand them, while all the rest remain blind to the merit of their composition, and that for themselves it is better to get bread from the many than praise from the few. Then my book will fare the same way, after I have burnt off my eyebrows in trying to observe the principles I have spoken of, and I shall be the tailor of the corner. And though I have sometimes endeavoured to convince actors that they are mistaken in this notion they have adopted, and that they would attract more people and get more credit by producing plays in accordance with the rules of art than by absurd ones, they are so thoroughly wedded to their own opinion that no argument or evidence can wean them from it. I remember saying one day to one of these obstinate fellows, "'Tell me, do you not recollect that a few years ago there were three tragedies acted in Spain, written by a famous poet of these kingdoms, which were such that they filled all who heard them with admiration, delight, and interest, the ignorant as well as the wise, the masses as well as the higher orders, and brought in more money to the performers, these three alone, than thirty of the best that have since been produced. No doubt, replied the actor in question, you mean the Isabella, the Phyllis, and the Alexandra. Those are the ones I mean, said I and see if they did not observe the principles of art, and if by observing them they fail to show their superiority and please all the world, so that the fault does not lie with the public that insists upon nonsense, but with those who don't know how to produce something else. The ingratitude revenged was not nonsense, nor was there any in the Numantia, nor any to be found in the Merchant Lover, nor yet in the Friendly Fair Foe nor in some others that have been written by certain gifted poets to their own fame and renown, and to the profit of those that brought them out. Some further remarks I added to these, with which, I think, I left him rather dumbfounded, but not so satisfied or convinced that I could disabuse him of his error. "'You have touched upon a subject, Senor Canon,' observed the curate here, "'that has awakened an old enmity I have against the plays in vogue at the present day,' quite as strong as that which I bear to the books of chivalry. For while the drama, according to Tully, should be the mirror of human life, the model of manners, and the image of truth, those which are presented nowadays are mirrors of nonsense, models of folly, and images of lewdness. For what greater nonsense can there be, in connection with what we are now discussing, than for an infant to appear in swaddling clothes in the first scene of the first act, and in the second a grown-up bearded man?' Or what greater absurdity can there be in putting before us an old man as a swashbuckler, a young man as a poltroon, a lackey using fine language, a page giving sage advice, a king plying as a porter, a princess who is a kitchen-maid? 
and then what shall I say of their attention to the time in which the action they represent may or can take place, save that I have seen a play where the first act began in Europe, the second in Asia, the third finished in Africa, and no doubt had it been in four acts the fourth would have ended in America, and so it would have been laid in all four quarters of the globe. And if truth to life is the main thing the drama should keep in view, how is it possible for any average understanding to be satisfied, when the action is supposed to pass in the time of King Pepin or Charlemagne, and the principal personage in it they represent to be the Emperor Heraclitus, who entered Jerusalem with the cross, and won the Holy Sepulchre like Godfrey of Bouillon, there being years innumerable between the one and the other? or if the play is based on fiction and historical facts are introduced, or bits of what occurred to different people and at different times mixed up with it all, not only without any semblance of probability, but with obvious errors that from every point of view are inexcusable. And the worst of it is, there are ignorant people who say that this is perfection, and that anything beyond this is affected refinement. And then if we turn to sacred dramas— what miracles they invent in them! What apocryphal, ill-devised incidents, attributing to one saint the miracles of another! And even in secular plays they venture to introduce miracles without any reason or object, except that they think some such miracle, or transformation, as they call it, will come in well to astonish stupid people, and draw them to the play. All this tends to the prejudice of truth and the corruption of history, nay more to the reproach of the wits of Spain, for foreigners who scrupulously observe the laws of the drama look upon us as barbarous and ignorant when they see the absurdity and nonsense of the plays we produce. Nor will it be a sufficient excuse to say that the chief object well-ordered governments have in view, when they permit plays to be performed in public, is to entertain the people with some harmless amusement occasionally, and to keep it from those evil humours which idleness is apt to engender, and that as this may be attained by any sort of play, good or bad, there is no need to lay down laws, or bind those who write or act them to make them as they ought to be made since, as I say, the object sought for may be secured by any sort. To this I would reply that the same end would be, beyond all comparison, better attained by means of good plays than by those which are not so. For after listening to an artistic and properly constructed play, the hearer will come away enlivened by the jests, instructed by the serious parts, full of admiration at the incidents, his wits sharpened by the arguments, warned by the tricks, all the wiser for the examples, inflamed against vice, and in love with virtue. For in all these ways a good play will stimulate the mind of the hearer, be he ever so boorish or dull. And of all impossibilities the greatest is that a play endowed with all these qualities will not entertain, satisfy, and please much more than one wanting in them, like the greater number of those which are commonly acted nowadays." nor are the poets who write them to be blamed for this, for some there are among them who are perfectly well aware of their faults, and know what they ought to do. But as plays have become a saleable commodity, they say, and with truth, that the actors will not buy them unless they are after this fashion. And so the poet tries to adapt himself to the requirements of the actor who is to pay him for his work. And that this is the truth may be seen by the countless plays that a most fertile wit of these kingdoms has written, with so much brilliancy, so much grace and gaiety, such polished versification, such choice language, such profound reflections, and, in a word, so rich in eloquence and elevation of style, that he has filled the world with his fame. And yet, in consequence of his desire to suit the taste of the actors, they have not all, as some of them have, come as near perfection as they ought. Others write plays with such heedlessness, that after they have been acted, the actors have to fly and abscond, afraid of being punished, as they often have been, for having acted something offensive to some king or other, or insulting to some noble family. All which evils, and many more that I say nothing of, would be removed, if there were some intelligent and sensible person at the capital to examine all plays before they were acted, not only those produced in the capital itself, but all that were intended to be acted in Spain, without whose approval, seal, and signature, no local magistracy should allow any play to be acted. 
In that case, actors would take care to send their plays to the capital, and could act them in safety, and those who write them would be more careful and take more pains with their work, standing in awe of having to submit it to the strict examination of one who understood the matter. And so good plays would be produced, and the objects they aim at happily obtained, as well the amusement of the people as the credit of the wits of Spain, the interest and safety of the actors, and the saving of trouble in inflicting punishment of them. And if the same or some other person were authorised to examine the newly written books of chivalry, no doubt some would appear with all the perfections you have described, enriching our language with the gracious and precious treasure of eloquence, and driving the old books into obscurity before the light of the new ones that would come out for the harmless entertainment, not merely of the idle, but of the very busiest, for the bow cannot always be bent, nor can weak human nature exist without some lawful amusement. The canon and the curate had proceeded thus far with their conversation, when the barber, coming forward, joined them, and said to the curate, "'This is the spot, Senor Licentia, that I said was a good one for fresh and plentiful pasture for the oxen, while we take our noontide rest.' "'And so it seems,' returned the curate, and he told the canon what he proposed to do, on which he too made up his mind to halt with them, attracted by the aspect of the fair valley that lay before their eyes, and to enjoy it as well as the conversation of the curate, to whom he had begun to take a fancy, and also to learn more particulars about the doings of Don Quixote, he desired some of his servants to go on to the inn, which was not far distant, and fetch from it what eatables there might be for the whole party, as he meant to rest for the afternoon where he was. To which one of his servants replied that the sumpter mule, which by this time ought to have reached the inn, carried provisions enough to make it unnecessary to get anything from the inn except barley. "'In that case,' said the canon, "'take all the beasts there, and bring the sumpter mule back.' While this was going on, Sancho, perceiving that he could speak to his master without having the curate and the barber, of whom he had his suspicions present all the time, approached the cage in which Don Quixote was placed, and said, "'Senor, to ease my conscience, I want to tell you the state of the case as to your enchantment, and that is that these two here, with their faces covered, are the curate of our village and the barber, and I suspect that they have hit upon this plan of carrying you off in this fashion, out of pure envy, because your worship surpasses them in doing famous deeds, and if this be the truth, it follows that you are not enchanted, but hoodwinked, and made a fool of. And to prove this, I want to ask you one thing, and if you answer me as I believe you will answer, you will be able to lay your finger on the trick, and you will see that you are not enchanted, but gone wrong in your wits. "'Ask what thou wilt, Sancho, my son,' returned Don Quixote, "'for I will satisfy thee, and answer all that thou requirest. "'As to what thou sayest, that these who are accompany us yonder are the curate and the barber, "'our neighbours and acquaintances, it is very possible that they may seem to be those same persons, "'but that they also in reality and in fact believe it not on any account.' What thou art to believe and think is that, if they look like them, as thou sayest, it must be that those who have enchanted me have taken this shape and likeness, for it is easy for enchanters to take any form they please, and they may have taken those of our friends in order to make thee think as thou dost, and lead thee into a labyrinth of fancies, from which thou wilt find no escape, though thou hadst the cord of Theseus and they may also have done it to make me uncertain in my mind, and unable to conjecture whence this evil comes to me. For if on the one hand thou dost tell me that the barber and curate of our village are here in company with us, and on the other I find myself shut up in a cage, and know in my heart that no power on earth that was not supernatural would have been able to shut me in, what wouldst thou have me say or think, but that my enchantment is of a sort that transcends all that I have read of in all the histories that deal with knight-errants that have been enchanted? So thou mayst set their mind at rest as to the idea that they are what thou sayest, for they are as much so as I am a Turk. But touching thy desire to ask me something, say on, and I will answer thee, though thou shouldst ask questions from this till to-morrow morning.' 
"'May our lady be good to me,' said Sancho, lifting up his voice. "'And is it possible that your worship is so thick of skull and so short of brains "'that you cannot see that what I say is the simple truth, "'and that malice has more to do with your imprisonment and misfortune than enchantment? "'But as it is so, I will prove plainly to you that you are not enchanted. "'Now tell me, so may God deliver you from this affliction, "'and so may you find yourself when you least expect it in the arms of my lady Dulcinea.' "'Leave off conjuring me,' said Don Quixote, "'and ask what thou wouldst know. "'I have already told thee I will answer with all possible precision.' "'This is what I want,' said Sancho, "'and what I would know, and have you tell me, "'without adding or leaving out anything, "'but telling the whole truth as one expects it to be told, "'and as it is told by all who profess arms "'as your worship professes them under the title of knight's errand.' "'I tell thee I will not lie in any particular,' said Don Quixote. "'Finish thy question, for in truth thou weariest me "'with all these asseverations, requirements, and precautions, Sancho.' "'Well, I rely on the goodness and truth of my master,' said Sancho, "'and so, because it bears upon what we are talking about, "'I would ask, speaking with all reverence, "'whether, since your worship has been shut up, "'as you think enchanted in this cage, "'you have felt any desire or inclination to go anywhere, as the saying is.' "'I do not understand going anywhere,' said Don Quixote. "'Explain thyself more clearly, Sancho, "'if thou wouldst have me give an answer to the point.' "'Is it possible,' said Sancho, "'that your worship does not understand going anywhere?' "'Why, the schoolboys know that from the time they were babes. "'Well, then, you must know what I mean. "'Have you had any desire to do what cannot be avoided?' "'Ah, oh, now I understand thee, Sancho,' said Don Quixote. "'Yes, often, and even this minute. "'Get me out of this strait, or all will not go right.' CHAPTER Forty Nine, WHICH TREATS OF THE SHREWD CONVERSATION which Sancho Panza held with his master, Don Quixote. "'Ah, I have caught you,' said Sancho. "'This is what in my heart and soul I was longing to know. "'Come now, senor, can you deny what is commonly said around us? "'When a person is out of humour, I don't know what ails so-and-so "'that he neither eats nor drinks nor sleeps nor gives a proper answer to any question. "'One would think he was enchanted.' from which it is to be gathered that those who do not eat or drink or sleep or do any of the natural acts I am speaking of, that such persons are enchanted, but not those that have the desire your worship has, and drink when drink is given them, and eat when there is anything to eat, and answer every question that is asked them. "'What thou sayest is true, Sancho,' replied Don Quixote, "'but I have already told thee there are many sorts of enchantments.' and it may be that in the course of time they have been changed one for another, and that now it may be the way with enchanted people to do all that I do, though they did not do so before. So it is vain to argue or draw inferences against the usage of the time. I know and feel that I am enchanted, and that is enough to ease my conscience, for it would weigh heavily on it if I thought that I was not enchanted, and that in a faint-hearted and cowardly way I allowed myself to lie in this cage, defrauding multitudes of the succour I might afford to those in need and distress, who at this very moment may be in sore want of my aid and protection. Still, for all that, replied Sancho, I say that for your greater and fuller satisfaction it would be well if your worship were to try to get out of this prison and I promised to do all in my power to help, and even to take you out of it, and see if you could once more mount your good Rosinante, who seems to be enchanted too, he is so melancholy and dejected, and then we might try our chance in looking for adventures again, and if we have no luck there, there will be time enough to go back to the cage, in which, on the faith of a good and loyal squire, I promise to shut myself up along with your worship, if so be you are so unfortunate, or I so stupid, as not to be able to carry out my plan. "'I am content to do as thou sayest, brother Sancho,' said Don Quixote, "'and when thou seest an opportunity for effecting my release, 
I will obey thee absolutely. But thou wilt see, Sancho, how mistaken thou art in thy conception of my misfortune. The knight-errant and the ill-errant squire kept up their conversation till they reached the place where the curate, the canon, and the barber, who had already dismounted, were waiting for them. The carter at once unyoked the oxen, and left them to roam at large about the pleasant green spot, the freshness of which seemed to invite not enchanted people like Don Quixote, but wide-awake sensible folk like his squire, who begged the curate to allow his master to leave the cage for a little, for if they did not let him out, the prison might not be as clean as the propriety of such a gentleman as his master required. The curate understood him, and said that he would very gladly comply with his request, only that he feared his master, finding himself at liberty, would take to his old courses, and make off where nobody could ever find him again. "'I will answer for his not running away,' said Sancho. "'And I also,' said the canon, "'especially if he gives me his word as a knight not to leave without our consent.' Don Quixote, who was listening to all this, said, "'I give it. Moreover, one who is enchanted as I am cannot do as he likes with himself.' for he who had enchanted him could prevent his moving from one place for three ages, and if he attempted to escape would bring him back flying. And that being so, they might as well release him, particularly as it would be to the advantage of all, for if they did not let him out, he protested he would be unable to avoid offending their nostrils unless they kept their distance. The canon took his hands, tied together as they both were, and on his word and promise they unbound him, and rejoiced beyond measure he was to find himself out of the cage. The first thing he did was to stretch himself all over, and then he went to where Rocinante was standing, and giving him a couple of slaps on the haunches, said, "'I still trust in God and in his blessed mother, O flower and mirror of steeds, that we shall soon see ourselves, both of us, as we wish to be, thou with thy master on thy back, and I mounted upon thee, following the calling for which God sent me into the world. And so saying, accompanied by Sancho, he withdrew to a retired spot, from which he came back much relieved and more eager than ever to put his squire's scheme into execution. The canon gazed at him, wondering at the extraordinary nature of his madness, and that in all his remarks and replies he should show such excellent sense, and only lose his stirrups, as has been already said, when the subject of chivalry was broached. And so, moved by compassion, he said to him, as they all sat on the green grass, awaiting the arrival of the provisions, "'Is it possible, gentle sir, that the nauseous and idle reading of books of chivalry can have had such an effect on your worship as to upset your reason, so that you fancy yourself enchanted and the like?' all as far from the truth as falsehood itself is. How can there be any human understanding that can persuade itself that ever was all that infinity of Amadises in the world, or all that multitude of famous knights, all those emperors of Trebizond, all those Felix Marts of Hyrcania, all those palfreys and damsels errant, and serpents and monsters and giants and marvellous adventures, and enchantments of every kind, and battles, and prodigious encounters, splendid costumes, lovesick princesses, squires made counts, droll dwarfs, love-letters, billings and cooings, swashbuckler women, and, in a word, all that nonsense the books of chivalry contain. For myself, I can only say that when I read them, so long as I do not stop to think that they are all lies and frivolity, they give me a certain amount of pleasure. But when I come to consider what they are, I fling the very best of them at the wall, and would fling it into the fire if there were one at hand, as richly deserving such punishment as cheats and impostors, out of the range of ordinary toleration, and as founders of new sects and modes of life, and teachers that lead the ignorant public to believe and accept as truth all the folly they contain. And such is their audacity, they even dare to unsettle the wits of gentlemen of birth and intelligence, as is shown plainly by the way they have served your worship, when they have brought you to such a pass that you have to be shut up in a cage and carried on an ox-cart, as one would carry a lion or a tiger from place to place to make money by showing it. Come, Senor Don Quixote, 
Have some compassion for yourself. Return to the bosom of common sense, and make use of the liberal share of it that heaven has been pleased to bestow upon you, employing your abundant gifts of mind in some other reading that may serve to benefit your conscience and add to your honour. And if, still led away by your natural bent, you desire to read books of achievements and of chivalry, read the book of Judges in the Holy Scriptures, for there you will find grand reality, and deeds as true as they are heroic. Lusitania had a Veriatus, Rome a Caesar, Carthage a Hannibal, Greece an Alexander, Castile a Count Fernand Gondalith, Valencia a Cid, Andalusia a Gonzalo Fernandez, Estremadura a Diego Garcia de Paredes, Jerez a Garcia Perez de Cat Vargas, Toledo a Garcilaso, Sevilla Don Manuel de Leon, to read of whose valiant deeds will entertain and instruct the loftiest minds and fill them with delight and wonder. Here, Senor Don Quixote, will be reading worthy of your sound understanding, from which you will rise learned in history, in love with virtue, strengthened in goodness, improved in manners, brave without rashness, prudent without cowardice, and all to the honour of God, your own advantage, and the glory of La Mancha, whence I am informed your worship derives your birth. Don Quixote listened with the greatest attention to the canon's words, and when he found he had finished, after regarding him for some time, he replied to him, "'It appears to me, gentle sir, that your worship's discourse is intended to persuade me that there never were any knights errant in the world, and that all the books of chivalry are false, lying, mischievous, and useless to the state.' and that I have done wrong in reading them, and worse in believing them, and still worse in imitating them, when I undertook to follow the arduous calling of knight-errantry which they set forth. For you deny that there ever were Amadises of Gaul, or of Greece, or other of the knights of whom the books are full. It is all exactly as you state it, said the canon, to which Don Quixote returned, you also went on to say that books of this kind had done me much harm, inasmuch as they had upset my senses and shut me up in a cage, and that it would have been better for me to reform and change my studies, and read other truer books which would afford more pleasure and instruction. Just so, said the canon. Well, then, returned Don Quixote, to my mind, it is you who are the one that is out of his wits and enchanted, as you have ventured to utter such blasphemies against a thing so universally acknowledged and accepted as true, that whoever denies it as you do, deserves the same punishment which you say you inflict on the books which irritate you when you read them. For to try to persuade anybody that Amadis and all the other knights' adventurers with whom the books are filled never existed, would be like trying to persuade him that the sun does not yield light, or ice cold, or earth nourishment. What wit in the world can persuade another that the story of the Princess Floripes and Guy of Burgundy is not true, or that of Fierabras and the Bridge of Mantible, which happened in the time of Charlemagne? For by all that is good, it is as true as that it is daylight now. And if it be a lie, it must be a lie, too, that there was a Hector, or Achilles, or Trojan War, or twelve peers of France, or Arthur of England, who still lives, changed into a raven, and is unceasingly looked for in his kingdom. One might just as well try to make out that the history of Guarino Metzgino, or the quest of the Holy Grail, is false, or that the loves of Tristram and the Queen Isolde are apocryphal as well as those of Guinevere and Lancelot, when there are persons who can almost remember having seen the dame Quintanona, who was the best cup-bearer in Great Britain. And so true is this, that I recollect a grandmother of mine on the father's side, whenever she saw any dame in a venerable hood, used to say to me, "'Grandson, that one is like dame Quintanona.' from which I conclude that she must have known her, or at least had managed to see some portrait of her. Then who can deny that the story of Pieres and the fair Magdalena is true, when even to this day may be seen in the king's armoury the pin with which the valiant Pieres guided the wooden horse he rode through the air, and it is a trifle bigger than the pole of a cart. 
and alongside of the pin is Babieca's saddle, and at Roncesvalles there is Roland's horn, as large as a large beam. Whence we may infer that there were twelve peers, and a peeress, and a cid, and other knights like them, of the sort people commonly call adventurers. Or perhaps I shall be told, too, that there was no such knight-errant as the valiant Lusitanian de Juan de Merlo, who went to Burgundy, and in the city of Arras fought with the famous lord of Charnay, Mose and Pierre is by name, and afterwards in the city of Basel, with Mose and Enrique de Remestin, coming out of both encounters covered with fame and honour, or adventures and challenges achieved and delivered, also in Burgundy, by the valiant Spaniards Pedro Barba and Guiteria Quisada, of whose family I come in the direct male line, when they vanquished the sons of the Count of San Polo. I shall be told, too, that Don Fernando de Guevara did not go in quest of adventures to Germany, where he engaged in combat with Knighter Georg, a knight of the house of the Duke of Austria. I shall be told that the jousts of Suero de Quinones, him of the Paso, and the emprise of Mosin Louis de Falques against the Castilian knight Don Gonzalo de Guzman were mere mockeries, as well as many other achievements of Christian knights of these and foreign realms, which are so authentic and true that I repeat, he who denies them must be totally wanting in reason and good sense. The canon was amazed to hear the medley of truth and fiction Don Quixote uttered, and to see how well acquainted he was with everything relating or belonging to the achievements of his knight-errantry. So he said in reply, "'I cannot deny, Senor Don Quixote, that there is some truth in what you say, especially as regards the Spanish knights-errant, and I am willing to grant, too, that the twelve peers of France existed. But I am not disposed to believe that they did all the things that the Archbishop Turpin relates of them, for the truth of the matter is, they were knights chosen by the kings of France, and so-called peers, because they were all equal in worth, rank, and prowess. At least, if they were not, they ought to have been. And it was a kind of religious order, like those of Santiago and Calatrava in present day, in which it is assumed that those who take it are valiant knights of distinction and good birth. And just as we say now a knight of St. John, or of Alcantara, they used to say, then, a knight of the twelve peers, because twelve equals were chosen for that military order. That there was a Cid, as well as a Bernardo de Carpio, there can be no doubt. But that they did the deeds people say they did, I hold to be very doubtful. In that other matter, of the pin of Count Pierres that you speak of, and say is near Babieca's saddle in the armoury, I confess my sin, for I am either so stupid or so short-sighted, that though I have seen the saddle, I have never been able to see the pin, in spite of it being as big as your worship says it is. "'For all that it is there, without any manner of doubt,' said Don Quixote, "'and more by token, they say, it is enclosed in a sheath of cowhide to keep it from rusting.' "'All that may be,' replied the canon, "'but by the orders I have received I do not remember seeing it. However, granting it is there, that is no reason why I am bound to believe the stories of all those Amadises and all that multitude of knights they tell us about. Nor is it reasonable that a man like your worship, so worthy and with so many good qualities, and endowed with such a good understanding, should allow himself to be persuaded that such wild, crazy things as are written in those absurd books of chivalry are really true. End of part 16。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Katie Preston. Don Quixote, Volume 1 by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra, translated by John Ormsby, Part 17, Chapter 50. Of the shrewd controversy which Don Quixote and the canon held together with other incidents. A good joke that, returned Don Quixote. Books that have been printed with the king's license, and with the approbation of those to whom they have been submitted, and read with universal delight, 
and extolled by great and small rich and poor learned and ignorant gentle and simple in a word by every people of every sort of whatever rank or condition they may be that these should be lies and above all when they carry such an appearance of truth with them for they tell us the father mother country kindred age place and the achievements step by step and day by day performed by such a knight or knights hush sir utter not such blasphemy trust me i am advising you now to act as a sensible man should only read them and you will see the pleasure you will derive from them for come tell me can there be anything more delightful than to see as it were here now displayed before us a vast lake of bubbling pitch with a host of snakes and serpents and lizards and ferocious and terrible creatures of all sorts swimming about in it while from the middle of the lake there comes a plaintive voice saying knight whosoever thou art beholdest this dread lake if thou wouldst win the prize that lies hidden beneath these dusky waves prove the valour of thy stout heart and cast thyself into the midst of its dark burning waters else thou shalt not be worthy to see the mighty wonders contained in the seven castles of the seven fays that lie beneath this black expanse and then the knight almost ere the awful voices ceased without stopping to consider without pausing to reflect upon the danger to which he is exposing himself without even relieving himself of the weight of his massive armour commending himself to god and to his lady plunges into the midst of the boiling lake and when he little looks for it or knows what his fate is to be he finds himself among flowery meadows with which the elysian fields are not to be compared the sky seems more transparent there and the sun shines with a strange brilliancy and a delightful grove of green leafy trees presents itself to the eyes and charms the sight with its verdure while the ear is soothed by the sweet untutored melody of the countless birds of gay plumage that flit to and fro among the interlacing branches here he sees a brook whose limpid waters like liquid crystal ripple over fine sands and white pebbles that look like sifted gold and purest pearls there he perceives a cunningly wrought fountain of many-coloured jasper and polished marble here another of rustic fashion where the little mussel shells and the spiral white and yellow mansions of the snail disposed in studious disorder mingled with fragments of glittering crystal and mock emeralds make up a work of varied aspect where art imitating nature seems to have outdone it suddenly there is presented to his sight a strong castle or gorgeous palace with walls of massy gold turrets of diamond and gates of jacinth in short so marvellous is its structure that though the materials of which it is built are nothing less than diamonds carbuncles rubies pearls gold and emeralds the workmanship is still more rare and after having seen all this what can be more charming than to see how a bevy of damsels comes forth from the gate of the castle in gay and gorgeous attire such that were i to set myself now to depict it as the histories describe it to us i should never have done and then how she who seems to be the first among them takes the bold knight who plunged into the boiling lake by the hand and without addressing a word to him leads him into the rich palace or castle and strips him as naked as when his mother bore him and bathes him in lukewarm water and anoints him all over with sweet-smelling unguents and clothes him in a shirt of the softest sendal all scented and perfumed while another damsel comes and throws over her shoulders a mantle which is said to be worth at the very least a city and even more how charming it is then when they tell us how after all this they lead him to another chamber where he finds the table set out in such style that he is filled with amazement and wonder to see how they pour out water for his hands distilled from amber and sweet-scented flowers how they seat him on an ivory chair to see how the damsels wait on him all in profound silence how they bring him such a variety of dainties so temptingly prepared that the appetite is at a loss which to select to hear the music that resounds while he is at table by whom or whence produced he knows not and then when the repast is over and the tables removed for the knight to recline in the chair picking his teeth perhaps as usual and a damsel much lovelier than any of the others to enter unexpectedly by the chamber door and herself by his side and begin to tell him what the castle is and how she is held enchanted there and other things that amaze the knight and astonish the readers who are perusing his history but i will not expatiate any further upon this as it may be gathered from it that whatever part of whatever history of a knight-errant one reads 
it will fill the reader, whoever he be, with delight and wonder. And take my advice, sir, and as I said before, read these books, and you will see how they will banish any melancholy you may feel, and raise your spirits should they be depressed. For myself I can say that since I have been a knight-errant, I have become valiant, polite, generous, well-bred, magnanimous, courteous, dauntless, gentle, patient, and have learned to bear hardships, imprisonments, and enchantments. And though it be such a short time since I have seen myself shut up in a cage like a madman, I hope by the might of my arm, if heaven aid me and fortune thwart me not, to see myself king of some kingdom, where I may be able to show the gratitude and generosity that dwell in my heart. For by my faith, Signor, the poor man is incapacitated from showing the virtue of generosity to any one, though he may possess it in the highest degree, and gratitude that consists of disposition only is a dead thing, just as faith without works is dead. For this reason I should be glad were fortune soon to offer me some opportunity of making myself an emperor, so as to show my heart in doing good to my friends, particularly to this poor Sancho Panza, my squire, who is the best fellow in the world, and I would gladly give him a county I have promised him this ever so long, only I am afraid he has not the capacity to govern his realm. Sancho partly heard these last words of his master, and said to him, Strive hard you, Señor Don Quixote, to give me that county so often promised by you, and so long looked for by me. For I promise you there will be no want of capacity in me to govern it. And even if there is, I have heard say that there are men in the world who farm seigneuries, paying so much a year, and they themselves taking charge of the government, while the Lord, with his legs stretched out, enjoys the revenue they pay him, without troubling himself about anything else. That's what I'll do, and not stand haggling over trifles, but wash my hands at once of the whole business, and enjoy my rents like a duke, and let things go their own way. That, brother Sancho, said the canon, only holds good as far as the enjoyment of the revenue goes. But the lord of the seigneury must attend to the administration of justice, and here capacity and sound judgment come in, and above all a firm determination to find out the truth. For if this be wanting in the beginning, the middle and the end will always go wrong, and God as commonly aids the honest intentions of the simple as he frustrates the evil designs of the crafty. I don't understand those philosophies, returned Sancho Panza. All I know is, I would I had the county as soon as I shall know how to govern it. For I have as much soul as another, and as much body as any one, and I shall be as much king of my realm as any other of his. And being so, I should do as I liked. And doing as I liked, I should please myself. And pleasing myself, I should be content. And when one is content, he has nothing more to desire. And when one has nothing more to desire, there is an end of it. So let the county come, and God he with you, and let us see one another, as one blind man said to the other. That is not a bad philosophy thou art talking, Sancho, said the canon, but for all that there is a good deal to be said on this manner of counties. To which Don Quixote returned, I know not what more there is to be said. I only guide myself by the example set me by the great Amadis of Gaul, when he made his squire count of the Insula Firme. And so, without any scruples of conscience, I can make a count of Sancho Panza, for he is one of the best squires that ever knight errant had. The canon was astonished at the methodical nonsense, if nonsense be capable of method, that Don Quixote uttered, at the way in which he had described the adventure of the Knight of the Lake, at the impression that the deliberate lies of the books he read had made upon him, and lastly, he marveled at the simplicity of Sancho, who desired so eagerly to obtain the county his master had promised him. By this time, the canon's servants, who had gone to the inn to fetch the sumpter mule, had returned and making a carpet and the green grass of the meadow serve as a table, they seated themselves in the shade of some trees and made their repast there, that the carter might not be deprived of the advantage of the spot, as has been already said. As they were eating, they suddenly heard a loud noise, and the sound of a bell that seemed to come from among some brambles and thick bushes that were close by. In the same instant they observed a beautiful goat, spotted all over black, white, and brown, spring out of a thicket, with a goat herd after it, calling to it and uttering the usual cries to make it stop or turn back to the fold. The fugitive goat, scared and frightened, ran towards the company as if seeking their protection, and then stood still, and the goatherd coming up seized it by the horns and began to talk to it as if it were possessed of reason and understanding. Ah, wanderer, wanderer, spotty, spotty, how have you gone limping all this time? What wolves have frightened you, my daughter? Won't you tell me what is the matter, my beauty? 
but what else can it be except that you are a she and cannot keep quiet a plague on your humours and the humours of those you take after come back come back my darling and if you will not be so happy at any rate you will be safe in the fold or with your companions for if you who ought to keep and lead them go wandering astray what will become of them the goatherd's talk amused all who heard it but especially the canon who said to him as you live brother take it easy and be not in such a hurry to drive this goat back to the fold for being a female as you say she will follow her natural instinct in spite of all you can do to prevent it take this morsel and drink a sup and that will soothe your irritation and in the meantime the goat will rest herself and so saying he handed him the loins of a cold rabbit on a fork the goatherd took it with thanks and drank and calmed himself and then said i should be sorry if your worships were to take me for a simpleton for having spoke so seriously as i did to this animal but the truth is there is a certain mystery in the words i used i am a clown but not so much of one that i know how to behave to men and to beasts that i can well believe said the curate for i know already by experience that the woods breed men of learning and shepherds harbour philosophers at all events senor returned the goatherd they shelter men of experience and that you may see the truth of this and grasp it though i may seem to put myself forward without being asked i will if it will not tire you gentlemen and you will give me your attention for a little tell you a true story which will confirm this gentleman's word and he pointed to the curate as well as my own to this don quixote replied seeing that this affair has a certain colour of chivalry about it i for my part brother will hear you most gladly and so will all these gentlemen from the high intelligence they possess and their love of curious novelties that interest charm and entertain the mind as i feel quite sure your story will do so begin friend for we are all prepared to listen i draw my stakes said sancho and will retreat with this pasty to the brook there where i mean to victual myself for three days for i have heard my lord don quixote say that a knight's errant squire should eat until he can hold no more whenever he has the chance because it often happens then to get by accident into a wood so thick that they cannot find a way out of it for six days and if the man is not well filled or his alforjas well stored there he may stay as very often he does turned into a dried mummy thou art in the right of it sancho said don quixote go where thou wilt and eat all thou canst for i have had enough and only want to give my mind its refreshment as i shall by listening to this good fellow's story it is what we shall all do said the canon and then begged the goatherd to begin the promised tale the goatherd gave the goat which he held by the horns a couple of slaps on the back saying lie down here beside me spotty for we have time enough to return to our fold the goat seemed to understand him for as her master seated himself she stretched herself quietly beside him and looked up in his face to show him she was all attention to what he was going to say and then in these words he began his story end of part 17this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer visit librivox.org don quixote volume 1 by miguel de cervantes saavedra translated by john ormsby the conclusion of volume 1 part 18 chapters 51 and 52 Chapter 51, which deals with what the goat herd told those who were carrying off Don Quixote. Three leagues from this valley there is a village which, though small, is one of the richest in all this neighborhood, and in it there lived a farmer, a very worthy man, and so much respected that, although to be so is the natural consequence of being rich, he was even more respected for his virtue than for the wealth he had acquired. But what made him still more fortunate, as he said himself, was having a daughter of such exceeding beauty, rare intelligence, gracefulness, and virtue, that every one who knew her and beheld her marveled at the extraordinary gifts with which heaven and nature had endowed her. As a child she was beautiful. She continued to grow in beauty, and at the age of sixteen she was most lovely. 
The fame of her beauty began to spread abroad through all the villages around. And why do I say the villages around, merely, when it spread to distant cities, and even made its way into the halls of royalty, and reached the ears of people of every class, who came from all sides to see her, as if to see something rare and curious, or some wonder-working image. Her father watched over her, and she watched over herself, for there are no locks or guards or bolts that can protect a young girl better than her own modesty. The wealth of the father and the beauty of the daughter led many neighbors as well as strangers to seek her for a wife, but he, who well might be, who had the disposal of so rich a jewel, was perplexed and was unable to make up his mind to which of her countless suitors he should entrust her. I was one among the many who felt a desire so natural, and, as her father knew who I was, and I was of the same town, of pure blood, in the bloom of life, and very rich in possessions, I had great hopes of success. There was another of the same place and qualifications, who also sought her, and this made her father's choice hang in the balance, for he felt that on either of us his daughter would be well bestowed. So, to escape from this state of perplexity, he resolved to refer the matter to Leandra, for that is the name of the rich damsel who has reduced me to misery, reflecting that, as we were both equal, it would be best to leave it to his dear daughter, to choose according to her inclination, a course that is worthy of imitation by all fathers who wish to settle their children in life. I do not mean that they ought to leave them to make a choice of what is contemptible and bad, but that they should place before them what is good, and then allow them to make a good choice as they please. I do not know which Leander chose. I only know her father put us both off with the tender age of his daughter, and vague words that neither bound him nor dismissed us. My rival is called Anselmo, and I call myself Eugenio, that you may know the names of the personages that figure in this tragedy, the end of which is still in suspense, though it is plain to see it must be disastrous. About this time there arrived in our town one Vicente de la Roca, the son of a poor peasant of the same town, the said Vicente having returned from service as a soldier in Italy, and divers other parts. A captain who chanced to pass that way with his company had carried him off from our village when he was a boy of about twelve years, and now, twelve years later, the young man came back in a soldier's uniform, arrayed in a thousand colors, and all over glass trinkets and fine steel chains. Today he would appear in one gay dress, tomorrow in another, but all flimsy and gaudy, of little substance, and less worth. The peasant folk, who are naturally malicious, and when they have nothing to do can be malice itself, remarked all this, and took note of his finery in jewelry, piece by piece, and discovered that he had three suits of different colors, with garters and stockings to match. But he made so many arrangements and combinations out of them, that if they had not counted them, any one would have sworn that he had made a display of more than ten suits of clothes and twenty plumes. Do not look upon all this that I am telling you about the clothes as uncalled for or spun out, for they have a great deal to do with the story. He used to seat himself on a bench under the great poplar in our plaza, and there he would keep us all hanging open-mouthed on the stories he told us of his exploits. There was no country on the face of the globe that he had not seen, nor battle he had not been engaged in. He had killed more Moors than there are in Morocco, and Tunis, and fought more single combats, according to his own account, than Garcilaso, Diego Garcia de Paredes, and a thousand others he named, and out of all he had come victorious without losing 
a drop of blood. On the other hand, he showed marks of wounds, which, though they could not be made out, he said were gunshot wounds received in divers encounters and actions. Lastly, with monstrous impudence, he used to say, You, to his equals, and even those who knew what he was, and declare that his arm was his father, and his deeds his pedigree, and that, being a soldier, he was as good as the king himself. And to add to these swaggering ways, he was a trifle of a musician, and played the guitar with such a flourish that some said he made it speak. Nor did his accomplishments end here, for he was something of a poet, too, and on every trifle that had happened in the town he made a ballad a league long. This soldier, then, that I have described, this Vicente de la Roca, this bravo, gallant, musician, poet, was often seen and watched by Leandra from a window of her house which looked out on the plaza. The glitter of his showy attire took her fancy. His ballads bewitched her, for he gave away twenty copies of every one he made. The tales of his exploits, which he told about himself, came to her ears, and in short, as the devil no doubt had arranged it, she fell in love with him before the presumption of making love to her had suggested itself to him. And, as in love affairs, none are more easily brought to an issue than those which have the inclination of the lady for an ally, Leandra and Vicente came to an understanding, without any difficulty, and before any of her numerous suitors had any suspicion of her design, she had already carried it into effect, having left the house of her dearly beloved father, for mother she had none, and disappeared from the village with the soldier, who came more triumphantly out of this enterprise than out of any of the large number he laid claim to. All the village and all who heard of it were amazed at the affair. I was aghast. Anselmo, thunderstruck, her father full of grief, her relations indignant, the authorities all in a ferment, the officers of the Brotherhood in arms. They scoured the roads, they searched the woods in all quarters, and at the end of three days they found the flighty Leandra in a mountain cave, stripped of her shift and robbed of all the money and precious jewels she had carried away from home with her. They brought her back to her unhappy father, and questioned her as to her misfortune, and she confessed without pressure that Vicente de la Roca had deceived her and under promise of marrying her, had induced her to leave her father's house, as he meant to take her to the richest and most delightful city in the world, which was Naples, and that she, ill-advised and deluded, had believed him, and robbed her father, and handed over all to him the night she disappeared, and that he had carried her away to a rugged mountain, and shut her up in the eve where they had found her. She said, moreover, that the soldier, without robbing her of her honour, had taken from her everything she had, and made off, leaving her in the cave, a thing that still further surprised everybody. It was not easy for us to credit the young man's countenance, but she asserted it with such earnestness that it helped to console her distressed father, who thought nothing of what had been taken, since the jewel that once lost can never be recovered, had been left to his daughter. The same day that Leandra made her appearance, her father removed her from our sight, and took her away to shut her up in a convent in a town near this, in the hope that time may wear away some of the disgrace she has incurred. Leandra's youth furnished an excuse for her fault, at least to those for whom it was of no consequence whether she was good or bad. But those who knew her shrewdness and intelligence did not attribute her misdemeanor to ignorance, but to wantonness and the natural disposition of women, which is, for the most part, 
flighty, and ill-regulated. Leandra, withdrawn from sight, Anselmo's eyes grew blind, or, at any rate, found nothing to look at that gave them any pleasure, and mine were in darkness without a ray of light to direct them to anything enjoyable, while Leandra was away. At last Anselmo and I agreed to leave the village and come to this valley, and he, feeding a great flock of sheep of his own, and I a large herd of goats of mine, we pass our life among the trees, giving vent to our sorrows, together singing the fair Leandra's praises, or upbraiding her, or else sighing alone, and to heaven pouring forth our complaints in solitude. Following our example, many more of Leandra's lovers have come to these rude mountains and adopted our mode of life, and they are so numerous that one would fancy the place had been turned into the pastoral Arcadia, so full is it of shepherds and sheepfolds, nor is there a spot in it where the name of the fair Leandra is not heard. Here one curses her, and calls her capricious, fickle, and immodest. There another condemns her as frail and frivolous. This pardons and absolves her, that spurns and reviles her. One extols her beauty, another assails her character. And, in short, all abuse her, and all adore her. And to such a pitch has this general infatuation gone, that there are some who complain of her scorn without ever having exchanged a word with her, and even some that bewail and mourn the raging fever of jealousy, for which she never gave any one cause, for, as I have already said, her misconduct was known before her passion. There is no nook among the rocks, nor brookside, no shade beneath the trees, that is not haunted by some shepherd telling his woes to the breezes. Wherever there is an echo, it repeats the name of Leandra. The mountains ring with, Leandra! Leandra! murmur the brooks. And Leandra keeps us all bewildered and bewitched, hoping without hope, and fearing without knowing what we fear. Of all this silly set, the one that shows the least, and also the most sense, is my rival Anselmo, for having so many other things to complain of, he only complains of separation, and to the accompaniment of a rebeck, which he plays admirably, he sings his complaints in verses that show his ingenuity. I follow another, easier, and to my mind, wiser course, and that is to rail at the frivolity of women, at their inconstancy, their double-dealing, their broken promises, their unkept pledges, and, in short, the want of reflection they show in fixing their affections and inclinations. This, sirs, was the reason of words and expressions I made use of to this goat when I came up just now. For, as she is a female, I have contempt for her, though she is the best in all my fold. This is the story I promised to tell you, and, if I have been tedious in telling it, I will not be slow to serve you. My hut is close by, and I have fresh milk and dainty cheese there, as well as a variety of toothsome fruit, no less pleasing to the eye than to the palate. CHAPTER 52 OF THE QUARREL THAT DON QUIXOTE HAD WITH THE GOATHERD, TOGETHER WITH THE RARE ADVENTURE OF THE PENITENCE, WHICH, WITH AN EXPENDITURE OF SWEAT, HE BROUGHT TO A HAPPY CONCLUSION. The goatherd's tale gave great satisfaction to all the hearers, and the canon especially enjoyed it, for he had remarked with particular attention the manner in which it had been told, which was as unlike the manner of a clownish goatherd as it was like that of a polished city wit, and he observed that the curate had been quite right in saying that the woods bred men of learning. They all offered their services to Eugenio, 
but he who showed himself most liberal in this way was Don Quixote, who said to him, Most assuredly, brother Goatherd, if I found myself in a position to attempt any adventure, I would this very instant set out on your behalf, and would rescue Leandra from that convent, where no doubt she is kept against her will. In spite of the abbess and all who would try to prevent me, and would place her in your hands to deal with her according to your will and pleasure, observing, however, the laws of chivalry, which lay down that no violence of any kind is to be offered to any damsel. But I trust in God, our Lord, that the might of one malignant enchanter may not prove so great, but that the power of another better disposed may prove superior to it. And then I promise you my support and assistance, as I am bound to do by my profession, which is none other than to give aid to the weak and needy. The goatherd eyed him, and noticing Don Quixote's sorry appearance and looks, he was filled with wonder, and asked the barber who was next to him, Senor, who is this man who makes such a figure, and talks in such a strain? Who should it be, said the barber, but the famous Don Quixote of La Mancha, the undoer of injustice, the writer of wrongs, the protector of damsels, the terror of giants, and the winner of battles. That, said the goatherd, sounds like what one reads in the books of the knights errant, who did all that you say this man does, though it is my belief that either you are joking, or else this gentleman has empty lodgings in his head. You are a great scoundrel, said Don Quixote, and it is you who are empty and a fool. I am fuller than ever was the horse and bitch that bore you, and, passing from words to deeds, he caught up a loaf that was near him, and sent it full in the goatherd's face, with such force that he flattened his nose. But the goatherd, who did not understand jokes, and found himself roughly handled in such good earnest, paying no respect to carpet, tablecloth, or diners, sprang upon Don Quixote, and seizing him by the throat with both hands, would no doubt have throttled him, had not Sancho Panza that instant come to the rescue, and grasping him by the shoulders, flung him down on the table, smashing plates, breaking glasses, and upsetting and scattering everything on it. Don Quixote, finding himself free, strove to get on top of the goatherd, who, with his face covered with blood, and soundly kicked by Sancho, was on all fours, feeling about for one of the table-knives to take a bloody revenge with. The cannon and the curate, however, prevented him. But the barber so contrived it that he got Don Quixote under him, and rained down upon him such a shower of fisticuffs that the poor knight's face streamed with blood as freely as his own. The cannon and the curate were bursting with laughter, the officers were capering with delight, and both the one and the other hissed them on as they do dogs that are worrying one another in a fight. Sancho alone was frantic, for he could not free himself from the grasp of one of the canon's servants, who kept him from going to his master's assistance. At last, while they were all, with the exception of the two bruisers, who were mauling each other, in high glee and enjoyment, they heard a trumpet sound a note so doleful that it made them all look in the direction whence the sound seemed to come. But the one that was most excited by hearing it was Don Quixote, who, though sorely against his will, he was under the goatherd, and something more than pretty well pummeled, said to him, Brother devil, for it is impossible but that thou must be one, since thou hast had might and strength enough to overcome mine, I ask thee to agree to a truce for but one hour, for the solemn note of yonder trumpet that falls on our ears seems to me to summon me to some new adventure. The goatherd, who was by this time tired of pummeling and being pummeled, released him at once, 
and Don Quixote, rising to his feet, and turning his eyes to the quarter where the sound had been heard, suddenly saw coming down the slope of a hill several men clad in white like penitents. The fact was that the clouds had that year withheld their moisture from the earth, and in all the villages of the district they were organizing processions, rogations, and penances, imploring God to open the hands of his mercy and send the rain, and to this end the people of a village that was hard by were going in procession to a holy hermitage there was on one side of the valley. Don Quixote, when he saw the strange garb of the penitents, without reflecting how often he had seen it before, took it into his head that this was a case of adventure, and that it fell to him alone, as a knight-errant, to engage it. And he was all the more confirmed in this notion by the idea that an image draped in black they had with them was some illustrious lady that these villains and discourteous thieves were carrying off by force. As soon as this occurred to him, he ran with all speed to Rocinante, who was grazing at large, and, taking the bridle and the buckler from the saddle-bow, he had him bridled in an instant, and calling to Sancho for his sword, he mounted Rocinante, braced his buckler on his arm, and in a loud voice exclaimed to those who stood by, now, noble company, ye shall see how important it is that there should be knights in the world professing knight-errantry. Now, I say, ye shall see by the deliverance of that worthy lady who is born captive there, whether knights-errant should be held in estimation. And, so saying, he brought his knees to bear on Rocinante for he had no spurs, and at a full canter, for in all this voracious history we never read of Rocinante fairly galloping, set off to encounter the penitents, though the curate, the canon, and the barber ran to prevent him. But it was out of their power, nor did he even stop for the shouts of Sancho calling after him, "'Where are you going, Señor Don Quixote?' What devils have possessed you to set you against our Catholic faith? Plague take me. Mind, that is a procession of penitents, and the lady they are carrying on that stand is the blessed image of the Immaculate Virgin. Take care what you are doing, Senor, for this time it may be safely said you don't know what you are about. Sancho labored in vain, for his master was so bent on coming to quarters with these sheeted figures, and releasing the lady in black, that he did not hear a word. And even had he heard, he would not have turned back if the king had ordered him. He came up with the procession, and reined in Rocinante, who was already anxious enough to slacken speed a little, and, in a hoarse, excited voice, he exclaimed, "'You who hide your faces!' perhaps because you are not good subjects, pay attention, and listen to what I am about to say to you. The first to halt were those who were carrying the image, and one of the four ecclesiastics who were chanting the liturgy, struck by the strange figure of Don Quixote, the leanness of Rocinante, and the other ludicrous peculiarities he observed, said in reply to him, "'Brother, if you have anything to say to us, say it quickly, for these brethren are whipping themselves, and we cannot stop, nor is it reasonable we should stop to hear anything, unless, indeed, it is short enough to be said in two words. I will say it in one, and it is this, that at once, this very instant, ye release that fair lady, whose tears and sad aspect show plainly that ye are carrying her off against her will, and that ye have committed some scandalous outrage against her. And I, who was born into the world to redress all such wrongs, will not permit you to advance another step until you have restored to her the liberty she pines for and deserves. 
From these words all the hearers concluded that he must be a madman, and began to laugh heartily, and their laughter acted like gunpowder on Don Quixote's fury. For drawing his sword without another word, he made a rush at the stand. One of those who supported it, leaving the burden to his comrades, advanced to meet him, flourishing a forked stick he had for propping up the stand when resting, and with this he caught a mighty cut Don Quixote made at him that severed it in two. But with the portion that remained in his hand, he dealt such a thwack on the shoulder of Don Quixote's sword arm, which the buckler could not protect against the clownish assault, that poor Don Quixote came to the ground in a sad plight. Sancho Panza, who was coming on close behind, puffing and blowing, seeing him fall, cried out to his assailant not to strike him again, for he was a poor enchanted knight who had never harmed any one all the days of his life. But what checked the clown was not Sancho's shouting, but seeing that Don Quixote did not stir hand or foot, and so, fancying he had killed him, he hastily hitched up his tunic under his girdle, and took to his heels across the country like a deer. By this time all Don Quixote's companions had came up to where he lay, but the processionists, seeing them come running, and with them the officers of the Brotherhood with their crossbows, apprehended mischief, and clustering round the image, raised their hoods, and grasped their scourges, as the priests did their tapers, and awaited the attack, resolved to defend themselves, and even to take the offensive against their assailants if they could. Fortune, however, arranged the matter better than they expected, for all Sancho did was to fling himself on his master's body, raising over him the most doleful and laughable lamentation that ever was heard, for he believed he was dead. The curate was known to another curate, who walked in the procession, and their recognition of one another set at rest the apprehensions of both parties. The first then told the other in two words who Don Quixote was, and he and the whole troop of penitents went to see if the poor gentleman was dead, and heard Sancho Panza saying, with tears in his eyes, O oh, flower of chivalry, that with one blow of a stick hast ended the course of thy well-spent life, O oh, pride of thy race, honour and glory of all La Mancha, nay, of all the world, that for want of thee will be full of evil doers, no longer in fear of punishment for their misdeeds. O oh, thou generous above all the Alexanders, since only eight months of service thou hast given me the best island the sea girds or surrounds. Humble with the proud, haughty with the humble, encounterer of dangers, endurer of outrages, enamoured without reason, imitator of the good, scourge of the wicked, enemy of the mean, in short, knight-errant, which is all that can be said. At the cries and moans of Sancho, Don Quixote came to himself, and the first word he said was, He who lives separated from you, sweetest Dulcinea, has greater miseries to endure than these. Aid me, my friend Sancho, to mount the enchanted cart, for I am not in a condition to press the saddle of Rocinante, as this shoulder is all knocked to pieces. That I will do with all my heart, Senor, said Sancho, and let us return to our village with these gentlemen who seek our good, and there we will prepare for making another sally, which may turn out more profitable and creditable to us. Thou art right, Sancho, returned Don Quixote. It will be wise to let the malign influence of the stars which now prevails pass off. The canon, the curate, and the barber told him he would act very wisely in doing as he said, and so, highly amused at Sancho Panza's simplicities, 
they placed Don Quixote in the cart as before. The procession, once more, formed itself in order, and proceeded on its road. The goatherd took his leave of the party, and the officers of the Brotherhood declined to go any farther, and the curate paid them what was due to them. The canon begged the curate to let him know how Don Quixote did, whether he was cured of his madness or still suffered from it, and then begged leave to continue his journey. In short, they all separated and went their ways, leaving to themselves the curate and the barber, Don Quixote, Sancho Panza, and the good Rocinante, who regarded everything with as great resignation as his master. The carter yoked his oxen and made Don Quixote comfortable on a truss of hay, and, at his usual deliberate pace, took the road the curate directed, and, at the end of six days, they reached Don Quixote's village, and entered it about the middle of the day, which it so happened was a Sunday, and the people were all in the plaza, through which Don Quixote's cart passed. They all flocked to see what was in the cart, and when they recognized their townsmen, they were filled with amazement. And a boy ran off to bring the news to his housekeeper and his niece, that their master and uncle had come back, all lean and yellow, and stretched on a truss of hay, on an ox-cart. It was piteous to hear the cries the two good ladies raised, how they beat their breasts, and poured out fresh maledictions on those accursed books of chivalry, all which was renewed when they saw Don Quixote coming in at the gate. At the news of Don Quixote's arrival, Sancho Panza's wife came running, for she by this time knew that her husband had gone away with him as his squire, and on seeing Sancho, the first thing she asked him was if the ass was well. Sancho replied that he was better than his master was. Thanks be to God, said she, for being so good to me. But now tell me, my friend, what have you made by your squirings? What gown have you brought me back? What shoes for our children? I bring nothing of that sort, wife, said Sancho, though I bring other things of more consequence and value. I am very glad of that, returned his wife. Show me these things of more consequence and value, my friend, for I want to see them to cheer my heart that has been so sad and heavy all these ages that you have been away. I will show them to you at home, wife, said Sancho. Be content for the present, for if it please God that we should again go on our travels in search of adventures, you will soon see me a count or governor of an island, and that not one of those everyday ones, but the best that is to be had. Heaven grant it, husband, said she, for indeed we have need of it. But tell me, what's this about islands, for I don't understand it? Honey is not for the mouth of the ass, returned Sancho. All in good time thou shalt see, wife, Nay, thou wilt be surprised to hear thyself called your ladyship by all thy vessels. What are you talking about, Sancho, with your ladyship's islands and vassals? returned Teresa Panza, for so Sancho's wife was called, though they were not relations, for in La Mancha it is customary for wives to take their husbands' surnames. Don't be in such a hurry to know all this, Teresa said Sancho. It is enough that I am telling you the truth, so shut your mouth. But I may tell you this much, by the way, that there is nothing more delightful in the world than to be a person of consideration, squire to a knight-errant, and a seeker of adventures. To be sure, most of those one finds uh, do not end as pleasantly as one could wish, for out of a hundred, ninety-nine will turn out cross and contrary. I know it by experience, for out of some I came blanketed, and out of others belabored. Still, for all that, it is a fine thing to be on the lookout for what may happen, crossing mountains, searching woods, climbing rocks, 
visiting castles, putting up at inns, all at free quarters, and devil take the Maravedi de pay. While this conversation passed between Sancho Panza and his wife, Don Quixote's housekeeper and niece took him in and undressed him, and laid him in his old bed. He eyed them askance, and could not make out where he was. The curate charged his niece to be very careful to make her uncle comfortable, and to keep watch over him, lest he should make his escape from them again, telling her what they had been obliged to do to bring him home. On this the pair once more lifted up their voices, and renewed their maledictions upon the books of chivalry, and implored heaven to plunge the authors of such lies and nonsense into the midst of the bottomless pit. They were, in short, kept in anxiety and dread lest their uncle and master should give them the slip the moment he found himself somewhat better, and as they feared, so it fell out. But the author of this history, though he has devoted research and industry to the discovery of the deeds achieved by Don Quixote in his third sally, has been unable to obtain any information respecting them, at any rate derived from authentic documents. Tradition has merely preserved in the memory of La Mancha the fact that Don Quixote, the third time he sallied forth from his home, betook himself to Saragossa, where he was present at some famous jousts which came off in that city, and that he had adventures there worthy of his valor and high intelligence. Of his end and death he could learn no particulars, nor would he have ascertained it or known of it if good fortune had not produced an old physician for him who had in his possession a leaden box, which, according to his account, had been discovered among the crumbling foundations of an ancient hermitage that was being rebuilt, in which box were found certain parchment manuscripts in Gothic character, but in Castilian verse, containing many of his achievements, and setting forth the beauty of Dulcinea, the form of Rocinante, the fidelity of Sancho Panza, and the burial of Don Quixote himself, together with sundry epitaphs and eulogies on his life and character. But all that could be read and deciphered were those which the trustworthy author of this new and unparalleled history here presents. And the said author asks of those that shall read it nothing in return for the vast toil which it has cost him in examining and searching the Manchegan archives in order to bring it to light save that they give him the same credit that people of sense give to the books of chivalry that pervade the world and are so popular. For with this he will consider himself amply paid and fully satisfied, and will be encouraged to seek out and produce other histories, if not as truthful, at least equal in invention, and not less entertaining. The first words written on the parchment found in the leaden box were these. The Accommodations of Argamasilla, a village of La Mancha, on the life and death of Don Quixote of La Mancha, hoc scripturant monicongo, academician of Argamasilla, on the tomb of Don Quixote. Epitaph the scatterbrain that gave La Mancha more rich spoils than Jason's, who, a point so keen had to his wit, and happier far had been if his wit's weathercock a blunter bore, the arm renowned far as Gaeta's shore, Cathay, and all the lands that lie between, the muse discreet and terrible and mean, as ever wrote on brass in days of yore, he who surpassed the Amadises all, and who as not the Galaors accounted, supported by his love and gallantry, who made the Bellinises sing small, and sought renown on Rocinante mounted, 
Here underneath this cold stone doth he lie. Pani Aguardo, Academician of Argamasilla, in Laudem Dulcinea del Toboso. Sonnet She, whose full features may be here descried, High-bosomed with a bearing of disdain, Is Dulcinea, she for whom in vain The great Don Quixote of La Mancha sighed. For her, Toboso's queen, from side to side he traversed the grim Sierra, the Champagne of Aranjuez, and Montiel's famous plain, on Rocinante oft a weary ride. Malignant planets, cruel destiny, pursued them both, the fair Manchegan dame, and the unconquered star of chivalry. Nor youth nor beauty saved her from the claim of death, he paid love's bitter penalty, and left the marble to preserve his name. Capriccioso, a most acute academician of Argamasilla, in praise of Rocinante, steed of Don Quixote of La Mancha. Sonnet On that proud throne of diamantine sheen, which the blood-reeking feet of Mars degrade, the mad Manchigan's banner now hath been by him in all its bravery displayed. There hath he hung his arms and trenchant blade, wherewith, achieving deeds till now unseen, he slays, lays low, cleaves, hews. But art hath made a novel style for our new paladin. If Amadis be the proud boast of Gaul, if by his progeny the fame of Greece through all the regions of the earth be spread, great Quixote, crowned in grim Bayona's hall, to-day exalts La Mancha over these, and above Greece or Gaul she holds her head, nor ends his glory here, for his good steed doth Briador and Bayard far exceed as meddled steeds compared with Rocinante, the reputation they have won is scanty. Burlador, Academician of Argamasilla, on Sancho Panza. Sonnet The worthy Sancho Panza here you see. A great soul once was in that body small. Nor was there squire upon this earthly ball so plain, and simple, or of guile so free. Within an ace of being count was he, and would have been but for the spite and gall of this vile age, mean and illiberal, that cannot even let a donkey be. For, mounted on an ass, excuse the word, by Rocinante's side this gentle squire was wont his wandering master to attend, the elusive hopes that lure the common herd with promises of ease, the heart's desire, in shadows, dreams, and smoke, ye always end. Cachi Diablo, Academician of Argamasilla on the Tomb of Don Quixote. Epitaph The night lies here below, Ill errant and bruised sore, whom Rocinante bore in his wanderings to and fro. By the side of the night is laid stolid man Sancho, too, than whom a squire more true was not in the esquire trade. To Quitoc, academician of Argamasilla, on the tomb of Dulcinea del Toboso. Epitaph. Here Dulcinea lies. Plump was she and robust. Now she is ashes and dust. The end of all flesh that dies. A lady of high degree, with the port of a lofty dame, and the great Don Quixote's flame, and the pride of her village was she. These were all the verses that could be deciphered. 
The rest, the writing being worm-eaten, were handed over to one of the academicians, to make out their meaning conjecturally. We have been informed that, at the cost of many sleepless nights, and much toil, he has succeeded, and that he means to publish them, in hopes of Don Quixote's third sally. Forse altro cantera con miglior plectro. The conclusion of Part 18, Chapters 51 and 52, and The End of Don Quixote, Volume 1, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra, translated by John Ormsby. Read by Dennis Sayers for LibriVox in Modesto, California, Spring 2006.